All right, can you guys hear us on the YouTube stream? If you can hear us, we're just going to get this rolling. All right, welcome everyone. That is like the weirdest start to one of these things I've ever done. Uh, welcome to True North's live election night special. My name is Andrew Lawton, and I hope you weren't here. sizes I was doing before the show and the uh, uh, clean pants of underwear. The hot mic moments you get are never as exciting for me. Uh, but it is an absolute pleasure to have you tuned in to this uh, very special night, the 2023 Alberta election. I have uh, two of our panelists with me here, William Macbeth, who is True North's uh, Chief Operating Officer, a longtime Alberta Politico, and also Lindsay Wilson, who's the President of Alberta Proud. Uh, we have a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to have updates from our correspondent, Rachel Emanuel, very shortly. And we are also going to have lots of the characters who have been much involved in the election uh, coming in to share their thoughts on what's happening. Uh, just to put the uh, thing into context here, 30 minutes until the polls close, 30 minutes until polls close, we're expected to have results pretty soon after that. Uh, and we'll have them uh, really as they come. And I should just say for context here, there's going to be no minority government short of some really, really weird, unforeseen event. Uh, it's going to be an NDP majority or a UCP majority. Uh, but uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to ask both of you uh, a question here. Uh, what's the riding you're watching tonight? Well, uh, the riding I'm most interested in watching is California. I think that that's one of the writings that uh, if the NDP are ahead and leading in it, that's a bad sign for the UCP. If it's trending back to the UCP, I think that indicates Calgary as a whole isn't going to go enough NDP in order for them to win the election. And what's yours? Well, I'm your rural girl, so <laughs> I, I live out in Cochrane, but uh, the one, the writing that I'm keeping my eye on the most would be Miranda Rosen uh, on the Banff Kananaskis ticket. Uh, that is traditionally a very difficult riding. They've that's been switched up a bit in the last over the last couple of elections, and so I mean you've got Banff and Canmore, and that's typically quite favorable toward the NDP, of course. And then you go all the way, uh, you know, into through Bragg Creek, and then out to uh, Pritis and Elbow, and 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 so it's it's really like kind of uniting two totally different worlds, right? So you get more of that rural kind of hardcore UCP support. You see the big signs on the big farmer fields, and and so it's really interesting. I, I, she's been fighting tooth and nail for that uh it's that's that's going to be a really interesting an, an interesting writing yeah and just to uh, ask myself the question as well and answer it the riding that i'm watching is edmonton southwest now uh this is relevant for a couple of reasons number one it's one of the only ucp ridings in edmonton right now and it's been touch and go the ndp very popular in edmonton which won't surprise anyone who's spent much time in edmonton uh but it's also the riding held by uh, casey madu who's the deputy premier uh, and right now has the only UCP seat in Edmonton. So that's the one I'm watching. Uh, we will get an update on what you have to expect in the evening ahead from Alberta correspondent for True North, Rachel Emanuel. Hey, Andrew, thank you for that. Welcome to the show, everybody. We're very excited to be here at the UCP headquarters. As Andrew mentioned, I think it's going to be an exciting night. I heard some of the ridings that everyone mentioned they were watching. Definitely Calgary Acadia, that's Tyler Shandro's riding, is going to be one to watch tonight. I was there earlier today doing some streeters, getting a sense of the voters as they were heading out of the polls, and we're excited to show you what people had to say on their way out of the exit polls later. It seemed pretty mixed feelings, so it's going to be interesting to watch. So one, I also have a close eye on Calgary Glenmore. That is Whitney Essex riding. So I think depending what those do will be a good sense of whether the UCP is going to do well or not tonight. It's been a very close campaign. It's going to be very close tonight. We know that the UCP is going to lose seats in Calgary. However, we are still expecting them to eke out a majority government at the end of the night. At least that's what recent polls have shown us. But certainly it's been a campaign full of lots of personal attacks. Other things that we've discussed have been health care and education and tax cuts. I know UCP insiders I've spoken to are hoping that the ballot box question is going to be jobs and the economy, but I'm not sure that it is. Typically in these types of elections, it really comes down to who voters trust. Do they want another Alberta NDP government or do they trust Danielle Smith? That's something I heard today at the polls and we're excited to play that for you later on. And we're also interested to see whether or not the UCP's negative campaigning tactics actually worked. 
We are going to find about that later tonight as results come. As Andrew mentioned, polls close at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. So we are going to have some results for you very shortly, and we're excited to bring that to you. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you for that, Rachel. We will check in with Rachel as the evening progresses. She's going to have some interviews with folks that are tied into what's happening. And we will, of course, have the results as they come in 26 minutes, 25 and a half minutes to be precise until the polls close. Hopefully start getting some results here. But uh, let's start talking about the bigger picture of the campaign, though. And, and I think let's just start with where we are. This is the Big Four building on the Stampede Grounds in Calgary, where if you were to follow around uh, this campaign, you wouldn't really go that much outside of Calgary. This has been very much the battleground here. So uh, is that typical uh, of elections where, you know, it's won or lost here, William? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to reflect the changing nature of elections in Alberta, which uh, even just a couple of elections ago were multi-party elections, and now they've transitioned to a two-party uh, election. So you've got New Democrats, you've got uh, uh, the United Conservative Party. If you look at the distribution of seats in Alberta, it can be roughly grouped into three. There's Edmonton, there's Calgary, and there's the whole rest of the province. And apologies to anyone who lives in the rest of the province. I think you get short shafted a little bit in this analysis. But uh, as you mentioned earlier on, the New Democrats expected to perform very well in Edmonton, winning all of, uh, most, if not all, of the seats. The United Conservative Party expecting to do very well in the rest of Alberta, in the rural zones uh, and the smaller cities in the north, central, and south regions, which means they both got one zone in their column. Calgary is the battleground. So this city very much will decide who is going to be the next government of Alberta. Yeah, now you are the, the rural girl at heart, but you're not really the battleground. Rachel Notley's not even bothering with your neck of the woods. <laughs> oh, no, certainly not. I mean, Peter Guthrie is my MLA at Cochrane. He's got Airdrie West in Cochrane, and uh, that's always been... I think we have the highest UCP voter turnout per capita in the province. So, But, you know, I'll tell you, there's more orange signs out there than there were a few years ago. So that's interesting. It's, it's the NDP now, the percep public perception of the NDP now, compared to four years ago, you got to give it to them on marketing. It's really it, the way that their, their persona uh, and building that around Rachel Notley herself, I, I mean, you're seeing things now that you wouldn't have seen a few years ago. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and I mean, people forget, or maybe they don't actually, when the NDP was in power in Alberta, they actually did do very well in some of these rural areas. And, and it was actually, uh, I think, part of why it was so shocking to people that that victory came when it did. So uh, let, let's talk about what the NDP was really campaigning on, because they weren't trying to be, I know a lot of people watching this are not from Alberta. Uh, you know, Jagmeet Singh was not here campaigning for Rachel Notley. They're trying to pretend they're an NDP that has nothing to do with what NDP people think anywhere else, but is that a credible proposal to Albert? Yeah, no, there's, it, it isn't a mistake that you didn't see Jagmeet saying coming to Alberta during this election. Uh, I, I think what Rachel Notley tried to present herself with in a lot of different ways is I'm not like those other New Democrats. I'm not like the Toronto New Democrats. Mm -hmm. We're a unique brand of Alberta New Democrat, hearkening back to that populist prairie side of the party. Did it work? That's the real question. And I think, uh, you know, it's so interesting. People have made comments that Rachel Notley wore a blue outfit to the debate, a, a conservative blue outfit. If you look at the lit pieces or the brochures that have been put together, when they want to talk about something good they're doing, it's on a blue panel background. Hmm. And they put Daniel Smith as on a red background because in this province, red is liberal and liberal is bad. Um, and so all of that's really interesting. Uh, I don't think it. I don't think it worked as well as they would have hoped. I think there was a belief early in the campaign that maybe people were going to lend or or hold their nose and vote New Democrat because they didn't like Daniel Smith. But then a lot of people remembered they didn't really love Rachel Notley either when she had her four years in government. It was tough times for Alberta. But were you seeing that in people you spoke to, where you know the UCP was more popular than Danielle Smith was, or maybe Rachel Notley? was more popular than Daniel Smith, but the UCP was more popular than the NDP? You know, certainly, certainly, uh, Daniel Smith struggled a little bit. You know, we can talk about that later, but, uh, and it, the NDP, it's not about the NDP, it's about Rachel Notley, right? You look at even all their signs, it's Team Rachel Notley. So that's always been really interesting to me. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think, I think where, I think Rachel was leading 
and beating Danielle. I think there is a couple of turning points in the last couple of weeks. I think that the UCP has done a pretty good job at disputing the biggest lie that the NDP has unfortunately ran their campaign on, which is the soundbite that Danielle is going to make you pay for a doctor. So they came out with their health care guarantee, and, and, and we can hold Premier Smith. She has gone on record to say no Albertan will ever pay out of pocket for a doctor. And we have to hold them to their word. They've made their health care guarantee on that. So um, I think they've done a pretty good job at pushing back on that. And I, whereas I think that Rachel Notley was and the NDP was quite successful on that on that before. And I think the debate a couple of weeks ago, I think that was also a turning point. I think that the Premier Smith um, won that debate handily, personally. Yeah, and we, we have some debate highlights that we'll get to later on. But the, the one I will say is that everyone on the left side of things was hoping it would be some colossal crash and burn for Danielle Smith. So I would argue she had a lower bar she needed to clear going in anyway, but uh, she certainly cleared it and, and she didn't just hold. I think she actually gained a, a little bit out of that. And I think you got to also keep in mind, like Rachel Notley is no slouch at debate. I mean, she won that election in 2015 because of that debate. And, and But I, I feel that the tone has changed. I feel there's a, too much of an anger machine that I was seeing when I was watching that debate. And I think Premier came across as a little more polished, a little bit more Premier-like. And I think that that really shone. And I think we've seen a big shift since then. I really think that that was more pivotal. Some people say, meh, it was a bit of a draw. I don't think so. I think it was more pivotal than people realize in favor of the UCP leading us into tonight. Now, we, we were talking earlier about the ridings that we're watching here. Are there any ridings, Will, that really test more about the province-wide picture than just the local story. Are there really reliable bellwethers here to watch? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, as we discussed, this is the battle for Calgary, the battle for hearts and minds of Calgarians. So looking at how Calgary goes is going to be the outcome of this election. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to see it uh, not so much in the downtown and mm -hmm. ridings that surround that. I think those are, are pretty safe going to go NDP. Uh, tonight, but the next rung of, of ridings out that they're not really in the suburbs, the full suburbs yet, they're closer to the core, but that's where the battleground is. And if early on you start to see those trending up towards the NDP, that's a bad sign for the United Conservative Party. But yeah. if they're holding on to those ridings, even if they have smaller margins, then I think the UCP is in pretty good shape and is going to come out of this with a, with a second term under Daniels. If you are uh, just tuning in here, this is the True North Alberta election results show. Uh, if you see me uh, plugging away at my computer, I'm not uh, playing solitaire. We are trying to keep tabs on all the things that are happening on uh, social media, which is a bit easier right now because the polls have not yet closed. Uh, that's going to come in, I think, just uh, over 18 minutes. Uh, so we'll be getting results to you as quickly as we can get them. And the fun part is sometimes you hear people cheer or start groaning because they got a result that we are just about to get to. Like I remember in uh, uh, 2019 at the federal election, I was covering from Andrew Shear's headquarters and when, when Ralph Goodale lost his seat, I don't think anyone could hear me uh, broadcasting because there was such a, a celebration in the room. But uh, we are, are gonna get to that. But uh, just before we get over to uh, Rachel Emanuel, who has an interview lined up, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the healthcare aspect. Cause you brought this up and it was probably the number one thing. When I talked to some people that were working on campaigns uh, that were uh, going, they were hearing that at the door. So the NDP message did seem like it was getting through that she's going to privatize your health care. Yeah, and, and, but I think what's unfortunate about it is that it's not truthful. It's not truthful campaigning. And certainly, um, you know, in her time as a radio talk show host, uh, Premier Smith, then Danielle Smith, yeah. she pontificated about that's what you do do in these shows and you talk and you bounce ideas it's and you're a completely different person when you're in that space as opposed to when you're an elected official let alone the premier of alberta so those were sound bites they were taken a lot of out of context and um there was a lot i i know people who work in spaces that you know are union folks and and you know they had the, the their unions were coming to them saying and, and, and really hammering this message home that you're going to have to pay for a yeah. doctor. And it, it was, it's dishonest campaigning. I know we see it. We see it from both sides, certainly. But that really, that really irked me. I had a lot, of, um, a lot of women, particularly, who I know, engaged in politics, not like people like us. And, you know, they're busy. They, they've got kids. They've got jobs. They've got businesses to run. And they ask me, well, is that true? I'm going to have to pay for a doctor. It's, it's yeah. really amazing how much that that message stuck. And, and Canadians don't like that concept. It doesn't matter if you if you explain that, well, we've always had a two-tiered healthcare system, this is looking at a fish, it doesn't really matter. It's 
Canadians just don't like that concept. They see it as an all or nothing thing and they're yeah. worried that we're going to become some US version of healthcare and they're terrified of that. So let me ask you, William, because as our viewers may know, you did work for Danielle Smith in 2012, which uh, unfortunately you could not clinch the win for her, but I, I know it was uh, looking very good for a lot of the campaign. Uh, Danielle Smith has done a lot on healthcare policy as a, a business advocate, as a radio host, as a commentator, and she has advocated for solutions that uh, would involve some private element to, to healthcare delivery, and I, I don't think that should be controversial, but I realize in, in Canada it is. So if you were advising her, how would you have walked that line of saying, yes, I've talked about these things, but we're keeping this core universal health care intact? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting question because the debate tends to descend very quickly into, well, we either do health care the way we've been doing it for the last 60 years, yeah. or we immediately become the United States and nobody has <laughs> yeah. public health insurance anymore. Forgetting these are like two of the least efficient systems in the world. Yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, better better it's just hilarious that, that you know, you could think there's there's a you know, 200 countries in the world, but there's only two ways of doing healthcare. So what I think what I would have told her, Danielle, first of all, I would have told her to be bold and uh, to carry on with her uh, health spending account promise. I think that would have been a very tangible thing that parents particularly would have appreciated, helping to cover things like dental visits, glasses, uh, therapy appointments, whatever the yeah. case. Uh, in terms of the private delivery of healthcare, I, I think as long as you always remind people that even if healthcare is being delivered by a non-government provider, you are not being asked to take out your credit card yeah. to pay for healthcare in Alberta. It is simply the method of delivery that is changing. And what that has meant though, that since Alberta has started to move in this direction, is we're seeing fewer waiting lists for key procedures. We're seeing surgeries happening faster. We're seeing people get hip and knee replacements faster. They're getting cataract surgeries faster. And at the end of the day, that's a better quality of life for people waiting for those procedures. Yeah, and I think that it's actually good that healthcare policy was discussed because oftentimes I think people were fearing that this election would just be about, you know, whatever Danielle Smith said on the radio five years ago and one of those every day. There were a lot of character attacks in this campaign. I, I don't think it was as bad as I expected it to be, but did, did that dominate on the ground? That just personality conflict. Oh, I think so, and I think I think that 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 tonage came out as well in the debate. I know I keep going back to that, but I I, I certainly think, yeah, I think so. I think it was this was this was I think to me it was it's been less about the NDP versus the UCP and more about Danielle Smith versus Rachel Notley. So here's the big question I have to ask you. 13 years since the last Wild Rose campaign, how do you rank uh, Danielle Smith the candidate now against Danielle Smith the candidate then? Well, uh, I mean, for people with long memories uh, who may remember the 2012 election, one of the things that was cited as the a reason Danielle lost was she had a candidate who said something controversial uh, and that uh, that candidate wasn't dismissed or, or wasn't taken off the ballot for the United Conservative Party. And Danielle said, I, I can't tell a candidate what to say or think. Uh, similarly, this time we did have a candidate who, uh, you know, talked about and a really unpleasant metaphor of a poop cookie, which I don't think, you know, regardless of the issue, is an unpleasant metaphor. For, for those who are playing the drinking game at home, he said poop cookie, so you have to take a shot <laughs> every, now. Everybody drink. <laughs> uh, and, and quite quickly, Danielle came around and said, this does not represent our views, and if this person yeah. does win, they will not be allowed to sit in any United Conservative caucus. So that is at least one sign that Danielle has taken some of the hard lessons of that loss in 2012 and decided, I really don't want to lose another election in Alberta. Now, are you see? I mean, there's a theoretical scenario in which that ends up costing the UCP a very necessary seat tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Under if it's a very strange world where somehow we've ended up with 43 United Conservative seats, 43 New Democrat seats, and this one independent, yeah. <laughs> then that's going to be awkward for everybody having yeah. to to figure out what level of comfort they have with working with this individual in the legislature. But that being said, uh, I, I actually don't think it's going to be quite that close. Uh, I, I think I think the United Conservative Party has the advantage going into tonight. One thing that I, I will talk about this a little bit later on, but obviously the UCP leadership race that elected Danielle Smith as leader and, and ultimately Premier was overwhelmingly a reaction to, I think, a lot of COVID frustrations with Jason Kenney. A lot from the more independence-oriented wing of the party uh, that were, were very concerned about uh, the past. A lot of that didn't import into the general election, which I actually found quite refreshing. I mean, Daniel Smith really didn't have a difficulty, it seemed like, pivoting to premier mode. 
Well, I think she stopped talking about COVID early enough on because mm -hmm. she came out a little bit when she was first, uh, when she won the leadership race and she came out talking about COVID and that didn't sit, sit well with people. So I, th I think we just, we just, we need to move forward. It was a terrible chapter. Politicians made mistakes, world mistakes. And Kenny, did he make mistakes? Sure. But do people not think Rachel Notley would have made mistakes or anybody else in that position would have made mistakes? It was changing all the time. So it's, it's easy for us to say, oh, I would have or we should have or, or anything like that. But it was a really difficult time or, or globally. So I think we just need to dust ourselves off and we need to. Is best position to answer this, but but what happened to the Kenny loyalists on this election? Did they tend to fall in line, or had we seen a kind of a little resistance group? <laughs> I, I mean, my brief answer to that would be: I think there was some hard days for a few of them. I think uh, they didn't particularly warm right away to to Danielle Smith, uh, who who they probably in some ways blamed a bit for some of their candidates' downfall. However, the cold hard reality of re-electing a, a NDP government in Alberta, I suspect have been highly motivating to many of these Kenny people to say, well, maybe she isn't my choice, maybe she isn't perfect, but gosh, do we really want four years of lefty government back in Alberta? Remember how it went the first time. Yeah. I, I do think it also speaks volumes that there are seven leadership candidates. Daniel Smith was successful. Uh, Lilo here is no, no longer. And the other five got big positions within her government. I think that was her setting the tone for unity because most importantly, this actually has to start acting like the United Conservative Party if, if we want to be prosperous, if, if the party wants to be prosperous for the next four years and, and beyond. Yeah. For sure. We are 10 minutes away from polls closing. This is True North Alberta election night results show. For those of you with us from the get-go, thank you very much. We've improved since that uh, uh, very strange, like, curb your enthusiasm-esque opening. But uh, <laughs> you know what? We are here, and the night is just beginning. We are going to have, just to give you a, a little sampling of what's going to come, we're going to have results as they arrive, starting probably in about 15, 16, 17 minutes. Uh, I think there may be some unsurprising results, but it all look very exciting when the numbers start changing and the map starts uh, going red and then uh, some of the battlegrounds and, and just I, by the way I know that format stuff isn't always the most interesting but it is relevant uh, ballots were cast by paper but they're counted electronically which generally means we're in for a shorter turnaround on results ideally right I believe it was the advanced ballots that the advanced were, counted ones were counted electronically, electronically. Okay. I think it's hand counting for today uh, but that means we should get a large dump of results quite quickly when they push the magic button yeah. and it spits out the results for 87 advanced polls in every ridings. Yeah, and the, the, the strange thing whenever you're watching results is that you never know if the advanced polls are in or not, but this time we will know if the advanced polls are in or not, so hopefully we'll get a bit of a better sense of, uh, of what's happening. Uh, we are going to go to Rachel Emanuel now, who has with her UCP campaign strategist and senator-elect Erica Baruti. Take it away, Rachel. Hey guys, so I'm here with Erica Baruti. You might remember her from the Alberta Roundup. She was one of our very when we last spoke, you mentioned that you were pegging in about 48 seats for the UCP, maybe 48 to 51. Have you changed your mind or are you still keeping your estimate? No, I've had that number for three months. So I'm just going to lock it in. If I'm right or wrong, we'll, we'll see in a couple hours. And what riding are you really watching tonight to know if we lose this riding, we're not going to be in good foot in good footing? Yeah, I think a good indicator is if we see good numbers in Calgary, Glenmore, Calgary, Bow, KDI. I think we'll see a good strong night um but yeah so i'll be watching those and then we'll we'll see how some of the rest of the province goes i think we'll be successful in, in a lot of the donut uh, outside of edmonton as well one of the other things that you mentioned on the show was that after the debate you felt that the door is really warm for united conservative party volunteers who are out door knocking with their candidates did you notice that there was maybe a policy that people were interested in that they hadn't really cared about before or just generally that people had a better impression of leader danielle smith Meanwhile, you know, we know the NDP tried so much negative campaigning and certainly some of that did work. Yeah, it definitely, uh, I think, did early on in the campaign. I mean, outright lying about public health care. Unfortunately, Albertans believed Rachel Notley for quite some time. Um, but I do think two things. Yes, on the debate, um, I think that's because 
Premier Danielle Smith looked like Premier Danielle Smith, and Rachel Notley looked like she was auditioning for to be the leader of the official opposition again. Um, so I think that was a clear shift during the campaign. I also think it was a very um, you know close timing to when they released their co costing for their platform, and in that was an increase on the business tax from eight to eleven percent, which is a thirty-eight percent increase. And I definitely think that's when Albertans started paying attention to like the math of the of the NDP wasn't really making sense. How are they going to get this revenue in? How are we going to attract investment? Businesses coming out left, right and center, including the Alberta Chamber of Commerce against this policy. So, um, you know, I think ours were consistent policies from the beginning, focused on what Albertans were talking about, the economy, affordability and public safety. Um, but that was one where it was just like, whoa, I can't believe that they're actually going to run on this. Yeah, I think that was a typical policy that most of us expected to see from the NDP, whereas they've kind of been running as moderates in the election. But when we talk about really that campaign defining moment and maybe the debate being that moment that really changed the momentum of the UCP campaign, I felt like Dan seemed a lot more confident in her appearances after that. She had that campaign rally in Edmonton. She seemed really excited. Her public speaking was on point. And then again at another media appearance on Friday, that was her last appearance. We haven't seen her since then. And she just seems confident. She looks like someone who thinks she's going to win the election. She knows she's going to win the election. Have you on the campaign felt that momentum since the debate? Absolutely. I mean, like I said, she showed she is premier worthy and that she came out. That is her wheelhouse, right? Like we, you know, but Rachel Notley is a strong communicator too. And I don't think Rachel showed up that night. So I think that was the, uh, you know, that step up that Danielle Smith needed for that momentum. And she kept nailing everything else since then. And it was a, you know, a strong finish uh, and a positive campaign. Great. Well, thank you so much again. That was Erica Barudis, a senior advisor with the UCP campaign. Oh, we're just gonna have a little bit more time here left. Uh, one thing that I am very curious about is we know that the compassion intervention was such a huge policy for the party. I was surprised to see you guys introduce it. Basically, that would force somebody who is a danger to themselves or others, a drug addict, into treatment. What type of reception? Did people ask about that at the doors or was it something that they weren't really aware of? You know what? I think people that maybe have a direct relationship with something like that, um, um, they did react to that. I think that obviously the NDP tried to fear and smear it, um, but it is something that we do see across the US, uh, across Europe. It has been shown to work, uh, but it's about you know trying it in Alberta and seeing if it's applicable because I think we can all agree at the end of the day, public safety is a huge concern and not just removing those folks from the streets, but also giving them the help that they need is definitely the, showing the compassionate conservative side that the UCP has. Absolutely, and we're hoping to hear from Mike Ellis a little bit later. He is the Public Safety Minister, so I'm sure that he'll have more to share on that. Again, thank you so much, Erica, for your time. Once again, that was Erica Barudis, a senior advisor with the UCP campaign. Back to you, Andrew. Welcome back. We are, and thank you for that, Rachel. I believe we have to talk a little bit, just because we had Erica Barudis on there, the uh, winner of the uh, Senate election as the UCP candidate, which uh, I don't want to take it away from her, but in a Trudeau government federally doesn't mean all that much because the uh, federal government isn't appointing uh, Alberta senators who were elected. But I, I do think it brings us around to what, again, was a very interesting theme in the uh, UCP leadership race, but I don't believe was talked about at all in the general election, which was Alberta sovereignty. And I, I'm not talking about secession or, or separation, but rather uh, just this idea of Alberta asserting itself. The Sovereignty Act was Bill 1 of the Smith government. Where did that issue go? Well, at Alberta Proud, we're really focused on you know, standing up for Alberta and uh, more Alberta and less Ottawa. And really, the media got really hyped up about this one. When she first came out with the Sovereignty Act, it was all over the place. During the leadership race, it was all over the place. But really, at the end of the day, why is it such a bad thing? I think that I think a lot of people just honed in on little details of it too much. I mean, if we look next door, Premier Scott Moe in Saskatchewan is is doing wonders with the Saskatchewan First Act. People love him for it. But why do they hate Danielle for it? It's the same thing, essentially. It's mm -hmm. just putting us first. We want to be the determiners of our own resources and 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 our own tax dollars and all these sorts of things moving in that direction. That's that's just removing the Trudeau middleman and it was, it was always puzzling to me how kind of, uh, mainstream legacy media kind of ran with that and, and put such a negative spin on that. I don't know. I mean, um, if you recall back to the leadership race, you would have thought 
uh, remember the claims that were being made. If this act becomes law, you're going to see companies fleeing. Yeah. Out the, uh, <laughs> you know, the federal government is going to, uh, you know, send in their own people to, to run services. It was a level of hyperbole, not, not only from uh, opposition politicians, who you expect that sort of thing from, but every political scientist, every media on UCP supporter, but they saw it as an opportunity to take a swing at a party and a leader they didn't yeah. like. The reality on the ground, of course, is she introduced it, it became law, and to my knowledge, we barely talked about it afterwards, and certainly not during this election. Yeah. There wasn't, in, in, you know, of all of the press conferences I watched, I can't recall a single question being asked about the Sovereignty Act and its impact on Alberta. So, interesting development. Yeah, and, and I will say as well, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, all of the parties that would pop up that were kind of vying for the same share of votes on the right really vanished this election. And we'll talk about that, especially when we see some results. Uh, but right now, I am stretching out my answer because in 25 seconds, uh, polls are closing, which uh, means nothing in terms of results because we aren't <laughs> going to get results right at like eight minutes on the dot. But it's exciting. We announce it. We uh, bring attention to it. And it means that the end is near, at least for uh, finding out what's happening tonight so uh have i have i sufficiently bought us to yes we can do the five four three two one holes are closed yay we can pop the champagne but uh, before we do that uh, we'll head over to rachel emmanuel who is joined by ucp candidate for calgary west mike ellis take it away rachel thanks andrew i am joined by mike ellis as andrew mentioned he is the candidate for calgary the UCP is going to hold that seat tonight unless something crazy happens. Mike Ellis is also the Minister for Public Safety and they've been doing a ton of work on that file. Something that I was just talking to Erica about that caught our attention on the campaign was the compassionate intervention, which as I just mentioned to our viewers would essentially force drug addicts who are a danger to themselves or to others into treatment. Wondering if you can tell me a little bit about what the reception has been to this policy. Yeah, I mean, I think as you know, I did 12 years as a police officer on the streets of Calgary. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, our, our friends on the, uh, the left were, were uh, for sure opposed to this. But, uh, you know, look, this is something that we, we already do. Under the Mental Health Act, if somebody's posing a danger to themselves or others, we make sure that that person gets the help that they need. We also have something what is known as PCHAD and PCHIP, where children might be involved in, in alcohol or drugs, or children might be involved in prostitution. And, you know, it's a piece of legislation that allows families to get uh, intervention through the courts to get these kids the help that they need. So this is something that has um, been longstanding in this province. And to answer your question, we've actually had a, a really good reception from people because they, it, it's, it is about compassion. Because when somebody is overdosing five to ten times a day, you know, what's the alternative? To give them more drugs and allow them to uh, continue the cycle of abuse or to actually get them help so that they can get treatment and live happy and healthy lives again. I think Albertans are very clear they like the latter. So when you mentioned that this is something that's already being done, I'm wondering why we need a piece of legislation to continue doing it. Well, remember, uh, mental health is different than addictions. So obviously when somebody is posing a danger to themselves under the Mental Health Act, because they might be suicidal or they, again, might be um, you know, another mental health condition, then that's different than somebody who is um, in the throes of their addiction and causing harm to themselves. So this, it actually is two different things. So I had the chance to ask NDP leader Rachel Nolley about this policy. She said that she's spoken to frontline workers, healthcare workers who don't agree with this policy. And I did mention that at your announcement, you had a bunch of recovered addicts and those in recovery saying, this is really helpful for me. My family was able to find recovery for me because of programs like this. And they were very supportive of it. And I mentioned that to her and she said, well, we've heard from other people, other addicts, other frontline workers, and said that the premier hadn't actually consulted on this policy. What would be your response to that? Well, I think uh, as you were there, I mean, we had a young girl who was 16 years old and she said she was in the throes of her addiction at the age of 12. I am very certain that Albertans, in fact, Canadians, would not believe that giving that little girl 
drugs and a safe place to use those drugs is the correct answer. So getting her compassionate intervention, as she indicated, saved her life. And she can now go on to live a happy and healthy life again, right? Um, we, have, we have talked to, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I held the Safe Supply uh, Committee when I was Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, right? And we, we had uh, a lot of experts. And when I mean experts, and we're talking about experts from Stanford, from Yale, from, from Harvard, experts all throughout Canada that were very very supportive of our policies and especially when it comes to compassion and intervention. Before I let you go, one final question. I have to ask everyone, what's your prediction for tonight? We know the polls are now closed. What are you expecting the seat count to end up at? Well, I thank you for the question. I'm just going to be cautiously optimistic. Um, again, this is my fourth campaign. Um, you know, look, it's, it, what, we, 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 we don't know, we don't know, but I will just say this, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the campaign that the United Conservative Party ran. I'm proud of our candidates. I'm proud of the, the diverse uh, team that we brought together. And again, I'll be cautiously optimistic. That was a good political answer. I'll give you that. That once again was Mike, the Minister for Public Safety and the UCP candidate for Calgary West. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, have a great night. All right, we're going to head back over to Andrew in just a moment here. Um, we're hoping to get some results in super quickly to discuss those with you. And I'm sure Andrew will have more to say about that. Thank you for that, Rachel. That was uh, Mike Ellis, the UCP candidate for uh, Calgary West. And I suspect when we look at the pretty surefire ones, he's probably uh, <laughs> going to be an MLA uh, before long. Uh, you know, that they were talking about the opioid uh, drug file, which I think is a, a very important one, because this was a, an issue that Danielle, it's not usually the domain of conservative candidates, but Danielle Smith really ran full steam ahead into this. Uh, she introduced this uh, policy called the Compassionate Inter Intervention Act, which essentially allows uh, mandatory treatment and enforces mandatory treatment on people. Um, this is something that I think is actually good policy, according to a lot of people that were affected by uh, drug addiction that were talking about it. Is it good politics? Does this actually move votes? I, I think so. I think there's been a, a, there's been a lot of work done on, on not only on the mental health and opiate crisis that's happening, uh, but as well in conjunction with the, you know, uh, right, supporting our front lines, getting more police officers on the ground. So I think it's a it's a broader a broader scope. Uh, but, you know, Daniel Smith is, si is sitting pretty good with that. I think there's been a lot of great work doing uh, that's being done there by the UCP on that file. Of course, her chief of staff is a recovering addict. And that is kind of like taking the NDP narrative and kind of like, what are you going to do with that? Right. How do you counter that? This is a guy who has lived experience and um, doing this Alberta first uh, program here and uh, I, I just think he's I think I think she's got some really good guidance on that and and I think when you have addicts uh, developing the program I think I think we're on the right track with that and so I would agree I think that it, it's a tough one to campaign on but I think we've reached a turning point in our city certainly in Edmonton I'm seeing it in Calgary as somebody who lives outside of Calgary not coming here every day but we have a serious problem on our streets and it's it's getting dangerous to ride sea trains. Something needs to be done. I think we're at a bit of a breaking point with it and, and people don't want to see, I think people are starting to understand like we want our children to be safe to walk down the streets. We want seniors to be safe to ride on a sea train and mm -hmm. something has to be done. And, and I think, I, I don't think it did did her any any losses on that on bringing I, that forward. I, we we had polls closed just uh, six minutes ago. This is the uh, True North Alberta election night show, joined by William Macbeth and from Alberta Proud, Lindsay Wilson, and we have uh, Rachel Emanuel in the wings here. Uh, just one update that came in. The uh, this is from Elections Alberta. Uh, there's a, a polling station in uh, Rimby Rocky Mountain House that is open until 9:46 p.m. And that riding, which is a fairly safe UCP riding, they say is not going to release results until that polling place is closed. Uh, we're still trying to figure out why, but does this uh, ring any bells? Uh, I saw the notice earlier in the day. If there was an issue with electricity or uh, if something uh, had happened that made the polling station difficult to access, then they tend to add time at the end so okay. that people aren't disenfranchised from the right to vote. You know, we, we just talked about uh, the interesting issue of of the opioid crisis and I actually think it's a, an issue where the UCB um, uh, encircled the New Democrats, took over an issue that would typically be associated with on the left yeah. and they simply said look the evidence shows and it's clear that the approach that has been taken is just not working. 
We are seeing escalating opioid deaths. We are seeing escalating random acts of violence on our streets, people being stabbed, people being shot, people being attacked. And so what we have done is not working. It's time to try something new. And the New Democrat response has been, no, we just have to do more of what we've been doing that hasn't worked and then it will start working for some reason. Hmm. Which I think, you know, rational Albertans said, no, it's the definition to keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. We're going to do something different. So I actually think it's, it's going to come out uh, really well for Danielle when she appears to be trying something new and not letting the city, situation in our big cities really continue to deteriorate like we've seen in other parts of the North America. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was just going to add to that. I think, I think further to what you're saying, William, is that the NDP has been pretty quiet. They've been pretty quiet on a file that normally they'd be loud and proud about. So I think that speaks volumes in itself that uh, that this, this new way might be the right way. Uh, just uh, to keep people up to speed on this, uh, we have 87 ridings in the province. 44 seats for a majority. I've had a few questions from people I suspect are some of our non-Alberta viewers, which is fine. We welcome you. I'm a non-Alberta anchor, uh, although I, my heart lies here and I keep wanting to stay here. But uh, the thing that I would point out is that people have asked why it's guaranteed to be a majority government. So uh, let's talk about why there are no other political parties in this province that are viable, which is a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, I remember even uh, last election, the Liberals, the Alberta Party had a little bit of of a, a thought that maybe they could be something. Before then, they had a hefty amount of seats. Where have those parties gone? I mean, I think that's such an interesting change in how elections happen in Alberta. You go all the way back to 1993. That was Ralph Klein's first election when he became premier of the PC party. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, in a hotly contested election with the then Alberta Liberals. Mm -hmm. And well, you'll notice tonight that not only are the Alberta Liberals not going to win any seats, they're not even running candidates in most ridings. Mm -hmm. So they've gone from, from putting a scare into the PC government of 1993 yeah. to being no longer <laughs> a competitor. Well, and they do, I mean, they're not competitive in Alberta generally, but the Liberals federally have had seats here. I mean, it's, but that has never translated in the last two cycles to any provincial Liberal anything. Uh, well, and, and if you, you can even, you only have to go back to 2015 and even 2014, where you Democrats were still routinely only getting five or six percent of the vote in a lot of parts of this this province. It, the change really happened in 2015. That was when the sea changed. And then from then, you've seen the gradual consolidation both on the right and on the left behind two large parties. And, you know, Alberta, uh, we're, we're different than other parts of, of the country. Our approach to problem solving is often, let's start a new political party. <laughs> that seems like the way, way to go. But I, I think a lot of people have now said it's just too difficult, too expensive, and too hard to try and get a new party up and off the ground. So in this case, you're going to see a lot of people just parking their votes, even if they don't love the two main parties, but with one of those two main parties. Well, and the Alberta party, I mean, why is that not a thing anymore? Um, or, I mean, in so much as it ever was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the Liberal Party is going to become more of a thing, yes. actually, if the NDP do lose tonight. I think we're going to see some interesting movement on that file on the, or in the, on that front over the next four years. But I think I think what it comes down to is, is what you're seeing is a lot of these little up, uprising candidates from other parties there's a lot of negative campaigning. They're very much focused on the pandemic. They're very much focused on mandates yeah. and lockdowns. They're focused on vaccines. And I honestly, I think Albertans and Canadians in general are just tired of it. They don't want to talk about these things. So I don't think the content of what those candidates are talking about are resonating. You, see, you even see how the UCP, you know, they're talking about moving forward. And uh, Rachel Notley and the NDP, they talk about moving forward, right? We all need to move forward. I think that's, that's, that's the bus that Albertans are on right now. We don't want to go back to two years ago it was an awful time for everybody and yeah yeah and I, I think we have to talk about the alternatives that have come up in the last little few years the the wild rose independence party the alberta the Palowski party whatever it's called uh, there was also the other wild rose independence party that you know was started up by paul hinman after uh, he was ejected by the wild rose independence you, you've got three parties which i mean in ontario you had the same sort of dynamic in 2022 you had uh, two parties that were set up as protest parties that were not they, they didn't make a dent electorally, but they had a bit more staying power right now. Largely, a lot of those spin-off right-wing parties seem to have, most of their people seem to be fine with Danielle Smith. Uh, no, I absolutely think you're right. I mean, I, I have to make an Alberta party joke. I think it's obligatory, <laughs> which uh, I have a very good New, uh, New Democrat friend, and uh, we were out someplace, and we were 
talking about whatever the issue of the day was, and someone joked, oh, there's nothing that conservatives and New Democrats agree on. And my friend said, of course there is. We both hate the Alberta party. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think that sums up a lot of people's <laughs> feelings about, about that. But you're absolutely right that uh, there are a lot of other options. I'm not sure how they're markedly different than a Danielle Smith-led United Conservative Party. Uh, and I think that's why they had such trouble trying to differentiate themselves and get themselves up and going. So, uh, and on the right, what makes the Liberal Party different than the Green Party different than the New Democrat Party under Rachel yeah. Motley? I think you have a hard time articulating those differences too. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point. And I mean, a lot of the people that I met that were in the Alberta independence movement were big fans of Danielle Smith before she became the UCP leader. And I think some of them might say, yeah, you know, we want to hold her to account. But I think when push comes to shove and they're staring down Danielle Smith or Rachel Notley, they're they're, they're not going to do the Ken Boson cool thing of, of just staying home and, and not voting. But uh, there, there were, even after the last leadership, I, I think some people that feared Danielle Smith would have a hard time mobilizing the, the UCP apparatus, and she really didn't. I, I mean, you know, even Rajan Sani, who was, I think, very much on a different wing of the, the field from Danielle Smith, uh, you know, ended up running. <laughs> No, you make a really good point. I, I do think, uh, as, as Lindsay pointed out, appointing her opponents to high-profile cabinet positions was definitely a message yeah. that all types of conservative are welcome in the United Conservative Party. It's putting the word united back into that party name. Uh, I think the real challenge for Daniel Smith is actually what happens after the election, because holding on to the leadership of a conservative party in Alberta has become an increasingly challenging task. As fact, Jason Kenney could tell you. <laughs> as Jason Kenney can tell you, as Alison Redford can tell you, yeah. as Ed Stelmack can tell you, as Danielle Smith herself could tell you, this is not an easy job to keep this party together and going forward. So I think she's going to have a lot of work ahead of her after this. Even if she wins with a healthy margin, a healthy seat majority, Authority, uh, she will still have challenges ahead keeping this party united together behind her. Do, do you see that? Do you see there as being a unity challenge? Because usually victory is the antidote to disunity. But do you see there? Do you see Williams' theory as holding? Yeah, I see that. I, I think it's. I think she does have a heck of a challenge on her hands. I, I really do. I, I still see it. I still see some of the more political operatives, the more of the behind the scene people. They they just they can't accept Danielle Smith or and and I, I don't know what that's about. I don't know. I mean, we we know this is politics. There's a lot of ego involved there's a lot of history that people have let's not forget Danielle Smith has been around for a really long time right she's been on the Alberta scene her whole life so uh, you know there's gonna be things that come up from your past things from when she was a radio talk show host you know different things like that and there still is that kind of I mean is it a United Conservative Party some people still wonder that right there are still the Wild Roses there's still the PCers I don't know let's hope everybody can just work together because I know this from talking to Alberta proud people People are, are done with everybody being disenfranchised and with the infighting. It's really messy. It's really ugly. Uh, it's not a good look for conservatives. And so we really actually do need to get united moving forward. I don't want you to get too excited. We do have some results for you. I'm going to be very careful about how I read this to you. The UCP is leading in two ridings with 67% of the vote overall, uh, with 67 votes cast. So not the decisive majority territory necessarily, but uh, we do have uh, the Alberta advantage. Uh, the Advantage Party of Alberta has gotten one vote of those 67, so uh, they can be on track. Oh, wait, something's happening something's here. Happening. I hear the cheering. All right, uh, Dan Williams is winning his riding with 12 votes. So. Uh, good for Dan uh, Williams. It's all uh, all uphill for here, but uh, obviously at this point in the night, we're not expecting to have anything uh, too decisive. You know, a lot of the map is already done. Do we know really how many ridings are are really in play here? Well, from my you don't understanding. Need to the exact number, right? just a ballpark. Are we talking about 15? 15, okay. And that about 14 of those, I think, would have to totally flip, which statistically, I don't know if it's really possible. Anything can happen, and we, goodness knows that <laughs> holsters have been very wrong in Alberta in the last eight years, but uh, that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at a, a pretty sizable chunk of Calgary where the war is happening over yeah. who's going to control, and a handful of ridings in different parts of the province. Maybe one of the two Lethbridge seats, maybe Banff Kananaskis, maybe Strathcona Short Park. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, you're, you're really looking at Calgary. I have to, with all due respect to to uh, Dan Williams, if the UCP were not leading yeah. in Peace River, this would be a very bad night for them. Dan, yes. Dan Williams is, the, I believe, the one who chugged the beer in uh, the legislature. I don't even know what he was celebrating, but he was celebrating something. What was he celebrating?
Pretty, actually. Uh, I'm just going to go and say generically freedom. Okay. <laughs> what a way to win rural yeah. Alberta. Well, Dan, you know what? The, the beer stunt won him Peace River. So good for you, uh, Dan. It, you're, uh, you're, if you had teetotalers in your riding, they didn't revolt against you, at least with the first 20 votes in. Uh, so let's talk a little bit of uh, you know the dynamic here because obviously uh, the UCP is coming in strong on this they have only one way to go and that's essentially down there's not a single NDP held riding I'm seeing that the UCP is on track to even maybe pick up but at the same point to what you were saying Lindsay a lot has to really go right for the NDP tonight to win they have to they, they can't miss yeah and if you looked at some of Daniel Smith's social media feed over the last couple of weeks She's filling rooms in areas that maybe you didn't think she would be filling rooms. Like she's filling rooms in Calgary. So I don't think I don't see how it's possible at this point. But hey, it's an election. Anything can happen. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say, although we've had a lot of fun on social media about how many people can fit in a room. Uh, oh, you've yes. got claims that that a thousand people in a room that has a, a, a published seat count or room count, they can only hold 400. So you have to take all of it with a grain of salt. That being said, Daniel Smith does have an uphill battle to try and take new seats. The UCP did really well in the last election. They won a huge amount, number of seats. It was always going to be very hard for them to pick up new ones. Uh, I think they're kind of at their high water mark right now. Yeah, and I, I think that we should talk a little bit about, and we'll, we'll probably get to this later on in the evening, we should talk a little bit about the Calgary campaign dynamic because I know for a lot of candidates like Danielle Smith was there standing side by side with them at all of these campaign stops because as we were talking about she really didn't leave the city of Calgary as, as much as you might in a normal campaign and I, I think to compare it to the last federal election you know a lot of people were frustrated there and Aaron O'Toole was just camped out in Ottawa in this case it wasn't for you know any reasons except for this was the battleground this is where uh, Danielle Smith needed to win so uh, the uh, UCP is leading in Calgary, Buffalo. Now, again, I, I don't know how many votes are in, but explain, this is the tougher riding for the well, UCP. That's a very tough riding for the UCP. I, I, I'm just passing on what one of my colleagues said. Maybe it's like three uh, votes to two or I something. Should, I should say, I live in Calgary, Buffalo, and uh, well, I would love nothing more than to see it go conservative blue in this election. Hey, hold up, hold up. Yeah, they're leading one to zero. I, so I, our colleague led us astray on this one. I was about to say, I have a hard time seeing the, the NDP's Joe CC being defeated in All Calgary, right. Buffalo. I think he's probably safe there. Yeah. Well, you know what? If that one vote was the one. Uh, we're going to go over to uh, Rachel Emanuel, who's standing by with Jason Leader here on the Alberta Election Night Results Show for True North. Here's Rachel. I'm here with Jason Leader, a conservative strategist with Enterprise Canada. Jason, you were just telling me that you were heavily involved in the debate prep. We were just talking about how well that went over. What did you do to make Danielle so well prepped? We know she's already a really well-spoken and well-rehearsed because she spent so much time on the radio, but she really did exactly what she needed to do during that debate by not getting off message and staying really positive. So maybe you can explain a little bit to our audience what that debate prep looks like. Yeah, it's 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 fun, you know, like it's, um, it's, it's a weird process. You go through two or three days of this where you sort of bat around ideas on what's the best way but the big thing is to get the big question right and we wanted to do three things in the debate we want to talk about the economy we want to talk about Rachel um, Notley's sort of threatened 38 percent tax hike and we want to talk about a record and we wanted to do it in a way that was like really friendly right we expected Rachel Notley to be quite frankly not be able to hide her disdain for 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 myth, and we try to use that against her. So we try to be the friendliest candidate the most prepared candidate and quite frankly the most optimistic and positive candidate as well. And when we talk about, you know, your work to discuss jobs in the economy, UCP insiders I've spoken to have said they were really hoping that that would be the ballot box question of the election. Do you agree? Why is jobs in the economy the ballot box question of this election or was it more about trust in a leader? I think it was, first of all, it was both. There was two things. that The NDP really wanted to do the trust in a leader. I think that was a bit of a mistake, by the way. They didn't count on us being able to claw that back to sort of a 50-50 a proposition on the two women. And on the economy, I mean, the, we, we were sort of won that, that side of the campaign for sure. And the NDP NDP, gas increase that they promised in the middle of the campaign, I think was a big mistake. I think uh, it allowed us to focus right back on the economy where we wanted to be, and it provided a real world risk to people. You know, if you're going to voting and you're thinking, well, you know, is the oil sands going to be okay? Is the economy in Calgary going to be okay? Is the economy in Edmonton going to be okay? It gave you something to focus on, which was this threatened tax hike, which has real impacts on real people. Yeah, that tax hike was surprising. The NDP really ran as moderates during that, the, during this campaign, except for that tax hike. I think everyone was like, oh, yes, this is what an NDP government means. So certainly it was a good opportunity for people to sort of hone in. When we talk about a defining moment of the election campaign, one thing I heard from a lot of conservatives is 
This isn't seem like he's doing very much. I, people I spoke to said they were trying not to overpromise. Do you think that this was actually a benefit for the campaign, that they didn't have too many announcements? Or do you think that maybe they could have done a little bit more? I don't think it needed more announcements. The election campaigns, campaigns have really changed. They're about values, and they're about big picture directional stuff. And the question is, like, you know, if we would have done another announcement on, you know, skills training or whatever it is, like, you know, all the various things that you can do, the baubles that you can promise to people, I don't think it really punches through anymore. And I think people only hear the biggest possible things. And what we wanted them to hear over the last couple remember what it was like to have Rachel Notley as Premier? That wasn't so hot. And if you want to keep this economy going, you should probably vote UCP and, Vin and Danielle Smith. That's all we really wanted them to hear over the last few weeks. And I think we, felt, we feel pretty good about getting that message out. Okay, just my last question for you here. We have a few polls reporting. What is your election prediction for tonight? What do you think the seat count is going to be? You have to give me an exact answer. None of this <laughs> copping out about how the campaign was strong. Plus or minus 50, I think, is probably a reasonable, uh, you know, I, I, that's what we're hoping for, obviously. I mean, it, this is going to be a close election. We're hoping, we're hoping to sort of get somewhere near that 50 mark for sure. That would be a real nice, nice night for us. Absolutely. Well, some polls are now reporting, so we're going to go to them now and get a little bit of update. But again, that was Jason Leader, a conservative strategist with Enterprise Canada. Thanks so much for your time Thanks today. Yeah. All right. Back to you guys over. Okay, you're good. Well, thank you for that, Rachel. As you can hear, a little bit of excitement. Now, I, I don't want to be the wet blanket, but it's important to put in context here. We have very, very small numbers of votes in right now, 178 votes cast province-wide. Now, of those, the UCP is leading in riding. MP is leading in zero riding. So uh, still I get why everyone early in the night wants to uh, have a bit of a, a celebration here. Uh, the one thing I will say I love about provincial elections is you don't play the time zone game like you do in federal elections where you've just like, you know, just this wave of red and then a wave of blue. <laughs> so uh, at this point though, I mean the rural, we know it's going to go where it's going to go. Edmonton, a couple of question marks. Um, are you, from even the early sort of feedback you're seeing here, reevaluating your prediction at all because I haven't gotten you guys to give the numbers yet you're gonna lock in your numbers now how many seats you think the UCP and the NDP are gonna get okay I've switched okay I think 51 for UCP okay uh, I said 50 to 37 okay for the UCP to the NDP. okay does that math add up 50 to 37 yeah equals okay there you go I thought you said 51. No, that was, uh, that was Lincoln. No, 51, okay. 51 to 21. I, I, so I was the pessimist because I said 48. And you did, or you went I up. Did? You've gone no, up. Okay. I, I've gone up. So Dan Williams getting Peace River has like just given you a bout of confidence. <laughs> 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 and okay, well. I heard a little bit of booing. I couldn't tell who was booing, but uh, I noticed that Astrid uh, in uh, Calgary Buffalo is still holding her 1 0 lead. So. Uh, we'll see how we'll see how <laughs> things go there. Uh, we are alive here. This is True North. I'm Andrew Lawton, joined by Alberta Proud Lindsay Wilson and True North's very own William Macbeth. We also have Rachel Emanuel standing by, talking to all sorts of very important and influential people in the wings. And we're going to throw to that as the evening progresses. But let's first go to uh, a discussion that uh, Rachel had with a number of people outside the polling stations in Alberta earlier today. She was around Calgary, getting a sense of how people are voting what they're thinking let's roll that clip now Hey guys, it's Rachel Emanuel with True North. I'm here in Calgary, Acadia. That's Tyler Shandro's riding. He was the Justice Minister under former Premier Jason Kenney and under Danielle Smith. This is a toss-up riding. We're not sure which way it's going to go tonight. So I'm out here talking to some voters to see which way they voted today and what they think is going to happen later this evening. Stay tuned. So I'm here with Al. What did you think of the election campaign? Yes, uh, this is the tenth one I've seen. It's pretty much like all the previous ones. Are you comfortable sharing with us who you decided to vote for today? Yeah, I went with the NDP. Was there a deciding issue that caused you to vote for the NDP, or are you just more left-leaning typically? Not uh, left-leaning typically. It's just a UCP candidate. I really dislike him, this Chandro guy. So you dislike Tyler Shandro, what do you think about Danielle Smith? Do you think that she's crazy, sort of as the media and maybe the NDP have portrayed her, or you're just indifferent to her? No, I think she's a very controversial figure. You know, all the past things that she said and she's denying now, saying I'm a different person. I don't quite believe that. So what did you think of the election campaign? Did you think that the parties had a strong showing? Uh, yes, you know, the main two. Right, you don't hear much of the others, so um, 
it's going to be close. Are you comfortable telling us who you voted for today? It was U United Conservative Party. You voted for Tyler Shandro. And what sold your vote on him? Uh, my parents have always been, you know, Conservative Party, so I'm uh, holding that line. So this is a toss-up riding. It's going to be super close in this riding especially. How likely do you think it is that Shandro is going to pull out a win today? It's going to be really close, but I think they'll barely make it. So I'm here with Janice. Janice, what did you think of the election campaign? Well, it was kind of depressing. What made it depressing? Um, it was just sort of all about personalities and not about issues. Um, and sort of a popularity contest. So, it, yeah, just that's about all I have to say about it. Uh, Are you comfortable sharing with us who you decided to cast your ballot for today? Not really. Do you have any predictions about who's going to win the election tonight? Uh, no, I think it's very close. So I'm here with Casey's. Casey's, what did you think of the election campaign? Was there one party that you were sold on? Um, nope. The election campaign this year was, I felt, very targeted towards who's saying what and who's not doing what they said. Um, and I honestly would prefer to hear a lot more about um, the other parties and what they're doing and um, how everyone can work collectively in order to support the humans that are outside of the government, because that's important. Casey, are you comfortable sharing with us who you decided to cast your vote for today? Definitely not NDP. Okay, so I'm here with Trish. Trish, what did you think about the election campaign? Did you think that it was interesting, exciting? Did it catch your attention? Um, it did catch my attention. Um, it did have some interesting issues and uh, yeah, but I, I knew who I was going to vote for right from the get-go. <laughs> so I wasn't swayed either way. And what were some of the important issues that you think were discussed during the election campaign? Uh, definitely um, health care and sovereignty and education. Yeah, those are definitely big ones during the campaign. Are you comfortable sharing with us who you decided to cast your ballot for today? Sure, NDP. NDP. Uh, and what did you think about Danielle Smith as leader of the United Conservative Party? Obviously, there was a lot of attacks against her character. Did you think that those attacks were credible? Were you concerned about, you know, another tenure with Smith as the premier? Mm -hmm. Well, they appeared, they appeared to uh, uh, lead me to think that she's untrustworthy, but I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what if she if she becomes premier. We'll see what happens. So I'm here with Grant. Grant, what did you think of the election campaign? Well, uh, dirty was the beginning. Uh, to the end, we'll see what happens now that we voted. But overall, I wasn't impressed with how the mudslinging started because basically, if we can't talk two sides and just talk cleanly and plainly, then what's the use? Do you mind sharing with us who you voted for today? Sure, it's UPCs. So this is a really close riding. You've obviously cast your vote for Tyler Shandro. Yeah. As I mentioned, it's it's still a toss up. We're not sure which way it's going to go tonight. What are your inclinations? Oh, if Notley wins, no, I'm moving back to Saskatchewan. But <laughs> um, what about for this specific riding? With this one, well, Tyler Shandro, I think he's done well in uh, his post so far. So it's one of those things where um, now when you take a look at politics and how you can't really trust the information you're getting anymore because we don't have a media source anymore other than maybe you guys but uh with the mainstream media the way that they cover up things and they give only the message they want to give for us to get the information unless you want to go and do a whole horde of public uh, information requests and try to go through that and figure things out none of us are really qualified so I'm just hoping that the next four years, whoever gets in power doesn't kill us. Hey guys, it's Rachel Emanuel with True North. I'm here in Calgary, Acadia. In uh, Calgary, Acadia, which is uh, Tyler Shandro's riding. Now, this was your one to watch. So uh, you are the COO. So I don't know if you were the one that made Rachel uh, do her exit polls there. And that's why you're watching <laughs> it so closely. But uh, why is that riding a, a relevant one for people just tuning in now? Uh, I mean, I think it was absolutely one that the New Democrats thought they would be competitive in. Uh, their incumbent MLA uh, has had uh, a bit of a bumpy time on some issues. Uh, you know, he was obviously Minister of Health 
uh, for the beginning part of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I, I would say that was definitely one where the New Democrats thought he would be vulnerable. And it's also in, in the part of that belt of riding where the New Democrats have to start winning if they're going to win this election. In, in the all the things that need to go right for them, that's right in that wheelhouse, Lindsay? Yeah, I would agree with that. So um, be interesting to see that. Sure. Yeah, and, and Tyler Shandro, I mean, he was uh, like a very prominent cabinet minister in the Kenny government. Uh, he was ultimately the fall guy on the health file, uh, but then was given a boost back up by Danielle. So quite an endorsement for someone that she probably doesn't see eye to eye on on some of the key issues at least. Yeah, well, and of course, uh, Tyler Shandro as Minister of Justice is the purported recipient of the unfair influence that the Premier may or may not have exerted uh, over, uh, you know, uh, deferring or rejecting COVID-related prosecutions. Uh, all of that being said, I feel that, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, the Premier and, and Tyler, I think, is quite good. You also saw Jason, uh, or sorry, Stephen Harper endorse Tyler Shandro in the, in the final days of this campaign, which I think is a powerful message uh, of support for both both uh, uh, Tyler and the United Conservative Party as a whole. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Stephen Harper's endorsement, because he gave one earlier on that seemed a little bit lukewarm and generic, and then he gave a, a much stronger one this week, and then I was scrolling through Instagram yesterday, and I saw him like out there doing personalized endorsements of individual candidates. I saw him with uh, Rebecca Schultz and other Calgary candidates, and, and Stephen Harper is a guy who has not really waded into a lot of political fights since he left office. So what do you take from that? I, I think I think what pe people should, how people should read into that and as well, Pierre Polyev came out this week with his official endorsement of Premier Smith as well. But I think the best way for people to read into that is that Stephen Harper uh, is trying to send a message to Albertans that this is a really important election. You've got two very, very different governments. And I think the message that comes with Stephen Harper's endorsement is if, if you care about Alberta and you care about standing up for Alberta, I believe that we need to give the UCP four more years. This is the only way that we can really uh, take down Justin Trudeau and and we need to move in this direction. So I think that's, that's the powerful message with that. We have a few more results for you here. We've got more than the 67 votes we had earlier. Uh, right now, the uh, total vote count uh, that we have courtesy of Elections Alberta is 2,500 votes cast. That's province-wide. Of those, five people declined their ballot, which is like a very wonky political thing that if we really get bored later, we'll explain to you. Uh, and of these, we have the UCP leading in 17 and NDP leading in four. Uh, when we come back in a couple of moments, we'll do the breakdown of which of those are which. But right now, uh, Rachel Emanuel is by with Brad Tennant. Hey, Rachel. I'm here with Brad Tennant. He is a senior campaign strategist with Wellington Advocacy. Brad, you have been poking fun at the mainstream media online because they seem so eager to report that all these lifetime conservatives are, quote unquote, lending their vote to the NDP for the first time when we know, in fact, that's not the case. Tell me a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, I guess more than anything, you were seeing that the the there were these activists and former MLAs that were repeating the exact same thing they did four years ago when the NDP lost that election by trying to pretend to be conservative, switching to the NDP, when really they were against the UCP ever since it started. Sometimes satire can be fun in the hectic bit of a campaign, so sort of poked fun at that and uh, said I would be a lifetime new Democrat uh, looking to vote for UCP the first time, so had some fun. And, and tell me, did anyone actually decide to write about your, your story, your transition now lending the vote to the UCP for the first time? I think a couple caught the uh, joke of it and kind of saw the meltdown funny, but no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't reached out for any exclusive story, so. That's disappointing. A missed opportunity to be sure. And there, once again, we see the incredible bias of the legacy media. So one of the other really interesting things that you've been working on during this campaign is the get out the vote in Calgary, Acadia. We've discussed tonight how that is a riding to watch. That is Tyler Chandro's riding. Tell me a little bit about what you're expecting to see in that riding tonight. Yeah, riding to watch, uh, really important riding. I think one that's going to be close and one with the great incumbents. So. Uh, we're, we were giving her all there, knocking doors. Would like to apologize to anybody in Calgary, Acadia. We annoyed a little bit too much, but tried to get out all the vote we can. Uh, I think it's going to be close, but I think uh, it's looking good for us. You know, we saw improvement over the last few weeks. We saw Danielle's debate performance really reflect well, and we saw the candidate meeting a lot of people, which 
which worked out really well for us. So it's exciting. We're going to see where it goes, but pretty excited with where we're at as of tonight. Sure. And when we talk about Danielle's debate performance, that's something we've talked about a lot on the show tonight, a lot on my podcast throughout the weeks. And a lot of people have said that was really a turning point in the campaign. Did you notice that at the doors after the debate, maybe the doors warmed a little bit when people, you know, heard her name, they had a more positive impression of her following her quite excellent debate performance? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think at the start of this, the NDP really doubled and tripled down on negative attack ads. They were running and special interest groups were running millions of dollars worth of attack ads attacking Danielle. Um, and it was really all the NDP had out of the gate was launch volleys of attacks against Danielle. That led to the debate where Rachel Notley had to make her case, and I think she failed at that, and I think Danielle made hers just fine. Uh, so after that, I think the NDP negativity waved uh, or kind of waned off, and at the same time, people had an open eye to conservative ideas and saw policy and saw a platform they liked. So, you know, I think that was a bit of the catalyst for the turning point, but um, I, think, I think a lot built into it. Sure. And just my last question for you here before we head back to the panel. I have to ask everyone this. What is your estimated seat count? Where do you oh. think we're going to end up tonight? Oh, man. Uh, 87 UCP, zero NDP. So. Oh, wow. Very positive. And I absolutely believe that to be the case. All right. Thank you so much, Brad. Yeah. All right. Back to you, Andrew. <laughs> this party needs to start appealing to younger we, uh, voters. Sorry. I was, we just about had a lasagna tray cameo there walking in front of... Uh, Rachel Emanuel and Brad Tennant. So if you were tuning in for the lasagna tray guy, uh, we successfully chased him away. So he'll be uh, in for our next update in a little while. In a little while. Thank you very much for that, uh, Rachel, and thank you, uh, Brad Tennant. We are just giving you the latest numbers here on the True North Alberta Election Night Show. 7,646 votes cast. Of those, we have the UCP leading in 34 and the NDP leading in 12. Um, now, I have just basically on my maps have zoomed in on Calgary because that's really the only uh, area that really matters with the exception of a couple of outlying seats that we're looking at. But of the seats in Calgary for which there are numbers available, we're talking about small numbers, but the UCP is in the lead in every single one of them. And again, I, I cannot stress enough, do not go to bed now saying like Andrew Lawton told you Calgary was winning, like the people that were uh, against Brexit that went to bed thinking they had won. It's not that, I'm just saying that of the ones that are in, the NDP are not faring as well so far. And even up in Edmonton, the UCP are, are in the lead in a couple here. But uh, let's uh, discuss why Calgary is the battleground, because this is a, a city that has been through a lot in the last few years. Uh, we know, I mean, True North did a documentary about Calgary in crisis. Um, and even when you walk around now, downtown come back a little bit, but it's still not like the Calgary of its glory days. So what is the profile of Calgary now, electorally and just demographically? Well, I think, I think that what you're seeing is if the UCP is starting to show early success tonight in some of these Calgary battlegrounds, I think what you're seeing is that you've seen a switch in voters where they're starting to care more about the opiate crisis, about crime and public safety. I think that has become, I, I was talking about that about a month ago, I said that's going to become really pertinent these last couple weeks as we head into, the, into election day. And I think you're starting to see that people... They don't like the direction that Calgary is moving in. They don't like all the violent crime. We have, you know, we have office, and same with Edmonton, of course. We have homeless encampments. We, you know, uh, our streets aren't safe. Our public transit isn't safe. Our officers are getting shot and killed. That's not okay. And I think, I think we're starting to see a bit of a momentum. And if we're seeing these, some of these swing riding shift that way, I think that that has, that is winning over any of the NDP's messaging on healthcare because. It, fact is, you guys, at the end of the day, Daniel Smith made some really big changes with yeah. AHS, and the AHS's own data is showing that red alerts are, are pretty much no longer, EMS uh, wait times are less, uh, surgery backlog is getting alleviated. That's a lot of positive change in six short, short months, and maybe people are thinking, well, maybe, she, you know, maybe the UCP is the party to do more on the health care file. Maybe there's... I think, that, I think that's yeah. been up for grabs. Yeah, we have a, a few more numbers in here. Uh, the NDP uh, leading in a couple of the downtown Calgary ridings, uh, downtown issue, you know, Calgary Klein, Calgary Mountain View, uh, uh, Calgary Buffalo as well. And uh, just heading up to Edmonton here, uh, we have in this riding a, a lead I don't believe is real, so I'm not even going to read that one. Uh, but we do have in Strathcona Sherwood Park, the NDP are uh, leading right now. Uh, we have in a lot of the Edmonton ridings, no surprise there. Um, in Edmonton Southwest, nothing in yet. And that was the one I picked on my list uh, to watch, which was uh, Casey Maddu. So uh, right now, the uh, total standing is 42 to 22. 
uh, and the race is to 44. So we're getting close if these things hold. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, while obviously results can and will change as more polls start reporting, and particularly, uh, you know, if one party is doing better, say, in the advanced polls than another, then uh, that could really make a big difference yeah. when those polls report. So, all of that being said, you definitely want to be in the party that's leading in more seats than fewer. And the fact that they're doing that well in Calgary, I'm sure is very encouraging to the United Conservative yeah. Party. I'm sure, uh, you know, wherever the Premier and her tier core team are holed up some in some secure room watching these just as we are, they will be cheering to see the fact that they're leading in so many Calgary ridings. Because, uh, you know, not to rain on the parade of my dear Edmonton family and friends, or even the rest of the province, this was an election about Calgary, and therefore that's why we're watching this city so closely. Yeah. Do you see there as being a popular vote issue this election, where the popular vote could go one way and the election could go another way? Because this is, at the federal level, this has become the story of the last two. I, I don't think so. I, I can't imagine a case where that would happen here in Alberta. I mean, uh, technically, there are rural ridings of smaller bases, voter numbers of voters in them than some of the mm -hmm. city ones. That being said, I don't think the discrepancy is so uh, huge that it would ever result in a case where you would see the popular vote going to a party that didn't win the most seats. I, I only ask because right now, of the votes that are in, which is again, 9,900, not huge numbers here, uh, the NDP is uh, leading in the popular vote, 5,000 to 4,500, but the UCP leading in seats, 42 to 22. So I was just uh, geeking out on scenarios there. Um, let's uh, let's go in a different direction with this, Lindsay, because obviously uh, Alberta Proud has been connecting with people, uh, I mean, for many years, not just for this campaign. Have the issues changed in the last few years beyond COVID? Have, have they changed or have it, has it always really been about getting Ottawa off our backs, getting the oil out of the ground and, and these core Alberta issues? Well, we're into what, year eight? Year eight of Justin Trudeau's uh, government. Uh, we're in, we're, Albertans are frustrated. I think they're feeling more and more isolated. They feel like they don't have a voice. They feel like, how, how does this guy keep getting in? How does this keep happening? So unfortunately, through the pandemic, through more of this creation of, I don't know, I'd say US style politics and more of an us versus them and more of the focus on the two parties, right? And less of these other fledgling parties. Uh, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I, I, I definitely think so. Yeah, yeah I, some of our, uh, some of the people around here, I think, are seeing the 47 on the screen now and thinking they've already won. It's not that simple, is it, William? No, <laughs> no, sadly, you know, if you think about the problems with two million people, even more possibly voting in this election, you, you can't really get that excited when you've only got 10,000 yeah. votes in. That's, you know, and I'm the optimist of the bunch, but even I wouldn't be popping <laughs> champagne corks quite yet. I need a few more results. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the theater of, of this all, because we know that, again, we're talking about two leaders that are within uh, the likelihood of potentially winning tonight, one more likely than others, Danielle Smith and, and Rachel Notley. Danielle Smith is, of course, uh, going to be speaking here one way or another tonight, uh, not going to make an appearance until we know what, what's happening. So uh, how were you feeling in 2012, you and, and the leader and all the other people on the team, uh, I mean, I will definitely say that we had probably been lulled into a false sense of security by how many positive polls we had in the first three weeks of the campaign. You know, I, I think we felt that uh, we were really on top of a sea change in Alberta and that we were going to put an end to a dynastic government. And it was very exciting. Of course, as we all know, the wheels started to come off the bus uh, in the final week. Uh, and anybody who knows the bus <laughs> will get the reference. But, uh, you know, when we, had, when we were sitting in, in private, uh, it, it was a painful reality to realize that we weren't winning and we were going to form uh, an opposition. We were going to form a, a smaller opposition than we would have hoped for, 17 seats. And uh, it's, it is very difficult because, you know, you, you go in and you give it your best and you really want the best to happen and you really are optimistic. You think, you know, even if not every poll says it, in your heart you think 
oh, I think we've got this. Yeah. So it's a rude and harsh awakening when it turns out, no, you don't have it, and that Albertans have made a different choice. Do you think, Lindsay, that the UCP has been running a fairly confident campaign this time? Do you think they've taken an eventual win for granted? I don't know if they've taken it for granted. I think that they simplified their campaign. So I think in this last month, since the writ was dropped, they stopped talking about some of the more contentious things like the Sovereignty Act, and they really focused on cutting yeah. taxes, making life more affordable uh, for Albertans, and, and they just really went gung-ho with that. And I think that that's probably what's working for them, is is not appealing so much to some of the more uh, outer outlying issues that are a little bit more divisive among Conservatives. They just focused on making life more affordable, standing up to just transition, standing up for our, our energy sector, uh, keeping taxes low, putting more money back in the pockets of Alberta families, and I think that that's, that's the messaging that's worked for them. You, you bring up the oil and gas sector. We haven't talked about it a huge amount tonight, and I, I think it's a good opportunity now because the NDP has to masquerade as this very pro-energy pro-oil party, but as we saw from, you know, Rachel Notley 1.0, uh, even if there are some people in that party that are a bit more sympathetic to the sector, you also have the, you know, radical environmentalist anti-oil kooks that you'd expect in a, an NDP. Have they done a good job at sidelining those people this election? I don't know. There's there's a lot of what I would define as very eco-radical uh, candidates um, that are running on some of these NDP tickets. and. Uh, you know, they come out on Twitter, and I think uh, the UCP war rooms definitely put a lot of highlight around that. A lot of like the defund the police rhetoric, and a lot of, um, you know, we just had one of the candidates, NDP candidates from Livingston, Kevin Van Teagum, coming out, you know, quotes from his own book a couple of years ago saying oil oh, sucks yeah, yeah. and we're the suckers, <laughs> and comparing uh, oil, uh, oil production to slavery. I mean, these are really ludicrous claims. These are very dangerous claims. And when you have silence from the Notley camp on uh, Just Transition, and for people just tuning in now, if you're aware, Just Transition is the plan under the Trudeau Liberals yeah. to essentially get rid of our oil and gas jobs in favor of green energy jobs. And when you're hearing silence on that, I think people realize that we need a thriving energy sector. We need to do it here. We have the opportunity to provide the best, some of the cleanest oil and gas, and the world's going to need more of what we have, not less. So I, I, I think that that's starting to hit home with people. You know, the, the oil and gas question is very interesting. Um, when no Premier Notley became Premier in 2015, it coincided with a very difficult time in the energy sector. Energy prices were absolutely at some of their lowest levels. Yeah. Um, there, you know, Alberta faced really tough economic times. I don't think you can hold Rachel Notley 100% responsible for all of that thing. I do think her government made uh, of some serious mistakes. Uh, I think they meddled in the electricity uh, sector, and as a result, Albertans pay higher prices uh, for power bills. I think they scared away some investment. People thought, I'm not sure Alberta is going to be a friendly place to do business, and we don't know if we want to commit to a project that could take 50 or 20 years to see profitability if we're going to end up with uncertainty. So those are things that I think Premier Notley did have to take responsibility for. And there's also a reason, as, as, uh, as Lindsay pointed out, why you're seeing so much of Rachel and so little of every other new Democrat in this province. And it's because Rachel Notley is the polished, professional, reasonable face <laughs> of new yeah. Democrats. You know, she's the one who can say, I supported getting a pipeline built to Tidewater, the first pipeline in X number of years. And, and she said, look, I stood shoulder to shoulder with Alberta's energy sector. But you don't have to scratch the surface very far to find a lot of people who are not at all supportive of Alberta's energy sector. In yeah, the because those people don't really have another political home. I mean, the only place they're going to find any potential welcoming home is the NDP. So it's a party that has to keep the eco radicals very happy. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. It's very dangerous when you're seeing such extremism within a party. Is that what's it makes you wonder do these people even like Alberta do they even like us if you hate our energy sector so yeah. much and um, do you even like us yeah you may have to buy your own health care if Alberta doesn't have the uh, oil <laughs> yeah. and gas revenue coming in uh, if you're just tuning
thing in. This is the True North live election night results show for Alberta. Uh, the election has been a very, I, I'd say in some ways, uneventful campaign, but the polls closed 51 minutes ago. We are slowly but surely bringing you the results as they come in. Uh, right now, the UCP is leading 43 to 23, although the caveat there that I have to keep telling you is that's with about 15,000 votes cast across a province with 2.8 million registered voters. So a, a drop in the bucket, but still, uh, you hear the cheers uh, going up periodically behind us. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I'm going back again to the, El to the Calgary uh, breakdown specifically. And in Calgary, we have uh, the NDP gaining in a lot of those four territories, very narrow margins. I mean, one of them is the NDP leading in Calgary West with one poll uh, in which, again, I don't think we had uh, the candidate there. I think it's looking uh, pretty good for him. Calgary Varsity, we have the NDP leading, Calgary Mountain View, uh, Calgary Acadia. But these are, again, with one, two polls reporting. So uh, the nail biting continues on this. I, we, we're sort of joking about it, but if you're a candidate or a campaign staffer, this must be just anxiety inducing. It's a truly lousy time in your <laughs> Life. I, uh, I mean, I've worked on quite a number of campaigns and, uh, you know, while you are quite busy on election day itself, there's a lot of work to do. We, we do something called getting out the vote, which is where we do everything we possibly can to get identified supporters up and out. But once that's done, once they, you know, the polls have closed, there is nothing else you can do except sit and wait for your scrutineers to start reporting results. And it's agony yeah. because you don't know if you're going to end the night as the new MLA or the re-elected MLA for this riding or if you're now unemployed and yeah. have to go figure out what it is you're going to do yeah. starting next week. I, I don't, I'm going to try to improv here. Uh, Phil, there's a woman over there with a cut taxes sign. If we can borrow that sign, I want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, over there. So there's a th this was a campaign that the UCP did uh, as kind of a bit of a guerrilla campaign in response to an attack uh, that the NDP were doing where they were putting up all these really weird billboards uh, you know, like, what is Danielle Smith going to do next? Uh, what is Danielle Smith going to do next? And they were running this, uh, and, and the, the, it was not even clear looking at the posters what exactly the point that they were trying to make was. And some very smart uh, UCP staffer, and I don't know came from in the uh, org chart here, uh, decided to go around and answer the questions. And I saw someone holding up one of these signs. Uh, the answer is, Danielle Smith will cut taxes. <laughs> uh, that was one of them. And this is like the exact same branding and font that was on the original attack sign. And it was the baby sign next to their yeah. big signs. Yeah, exactly. Hilarious. Now, this, I thought this was just brilliant because it was a way to like turn an ad that was otherwise very odd uh, into a UCP win. Oh, I've stolen this from them. We're going to give I it back. I, love, I think I love the stormy, <laughs> moody background. I think it's great. That's yeah. my favorite part I about it. I love anything Thank in a you. campaign that is <laughs> clever or funny or makes you think. And it, it proves one of the rules of politics, by the way. You yeah. never ask an open ended question because you <laughs> want to answer like that yeah. to the answer. What will she do next? She'll cut taxes. Yeah. She'll fix health care. She'll get our streets safe. Those were not what I'm assuming the NDP yeah. were hoping people would answer that question with, but I thought it was a great little tactic. It definitely made me smile when I saw them on the roads. I, I saw a very strange ad, uh, the, the ad because I, I've been in Calgary for the last few days, kind of just seeing the, the lay of the land here. And the there was this one sign, I can't even remember what was on it, which is always good for an ad, but I remember being so utterly confused at who it was an ad for. And it ended up being an NDP ad, but, I, but it was just not clear. So the NDP have not really been Certainly on the ad game, I think they've been losing. I think so too. I think I think that you know they built the NDP has been really brilliant about bu building their marketing around Rachel, even their signs, Team Rachel Notley, not Team NDP, not NDP candidate. But, you know that's in smaller writing, right? Team Rachel Notley. Uh, but but yeah, I think I think the UCP and and, and really I usually give it up to the left uh, when it comes to more of their marketing campaigns because I think they're better at telling stories from the heart. Yeah. I think conservatives historically we bore people by talking about taxes instead of you know talking about it in a real way to people like hey mom with the minivan. Actually, what this means is it's going to cost you fifteen dollars more to fill up your minivan every time. That's what a carbon tax means. But instead, we tell it in such a boring way as conservatives, yes. like well it's going to cost an average blah blah blah, and people's eyes glaze over. And so I usually give it to the left but the UCP you know they they kind of took the gloves off a bit and and they were pretty funny and punchy with a lot of their marketing and a lot of their ones showing uh the extremism of the NDB candidates that really stuck with me and a lot of people I knew
No, is it? And I think we have to remember that the UCP campaign got off to a bumpy and then uh, almost hijacked start because, of course, Alberta was facing a massive natural disaster yeah. in the first week of an election. And, you know, most people uh, or some people may not know that despite there being an election, the premier is still the premier until a new premier is appointed. Yeah. So Daniel Smith still had to crisis manage, and I'm sure that threw a wrench into campaign planning for the United Conservative Party. In my opinion, it was the debate where things started to pivot, and I think the UCP really got their mojo back after that debate. Yeah, I, this probably shouldn't come as a shock to people. Danielle Smith is leading in Brooks Medicine Hat, uh, which is the uh, riding that uh, she decided to run in after uh, Michaela Fry, uh, who was formerly Mikla Michaela Glasgow, stepped down and uh, I believe is now working for the, the UCP. I, I ran into her uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. There was some criticism of Danielle Smith for not running in a Calgary riding. People sort of thought she should have been bold and gone for one of these ridings that, you know, the UCP may or may not have won. What, what's your view on that? Because she wasn't yeah. from... Brooks or Medicine Hat. She was from High River. Uh, I would say uh, the people who make those suggestions clearly haven't really done a lot of campaigning. Because the last thing you want to do is have your leader running in a tough-to-win seat. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be worried about what's happening in the leader's riding. Because you want the leader out. You want her in target parts of the world. Winning over a... So you don't want her having a pound doors in her home riding in a desperate bid. We'll just ask to John Tory in Ontario well, who exactly, lost his own right? seat twice. So, so uh, I absolutely, you know, that's why she didn't run uh, in Calgary Elbow, which was always going to be a really hard fight uh, for her to win. She made the sensible choice of running in a riding that the UCP were almost guaranteed to keep in their call. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, almost guaranteed, I think it's also a bit liberal with it, but, you know, strange things have happened. But to her credit, she still did campaign in that riding. I, I, someone told me, and I, I didn't see these, but she did two of the local candidates' debates there. She did launch her, her campaign there. So she has maintained a connection to that. And I, I think Danielle Smith was pretty clear earlier on when she ran in that riding that she wanted to tell rural Albertans that she was still going to represent them, which is not a, an altogether uh, unwelcome message for rural Albertans. It certainly is, and as a rural Albertan, as you guys know, I live in Cochrane. It's uh, we, we 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 need to know. It, there is a definitely an urban-rural divide in this province. I think that's probably the same is probably true in Ontario or in other provinces as well. But uh, we definitely want to be a premier that's going to represent our voices in rural Alberta. Absolutely. Well, we are going to have lots more results in just a couple of moments' time. The uh, latest update just before we throw away is that the. Uh, UCP is now leading 43 to 31, so it's gone down, which is why, again, you can't be uh, too cocky about this stuff. But let's go to Rachel Emanuel, who is the longtime conservative strategist, Vitor Marziano. Take it away, Rachel. He is a senior advisor on the UCP campaign. We have a couple of polls reporting now. Anything catching your eye so far, or is it still too early? Oh, it's still too early, but I, I, I don't mind the trends at all. I like the percentages. Um, you know, it's still too early to really take a measure of this. We're going to watch it carefully all night long. It's going to be a long night. There's going to be a lot of close seats. I'm more than cautiously optimistic that things will go okay. Absolutely. So we were talking a little bit about how we're not seeing a huge turnout right now compared to the advance poll. Maybe you can explain a little more in terms of what we're seeing of voter trends for election day voting versus advance voting polls. Well, one of the interesting things that's happened recently is that there have been elections where fewer and fewer people have gone to vote on election day. Um, the last uh, election in Ontario was particularly like that. You had a small number of people vote on election day, lots of people vote in the advance polls. As of about 5 or 6 p.m. tonight, it looked like that was happening in Alberta. Now, it's still a little too early to tell. Maybe there was a last-minute surge. There are lineups in some voting stations. But I wouldn't be surprised if the voter turnout for election day was only a bit bigger than the advance polls. So you mentioned there's going to be a couple of really close seats tonight. What are some of the ridings that you're watching? Oh, I think just about everything in Calgary is going to be close. I think everything in the donut around Edmonton is going to be close. But I'm feeling pretty confident that we're going to do well enough in enough of those seats to win the election. But uh, we're going to watch it, and it's a uh, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You gotta you gotta wait and see. There's a lot of coin toss seats. I'm pretty comfortable that we're going to win a good chunk of the 2021 seats that are up for play. But uh, we won't really know for probably another hour and a half. It sounds like you are optimistic. Let me ask you, in terms of Danielle Smith actually, you know, if they win the election, what if she only wins by a really small majority? Is it going to be hard for her to hold on to that leadership? No, I actually think that uh, Danielle has done a very good job of 
listening and accommodating her caucus and her cabinet. She's got a very different style of leader. And I think she'll adjust to the size of it and uh, and we'll be fine. It sounds like you think she has the support of caucus behind her, depend, no matter what that size is. She has the support of caucus. Caucus is going to give her a chance to put her stamp on government, to give her, let her run her government, earn the trust of Albertans. I'm very confident that, uh, that over the next four years, Albertans will be very impressed with the type of government she runs. Something I've been asking some of our other guests tonight is the UCP ran a pretty quiet campaign. Insiders I spoke to said that was actually intentional. We didn't want to overpromise. We didn't want to have too many announcements. Do you think that was the right move or do you think they could have had a little bit more FaceTime, big announcements with the voters? Uh, I think any insider who says as intentional as forgetting about the fires. For about 12 days during this campaign, we couldn't do what we planned to do. So the campaign we ran was not the campaign we planned, largely because big parts of Northern Alberta were on fire. And during the campaign, the, the Premier was spending half of her days being the Premier rather than being the leader of a party campaigning. So in, in many ways, we didn't get to run the election we wanted to run, but at the same time, Albertans got to see Danielle being who Danielle is. Attention to detail, focus on leadership, and ability to bring people together, and ability to focus on the things that matter. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because we spent a lot of time talking about the fires at the beginning of the campaign, but we haven't really talked about it too much since. Do you think that the fires were a detriment because Daniel Smith wasn't able to get it on the campaign, or do you think it was an opportunity to prove herself as a trustworthy leader to voters who maybe weren't sold on her? It's a little bit of both, but ultimately, I think, you know, as a campaigner, I would have rather had 12 more days of Daniel Smith campaigning. Uh, we didn't get to do that because of the fires. So, you know, I, there's a sense, to me, there's a sense that it was a net negative. But at the same time, it kind of canceled out the NDP's narrative that, that Danielle Smith wasn't up to the job or wasn't the sort of person you could trust because people got to see her be trustworthy every day. And just my last question for you here. Do you think that there was a defining moment of the campaign? A lot of people I've talked, they think it was debates. Agree, disagree? The debates were important, but it wasn't because of what happened at the debate. It was because of what didn't happen at the debate. Um, the NDP gambled their entire campaign on Daniel Smith being unreasonable, un Albertan, um, off putting on the debate. And Daniel Smith showed up at the debate and was Daniel Smith. She had careful attention to detail. She was positive and upbeat. She was more upbeat than the NDP was. And that became a good debate. But it wasn't it wasn't because of anything we did, it was because of things the NDP didn't do. All right, well, thank you so much. Once again, that was Vitor Marciano, a senior campaign advisor on the UCP campaign. We appreciate your insight today. Back to you, Andrew. All right, if you're just tuning in, I am Andrew Lawton. This is the live True North Alberta election results show for the 2023 election. If you're really not convinced, you know what's happening. Uh, this is not the uh, 2019 election. That one already happened. The UCP won big majority then. It's going to be probably... from True North and Lindsay Wilson. I'm sorry, I laughed when I said uh, your name. I didn't, that was very rude of me. I've been sitting here for many hours and from Alberta Proud. End of sentence, end of thought. I was still in time Make waiting sure for results. Make sure you read my book when it comes out. It's, it's short. The, uh, the poll are uh, for, uh, basically an hour and five minutes now. One poll is uh, staying open until 9.46 p.m., uh, which is a very precise time. 22,545 votes cast, and of those, 45 are leading UCP, 29 are leading NDP. Um, one thing we haven't talked about, which is actually a bit of a, you were saying, contentious issue uh, for even some Conservatives, is the arena, which uh, Danielle Smith really went all in on this campaign. What's happened there? So, you know, I can take us back five years ago, and Conservatives have always been really divided on the arena thing. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, I think strategically it was smart. It had a lot of criticism, and I know my friends at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation are going to like me for something. They, they came out very strongly saying this is a bad deal for taxpayers. Well, you know what? It kind of is if you look at it from from that one perspective. What's a worse deal is if Calgary loses its NHL team. And not to mention that just the NHL team, but we need to rebuild this downtown core. We need to create some more vibrancy in the downtown. There's just a lot of potential for revenue in there. 
the whole sales pitch for the for the arena. Strategically, I think that that bought Danielle some favor. I think it created some favor for her in the tighter battlegrounds in Calgary. Maybe that's what we're seeing. I know generally the Olympic bid, when that came up however many years ago, I was guest hosting on 770 at the time. And, um, I mean, I, I, didn't, I wasn't even a Calgarian, so I didn't even care about uh, you know, it all that much on the positive side. I just took the standard taxpayer position that I would take if it were in my city. I know Conservatives were fairly united against that. And it is a different campaign that you see on the arena. Oh, you know, full disclosure, I was part of the organizing committee for the yeah. nose guy. I recall the so, photo on the front page of what was it, the Calgary Herald of you celebrating. So uh, I shouldn't have said it was an impartial this year. But I will say one notable conservative who supported the Olympics bid was Danielle Smith. And in fact, she uh, spoke about it a few times on her show in favor of it. Now, I think it's sort of in the same camp as the new arena in that uh, uh, there is the upside for a lot of good things, you know. Um, what I like about the arena versus the Olympics is there's far less risk associated with building a new arena than there is with hosting an Olympic Games. You really have to look at the, the dismal track record of the city to host an Olympic game to see how expensive and long it's actually yeah. goes. But for, for Danielle, I think she looks at it and says, we definitely want to keep our flames here in the city. We definitely want to get some of those great concerts that Give Calgary and go to Edmonton. I know that as a Calgarian, that really rankles when Edmonton gets a better concert than we do. And if you bring thousands of people into that part of the city on a regular basis, you're going to see restaurants and bars and other stores benefiting from the spillover of that economic activity. There's a lot of upside. Now, this arena deal only happened because, of course, the last arena deal got blown up by Calgary Mayor Jody Gondek, who insisted they build solar panels on the roof of that arena. And sidewalk. Uh, because, you know, Calgary is facing a climate emergency. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think Daniel also said, I think we can all agree that was a ridiculous thing that the city did. They blew up a pretty good deal in order because they wanted solar panels on, on the roof of it. We're not going to make that same mistake again. And I think Jody Gondek had to wear that. And and this is why Daniel said I support Arena. Since you bring up Jody Gondek, I, there hasn't been the hostility between the two that I, I think a lot of people. I mean, one example that came up where a, a Calgary municipal issue was getting fairly broad uh, coverage, I mean, including by True North, was this uh, ban on protesting drag performances, which Danielle Smith took a more lukewarm position on before eventually kind of taking the, the free speech side on this. Uh, even the climate emergency, I mean, this was declared before Danielle Smith came in, but the two have appeared together. Uh, how do you think that, do you think it's a, a working relationship that is working? Uh, maybe I, I, I see. I see. There's like uh, Jody Gondek and Amarjeet Sohi uh, in Edmonton, of course. Uh, uh, polar opposite from somebody like Danielle Smith. But at the and, and at the end of the day, you know, we have very left-leaning governments that are running our two major cities in Alberta. We have a very left-leaning uh, federal government. So for us at Alberta Proud, we've been kind of going with the slogan, like, can we really afford to pull our goalie from the net by having a left-leaning government yeah, in, right. in 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 at, at the province, provincial level too, right? So we need some balance. When we talk about checks and balances, uh, I think we need to keep in mind, like we have very left-leaning, um, some might say eco-radical mayors running these two cities. And I think Daniel Smith's going to have her work cut out for her there, <laughs> to, to find that balance with them. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Yeah. I think definitely, uh, I think she's made a really good start in uh, green lighting, uh, the provincial contribution, which is to the infrastructure side of things, uh, um, to for the Calgary Arena, which is a one million dollar project but hey you know what on the upside for calgarians maybe this magical mythical unicorn this gr green green line you know the biggest infrastructure project the or if some like to call it critics like train to nowhere maybe yeah. the train can actually take people down <laughs> to the new event center yeah and we all win i'd like to think it had that amount of floor planning <laughs> i remain questionable on it yeah. your uh your lindsay your bamp canon ask is so far uh ucp leading with uh, three polls reporting so uh, 23 polls left but still miranda rosen has a very, very narrow uh, lead on that one over the NDP. Um, just for people tuning in now, why is Banff an interesting one? Because I, I know Banff is a fun place for people. It's beautiful. It's scenic. There are great restaurants, but politically wacky. 
Yeah, well, I, I think that <laughs> people in Banff and Cameron, I love Banff and Cameron. I live in Cochrane. It's an hour away. I've spent a ton of time there, of course, and I love going out there. And I think you get people, they're really focused on things like healthcare, on environment, and on tourism. And, and you definitely get a lot of loud voices on the left yeah. that tend to uh, migrate toward those issues. So you've got that. And then you've got the ranching country, and you've got Bragg Creek, kind of that middle ground, and then you got down to Prittis and, and uh, Elbow. And, and so you've got, like, it's like it's like a real schmozzle. It's a really big, like, geographically, not population-wise, but geographically, it's a really big riding, but it's, like, complete polar opposite sides of the spectrum. But you do have that population base in Canmore and Banff. Is that why, do you think that is a riding that's going to eventually get split up, or is it just not there but it yet, already was. If you, it, oh, okay. So Cochrane was with, was there before, so they've already split that up. Okay. So I don't know if they're going to look to that riding yeah. again. I'd say that's eight years out for that uh, one. Well, on that note, William, I'll add to the to what you were going to say in asking how much is redistricting of the dynamics in Calgary? Because it seems like quite a bit. Oh, absolutely. And uh, not all redistrictings are created equal. Sometimes you are just tweaking. And sometimes you get an independent commission <laughs> that really takes a knife to the existing map, chops it up, and builds a whole new thing. So uh, I think what you're seeing right now, this is quite a different layout for the city uh, than it was back in, in the early 2000s. I think that's had a, a, a real impact on how some of the vote's going. But, uh, you, you know, um, all cities tend to be comprised of sort of three chunks, if you like. You've got the urban core, you've got, uh, you know, more of the suburban, out, and then you've got what we call exurban or bedroom community type things, some of which get, eventually get eaten up as the city keeps growing. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking of places like Airdrie, which really abuts up to the city of Calgary right now. There's not a lot of empty space between those two. The further out of the core you get, the more conservative they, these places tend to become. So if you construct ridings that hybrid, to some degree, core and suburban, depending on how you draw that line quite finely, you're either giving it to a, a left-wing or making it more open to left-wing election, or you're keeping it in more conservative territory. So that's part of the fight that happens every time we redraw all of Alberta's ridings. <laughs> Does it always benefit the left? Is that generally what happens? Uh, no, not always. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, this is this is for all of you uh, geek nerds out there who study <laughs> redistricting. But back, I, I know you're all out there. Uh, <laughs> there might only be two of you, but you are watching. <laughs> back in the mists of time, in, in 2004, Edmonton went from having sort of uh, six wholly inside Edmonton ridings to eight ridings that were a combination of a chunk of Edmonton and a bedroom community around Edmonton. Edmonton Sherwood Park, Edmonton Beaumont, Edmonton Spruce Grove. And that meant that almost all those ridings voted conservative because they had a healthy dose of small town Alberta tacked onto a city riding. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting because in the context, the suburban votes are always where elections are, are won or lost. And, and even in Alberta, it sounds like that's generally pretty true as well. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, um, if you look at, at the famous, why can't conservatives win a, a national election, it always comes down to those suburban ridings in and around Toronto. I think the same thing is being said to, to a degree about Calgary. It's all about how those suburban families, yeah. and we are typically talking about families with children uh, where one or both parents works and their concerns are, uh, you know, they're concerned about health care, sure, but they're also concerned about how safe are their kids walking to soccer practice or walking home from soccer practice or, or gosh, isn't feeding a family of five becoming so much more expensive because of inflation and the rising yeah. cost of living? So uh, the update from uh, Alberta election, or elections Alberta have not come in in 14 minutes. Uh, so they're still holding at 45 UCP and uh, 29 NDP. Uh, now I've seen some of the other media outlets have some updates since then. I'm not entirely sure where they're getting their numbers from if the uh, Alberta Elections Bureau's numbers are, are not coming in. But we are going to keep you apprised of all these developments and, and again, uh, 45 UCP and 29 NDP, according to Elections Alberta, that's with uh, 22,545 votes cast. And uh, a couple of people have been asking about uh, Arthur Polowski's party. Uh, he is currently, I, what, I forget, his name, is his the Solidarity? Solidarity. Yeah, yeah that's uh, They're at 84 votes right now, so that we're not seeing the Polowski momentum uh, that a couple of you might have wanted. Now, 
This has actually been interesting. The Wild Rose Loyalty Coalition is at 52. Uh, small numbers here, but the Splinter Wild Rose Party is doing better than the original Wild Rose Party. Oh, goodness. You know, they're I, just frustrated. <laughs> they're just confusing people. Yeah. I like to consider myself reasonably well informed in Alberta provincial <laughs> politics. And even I've lost track of who's where and yeah. on what team and on what party. Yeah, fair enough. And there are also a bunch of other parties I've never heard. The Buffalo Party of Alberta, not uh, with any votes in Calgary, Buffalo, though. Uh, so oh, it feels I, like a missed opportunity. Yeah, they uh, don't have the home field advantage there. The so. Communist Party. Uh, the Communist Party is at 51. Thank you, Lindsay. And, and since we're just going through... I think they go by NDP now. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, there we go. The Reform Party of Alberta has four. Uh, let's see. The Independence Party of Alberta has 78, which is different from the Wild Rose Independence Party. And the Wild Rose, uh, we already did that. The Pro-Life Alberta Political Association has zero so far. Uh, but the Green Party has 125. So, so these parties do exist, uh, but they're not particularly politically relevant. The Alberta Party, which we were talking about earlier, has 1% of the vote. Now, we talked about this a little bit on the debate show. The Alberta Party has kind of been like this Rorschach test for people, where you know some conservatives think it's like a moderate conservative party, some liberals think it's a moderate liberal party. Like, uh, what are they? Confused. Okay. Yeah, they're confused, I think. <laughs> So I think, like I said, look, what we were talking earlier, I think we're going to con con we're going to continue to see them go down. We're going to see more of a rise of probably the Liberal Party, which will maybe make things very interesting for the NDP in the next election in four years from now. But the Alberta Party, as we've talked about again on our debate show, has had such an interesting journey. Uh, <laughs> when it was first established, it was quite right wing. It was sort of a provincial reform party started by a lot of ex reform types. And when I say that, it's not that they stopped believing in reform. They actually opposed the creation of the Canadian Alliance because yes. they felt <laughs> it was a watering down yeah. of reform principles. They were too right so for the alliance in Stockwell. They Day. took okay. it over. But then, because this was such a small and, frankly, badly organized political party, one AGM, a bunch of ex-PCers upset that their party had apparently drifted too far to the conservative side, took it over. And it became this mushy, centrist party. But uh, they did have a leader called uh, Greg Clark, and he actually did quite well for them. He had won a seat for himself. They had gotten another seat. I, I can't remember if it was a floor crossing or if they had won some other way. But they actually got up to having several MLAs in the legislature at one point. So, of course, the natural thing to do was to get rid of the guy leading it who had had success and replace him with former Edmonton Mayor Steve Mandel, who had just lost his own riding in... Uh, provincial election. Critical missteps. Why they did that is, is mystery to me. So the uh, UCP lead has gone up to 52. I think the cheering behind there is that uh, Tyler Shandro has a slight edge in uh, Calgary, Acadia uh, over the NDP. Some more polls in. We got a little bit more. Uh, we've got to take a very quick break here. We're going to do a, a quick reset and break things down with Rachel Emanuel. Stand by. We're not going anywhere. We will be right back in 30 seconds.
We are back. Thought we'd give you a, a little look at the crowd. You look different, William. It's good to have you here. We have uh, tagged out uh, William McBath, not for anything he said, but just because we wanted to get uh, the lay of the land with uh, Rachel Emanuel here, True North Alberta correspondent, who has been doing a tremendous job chasing around all the movers and shakers of Alberta politics on the, uh, the floor here. Uh, what's the, how you've been out there? I've been hearing it every now and then. How are people feeling? Yeah, so, you know, it's pretty early still. It sounds like everyone's pretty convinced it's going to be a really, really late night. But Vitor Marciano, a senior campaign strategist with the UCP, uh, he just came up and he gave a little bit of insight and he said, it's still quite early, but the polls are trending in the right direction. He likes the numbers that we're seeing, but certainly it's going to be a long night. I saw some complaints online. People were saying, it doesn't always take this long. I feel like <laughs> we should be a little bit faster, and especially with some of the advanced votes being counted by tabulators. So hopefully we will start to get some more seat counts in soon enough. And uh, people don't have to stay up all night waiting for the results of the election. By that you mean hopefully we don't yeah, have to I'm stay up all night <laughs> waiting for the election. Yeah. <laughs> Enlightened <laughs> self-interest, I believe the uh, the saying goes. Yeah, I mean obviously we're hearing the uh, the cheers from behind. The last numbers I'm seeing here are uh, 51 UCP, 33 uh, NDP. Now this is leading, not declared. But uh, have we seen any pretty meaningful results yet in, in Calgary or even anywhere else? Um, I believe I saw it. Calgary and Katie came up a little while ago, and we heard a pretty big cheer from the audience at that point. Looks like Tyler Shandro was leading in the polls that had been reported. We know that the party has dumped a lot of resources there. A lot of people that I talked to that went door knocking went in Tyler Shandro's riding, and that's going to be one to watch tonight. I think every single person pretty much brought it up at some point or another. So people were pretty excited to see that. And I think overall, like, the polls are reporting pretty well for us. I mean, it's still so early, but you kind of get your hopes up, I guess, and you think, oh, well, leading, hopefully, hopefully it stays that way. Yeah, I mean, Lindsay, I know you've been up here with, with us, so you haven't had the, the chance to walk the floor yet. But uh, generally speaking, people seem to be in a pretty celebratory mood. I'm not seeing the nervousness that you sometimes see on election nights when you aren't sure, you, you know, it's probably not going to go away. Well, again, I think we go back to that, that d debate a couple of weeks ago. I think that was a bit of a turning point. And I think we're just seeing such a s slew of pollsters that are, have been so definitively declaring a UCP majority over the last five to seven days that I think that that tone, there hasn't been any major blunders. You know, I think we were all thinking with this gloves off campaign and, you know, the Rachel versus Danielle, what else is going to come out? There's been some things that have come out on the premier over the last few months, things she said in the past yeah. in her radio show days. And I think we were all waiting for like another shoe to drop last few days and there was nothing. And I, I was kind of surprised by that. And I think they've just kind of carved out this path toward victory. I think things, I think, you know, the wildfire situation that was definitely disruptive, but certainly uh, the province acted very quickly on getting out of province help for that and uh, stopped campaigning for those few days. And uh, the weather also turned yeah. and we got some rain yeah. and that helped. So the timing of all, it's all these little tiny things that kind of came together. And I think the stars have sort of aligned for them that, you know, I don't, I, I don't think we can say, we're going to go into this with the UCP necessarily having 51 or 52 yeah. seats, but I think they're, yeah, I'd be hard pressed to see if they're not going to make 44 at least. Uh, Rachel, the last few days of the campaign, I mean, I'm used to seeing leaders go morning to night, you know, photo off, photo off, rally, rally, rally. Uh, Danielle Smith, she had a, a press conference, I think it was on Friday, and that was the last time she had a, a publicly announced event. I know she popped up to the few little events with local candidates. She was uh, running in a race in Calgary. Which, yeah, she was in the Calgary Marathon. Yeah, which, uh, which went by my hotel room. So I was like cheering on the runners, but was definitely not joining them. Um, <laughs> but I mean, what do you make of that, if anything, that, that relatively low laying last few days? Yeah, it's definitely been pretty bizarre how little has gone on. And I've asked a lot of people for different takes on it. One of the takes that I've heard a couple of UCP insiders say is, oh, well, we tried to keep it pretty low key. We didn't want to over promise. You know, we wanted the few important things that we did promise to really stand out, some of the tax cuts, things on jobs, the economy, public safety. So they said we didn't want to be like the NDP over promising everything. So that was one take. You know, another take was that they had to quickly change their campaign at the last minute when the wildfires crisis yeah. really erupted in northern Alberta at the beginning of the campaign. That wouldn't exactly seem to extend to the end of the campaign, but Peter Marciano was just saying to me, you know, we really had to adjust the campaign for those wildfires, and that wasn't something that we had entirely anticipated, so we did change our campaign. And then another perspective that some people shared is, well, you know, we've had a little bit of gas with the media, and maybe it's just better if we don't give Daniel Smith too much airtime. More skeptical 
will be that Timmy Bullet had is just try to keep it away from the media as much as possible. Things are going smoothly, things are going in our direction. Let's not ruin that after a strong debate performance. Let's just keep things simple. And you know, the media hasn't been too friendly to Daniel Smith, that's no surprise. So, you know, the less airtime they can they can give him, maybe it seems as a bit of a benefit for the campaign. Yeah, and just on that note, I mean I that press conference that she had uh, was marketed as an announcement, but there really wasn't anything to it. Now at that point, you know, that campaign, the announcement was NDB bad, UCB good. So when you have that little to announce, why just throw yourself to the wolves, uh, give them an opportunity to get a pound of flesh from you, right? I think you saw a little less Danielle as well the last couple of weeks, and you saw a lot more of the team. So you saw a lot of Rebecca Schultz, you saw a lot of Brian Jean, and, and perhaps it, maybe this has really worked out for the UCP. You're seeing those voices showing, you know, a really effective cabinet and showing a more united front and showing really capable, experienced, uh, MLAs. Yeah. What were you going to say, Rachel? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say they had a couple announcements like that. It didn't even just wait till the end. They had a couple announcements that were non announcements. I drove all the way there and I was like, all right, we'll see what's happening. It was like NDP sucks, vote for the, vote for the UCP. And everyone was like, okay, I don't know if this really qualifies as an announcement. They did that a couple times, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, but I mean, again, it's you, you expose yourself to the media, you let them ask about whatever they want. I mean, if you don't give them an announcement to cover, they don't have a, a, an announcement to cover here. Uh, just because I asked the other uh, panelists here, Rachel, and now you're uh, swapping in, uh, what is the riding, if any, that you're paying attention to, that you're kind of interested in? Yeah, so I did mention this to uh, the audience a little earlier in the night. I know Calgary Acadia has come up so much, but I've been told that along with Calgary Glenmore, which is Whitney Essex riding, are really two to watch in Calgary, as well as Calgary Cross. I know that there's been a lot of efforts being dumped there. I know a lot of people working on that campaign. I think they sort of saw it as we're losing Calgary Cross. That's Mickey Amory's riding. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of a, a late effort to really get some feet on the ground and go out door knocking and prove that campaign. So I actually think we might pull off a win in Calgary Cross tonight. It was, it, it is a toss up. It was slightly leaning UCP, the last numbers that were re reported on 338 Canada. So I think those are some to look at across Calgary. Of course, Calgary Edgemont is going to be another really interesting to look at. That's the side of Panda's riding, that other toss up is probably MVP. I don't know if we're going to be able to pull that one tonight. And then outside of Calgary, or rather outside of Edmonton, we're sort of looking at the ones outside the donut. A couple ones there to see if we can pull off a win in those ridings or hold on to seats that currently existed. So a couple of those, I think we're going to be paying close attention to Morinville St. Albert, see if we can hold that riding, as well as Strathcona at Sherwood Park is another one that's Nate Lubish is riding. Are we going to be able to hold those ridings or are we going to really lose that dome outside of Edmonton? And of course, Casey Maddow, I think I heard you mention that on the show earlier. I think everyone's kind of accepted we're probably not going to win that riding. That's not going to be a UCP win tonight. And, you know, he is the deputy premier, so certainly a big loss to the party. There'll yeah. be big shoes to fill there. But I think people have generally accepted they're losing the ridings within Edmonton. And by that, I mean all the ridings that have Edmonton. It's just a question of can we hold on to some of those ridings outside the donut? Uh, yeah, and just to look at Edmonton right now on my trusty map here, not a lot of polls uh, in, in Edmonton. I mean, most of the ridings here have one, two, three reporting. Uh, like in Edmonton Southwest, it's still uh, going NDP, but that's only with uh, one poll in. Uh, Calgary, we've got a little bit more in the way of results. Just to go around here, you mentioned Calgary Glenmore. Uh, UCP currently leading in Glenmore with five polls reporting. In Acadia, three polls in. Tight. Sandro's up by six. Yeah, very tight. Uh, we have in uh, Calgary Klein, that is uh, Jeremy Nixon. He's leading with four polls in. So uh, again, it depends on which of those polls we're talking about here. Like if it's the, you know, the, the conservative neighborhood, then it's not all that important. If it's a neighborhood that's a bit more uh, down the road, this could tell us something. So we'll, we'll see as the night goes on. But I guess the, the question that I would ask would be, did you feel it was an eventful campaign? Because you were covering it on the ground. I know you didn't really have to go that far. Uh, you know, it's like you weren't going up to Fort Mac and down to Medicine Hat because so much of it was in Calgary. But it seemed pretty linear to me. Like, I don't recall any real bumps. Yeah, I didn't really find that it was super big. See, you kind of aren't really sure to expect, and I've, this is my first time covering a provincial election campaign. I've covered many federal leadership campaigns, so I was kind of excited because when you cover a federal leadership campaign, if your outlet doesn't have the budget, which mine never did, they're not actually sending you out on the campaign because that would be spending it all over Canada, and most outlets don't have the money for that nowadays, or they're only sending their you know one or two reporters. So I was excited to be covering a provincial campaign because it meant that I would be able to attend all the events in person because you know it's Alberta, you can pretty much drive from place to place. It's a bit of travel. So I was excited to cover this campaign and I did really 
enjoy being able to go to the events and being able to get my questions in, but it wasn't terribly busy, it wasn't terribly eventful. And then of course we had a fair amount of difficulty getting into those Alberta NDP events. So, you know, maybe they were hosting a lot more events than they used to be, I think two up to two a day at some point. But we would be lucky to get access to two of their events a week because not only did they not really want us there, but they also made it very difficult for us to actually know the location of those events. So on the rare chance we found out where they were happening and we could get there and, and get inside and get asked for questions, it was great. But we did miss out on a fair amount of their announcements. And so really, we missed out on that and then the UCP didn't do too much. So it wasn't super busy, it wasn't super eventful. There was a couple of moments of the campaign that I really noticed. You know, Danielle Smith started the campaign with a big announcement on tax cuts. And another really big announcement that she made during the campaign was the Compassion Intervention Act, yeah. which we talked about extensively with some of our guests on tonight. Those were pretty big announcements, but it wasn't super big, and I felt like the NDP spent so much time lobbying insults at the premiere, and I don't really felt like they stuck. You know, I think maybe some of her comments on the COVID vaccine got a little bit of attention, but I never really felt like there was a moment where I'm like, wow, we're still talking about this attack that they launched a couple days ago. It pretty much seemed they would call something. And you know, as a party, you never want to be on the defensive, you never want yeah. to be responding, because that's the day you've lost <laughs> yeah. the message. And so certainly that was a bit of an issue at the beginning of the campaign, but they were still sort of able to address it and, and move on, which is something that you really never know how that's going to go, because in other campaigns, an attack can completely derail your campaign and keep coming up and get throughout the campaign. And so, you know, it wasn't terribly eventful on, on either side, I would say. Uh, what was your take on it? I mean, when, when you were, I mean, from an Alberta Proud perspective, even, were you finding like there was a lot of engagement or was it relatively low or just kind of moderate? Well, Alberta Proud, you know, they, there's there's a good little red meat base there, <laughs> certainly. And uh, there was just a, kind of the consensus from the people that I talk to every day through Alberta Proud is that a vote for Notley is a vote for Trudeau. It's a vote for the NDP Liberal Coalition. And no matter how much issue people may take with Daniel Smith or some of her MLAs or some decisions, some of the policies that the UCP has come forward. Uh, what people seem to be really resonating with people is that they're taking a really hard stance on crime, the opiate crisis, public safety. Uh, so, and, and trying to do some real change within healthcare, yeah. which, uh, you know, is always such a contentious file for, for conservatives, certainly. So you mentioned the uh, addiction issue, which we were talking about a little bit earlier on the panel after you and, and the uh, now MLA elect, uh, I believe, in that riding uh, we're, we're discussing. And do you think it actually resonated? Like, do you think it was it was something that actually got them votes, or do you think it was just a, a policy that they believed in that they thought was important? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that I was wondering as well. I was actually really surprised to see them announce this policy during the election. New that the government was considering this because the Globe and Mail had actually filed a freedom and access to information request to, to basically learn that this has been something that had been discussed within the addictions office. I suspect that they must have had a source that leaked it to them because that was a pretty specific agent for them to yeah. get that <laughs> revelation. I was like, all right, someone leaked this. So we knew a couple weeks before the campaign dropped that this was something that they discussed, but the UCP government at the time sort of just played it off and said, well, you know, we put forward lots of different policy proposals and the Premier likes to look over these things. We, I had no idea how serious it was being considered at the time. And then, you know, sure enough, midway through the campaign, they dropped this huge policy announcement. And it was one of the better announcements from the UCP. They had lots of people in recovery speak about how their family was able to get treatment for them because they got a court order from a judge that forced them into treatment. And they spoke about how addicts don't really want treatment when it's when you're addicted to something because all you can think about is that drug and when you can have that drug for another time. And so it was a really powerful announcement and I think the fact that they had so many individuals in recovery speak at it made it that much more effective. So of course that announcement drops. It played really well online among my readers, obviously a more conservative base. People seemed pretty excited about it. Of course you had a lot of people that were also concerned and said, okay, well, this could just as easily be abused. So something I've been asking some of our interviews tonight is hopefully the reception to the doors, because that was my question, you know, it's so specific, is this something that the average person is paying attention to? And what I heard was if your life has been touched by addiction you found that the policy resonated with you. So I sense it probably didn't have a 
broader appeal to the General Electric just for maybe families that are touched by addiction. And to be honest, that is a large number of people nowadays. I think most of us even sitting at this table think about someone we know whose life has been touched by addiction or something that they're struggling with. So it's, it's hard to say. I would say probably it didn't resonate too much. I think probably some of the policies that did resonate more are some of the other work the government is doing on the public safety file and some of their other promises like the angle monitor for violent criminals and more sheriffs to really watch those people. I think those are the types of policies when we talk about public safety that resonated with the average Calgarian voter. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit, because I know nationally that's been a huge issue as of late. We've heard of just all of these stories from all over the country of people that are out on bail that commit some horrendous act of violence. Did, did we see that seep into the Alberta campaign, that a justice crime angle? Yeah, I think I think that's fair to say. I think so. I, I think, unfortunately, we've had a number of officers that uh, have lost their lives this year, and I think that that's factored in. I mean, driving around Calgary now, compared to when I was a university student here 20 years ago, dating myself, but uh, it's it's it really is like night and day. We have a massive problem on the streets, and it's and it's it's going to spread outwards, and yeah. it's going to spread into our suburban communities. And oftentimes when people move from the downtown and past the university days and they get families, and they get bigger houses, they live in the suburbs, there's a bit of a nimbyism. Not my backyard, I don't care, it doesn't affect me. I go to work all day, I'm with my kids all night. I'm not seeing this, but you're starting to see it. And, and I think when we're looking at our officers, it's not safe for them to be on the streets. We need more of them. Uh, I, I think that that's starting to resonate with people. I think they're starting to take it more seriously. And I think a month ago, a month and a half ago, crime and public safety, wasn't as much of a part of this campaign and I think it's really become part of this campaign and when they came out with um, you know the beds and the, uh, and the intervention act and all this stuff on the uh, opiate crisis file when you're standing up there and you're united with all the First Nations leaders and they're telling their own personal stories that you know our First Nations communities are dying we are they're being ripped apart by the opiate crisis which is these you know we need to really we need their lived experience combined with the fact that the UCP, uh, you know, that this whole file is being led by Chief of Staff to Premier Smith, by Marshall Smith, who's a lived, who's an, a recovering addict who was on the streets of East Vancouver for four and a half years. What do you say to that? That's yeah. lived experience that's informing this. And to me, that's always the best way to achieve it. These aren't people, just policy makers in the back rooms. These are people who've been through the gamut and they're doing the proper Indigenous consultation on this. I think they've approached it the right way. I, I see some people that you're supposed to be interviewing walking around. One of them is the uh, minister and uh, MLA, well, probably MLA-elect uh, Rebecca Schultz. So we'll we'll let you loose in just a second, but I want to give a, a quick update here on numbers. The most uh, recent figures we have from Elections Alberta are that the UCP are leading with 50 and Alberta NDP with 35. Now we're up to 124,000 votes cast right now, so a pretty significant uh, increase, and they're coming in more quickly now. So I think we'll start to get a little bit more in the way of numbers. And just to some of the key ridings we've been watching, your beloved uh, Banff Kananaskis is leading NDP right now. Uh, Calgary Acadia, which uh, William McBeth has been watching, is currently N uh, NDP leading, but again, that's still only with uh, three polls in. And uh, the one that I was watching, Ed Edmonton Southwest, is uh, not looking good for uh, Katie Maddow. NDP still leading there, but again, pretty small margin, just uh, 79 votes. And uh, that is uh, one that we'll be watching. Still 15 polls left there, so uh, we could still see that go a different direction here. So as we watch this and uh, the night goes on, uh, let me just ask about Steve Outhouse. I, I know we're hoping to grab him later on. He's the, the campaign manager for the UCP. Have you had the chance to, like, have they kind of kept him hidden or have you had the chance to talk to him uh, tonight? I haven't actually seen him anywhere. They, they kept him hidden. He wasn't actually on the media list. So we'll see if he's coming out later and doing some interviews with people. He has been available. The UCP has been doing their nightly broadcasts uh, where they kind of speak to voters directly about what they talked about that day and they have different candidates on showcasing their work and the policy of the day. He has a at times, but he's been behind the scenes a little bit. I think a lot of people were really interested to see that he was chosen as the campaign manager. Yeah. Obviously, he ran Leslie Lewis's federal conservative leadership campaign, the last two of them. She performed very well in her first time as a leadership. I think people had 
less expectations for her because she was so new and she was considered that underdog. And then her fundraising numbers just blew people out of the water. And you know, we saw she didn't perform as well the second time around, but Pierre Polyev did so well that. Yeah, no one blames Steve for that. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, well, we'll let you get uh, back to the floor. We're going to do a, a brief reset here and uh, get back to our regular panel. The night is still young, so if you're tuning in, I thank you for it. Uh, keep tuning in. We're going to have more results for you in just a couple of moments. I'm Andrew Law. This is the True North Election Night Show for Alberta's 2023 election. Stand by. All right, Rachel, this has been completed here. This is what we're stuck with now. That was rude to Rachel. William, good to see you. <laughs> Welcome you. back. William McBeth is here. We have Lindsay Wilson from Alberta Proud and yours truly, Andrew Lawton from True North as we break down the results, which are kind of, it's feast or famine. You'll get a whole bunch in a few minutes and then nothing for quite a while. We just had uh, one update 30 seconds ago from Elections Alberta, uh, currently at 52 for the United Conservative Party and 33 for the Alberta NDP. This is with 155,000 votes cast. Again, 2.9 million registered voters. Uh, so that is something you have to keep in mind. And of the ridings we've been watching, uh, there haven't been any declared flips yet. So we're still pretty early. Uh, so you said the last time this was wrapped up like 15 minutes ago. Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a very different election to 2019. I, I think the scale of the victory in 2019 just meant uh, it was going to be pretty clear that it was a United Conservative Majority government, and they were able to declare it faster. This one is obviously going to be uh, a tire race, and we're seeing that by the fact that you're seeing that seat count bounce up and down a little bit. There's a handful of votes that's changing who's leading. Yeah, and I mean, obviously the mood has changed in the conservative movement, I think, a lot in the last four years. There's a, a very different party, a very different leader, very different uh, just political dynamic with the last few years. But to go back to a discussion we had earlier, you think the unity issue has really been largely dealt with, at least for now? Like, we didn't see a lot of specific disunity in the race. No, I think I think everybody was really professional and above board through, through, through the race. It is be interesting to see what Daniel Smith's journey is if she is successful tonight as premier and what happens. Uh, you know, that is really, who knows, right? We can't predict the future, certainly. But yeah, it's definitely a different tone. And I, I can speak to, you know, I live in what's determined like a UCP safe zone out in Cochrane, right? With uh, Peter Guthrie, who is our, also our energy minister. 
but it's interesting how many orange signs you see out now as opposed to four years ago. You wouldn't have you barely saw an orange sign in, in a town like Cochrane. I mean, far, far less. So it's it's interesting. There's def, It's definitely, it, this isn't 2019. I think that's fair to say. This is not 2019. And uh, there's a lot of people who are pretty loud and in support of, uh, of the NDP. And, you know, we've noticed a lot in the news in the last couple of weeks, we're seeing, you know, um, long-time conservatives flipping and coming out and saying that they're supporting the NDP. And what's that all about? I don't really know how much we can read into that. Or can we say, were those people ever really conservatives yeah. to begin with? I don't know. Right? How, how much... I don't know how unpopular Rachel Notley was personally when she left office. I, I think there were a lot of uh, voters that had a sense of buyer's remorse. But do you think there are people that have kind of forgotten how bad it was now? Or, or people that sort of, because it was so long ago, they don't remember how much they didn't like the NDP? Uh, I mean, I think that's entirely possible. Uh, uh, Rachel Notley won in 2015 against a divided conservative movement. Yeah. There were two conservative parties on the ballot, both taking... Uh, share and you know the new democrats i talked to in 2019 said we knew it was always going to be a really hard fight for us against a united conservative movement without that vote splitting but now we get to hear where we are and i do think because it had been a few years memory of rachel notley maybe had softened a bit where i think it changed back was when she proposed that 38 percent increase to corporate taxes that's the rachel and, we knew <laughs> and i think everybody went oh right they're not good for business in alberta i'd forgotten that and i think that actually was a major turning point for her campaign oh i think also um Buying into uh, the getting to this net zero by 2035, I think people are scared to see what their electricity yeah. bills are going to look like, and I think that is perceived as too much in line with Prime Minister Trudeau. So I think those, I think that works in step with that. Yeah, and I'm just looking at some of the numbers here. By the way, your uh, home riding is doing very well for the UCP right now of, of Cochrane Airdrie. It looks oh, like yes. uh, Peter Guthrie has a fairly unsurprising lead there. Uh, and just looking around the uh, Calgary ridings here, not a huge amount of movement. Uh, NDP still leading in Calgary Acadia with one more poll reporting. Uh, in uh, Calgary Curry, which is the one we are watching, the NDP are leading. Uh, in uh, Calgary Glenmore, the UCP have a, eh, not, I wouldn't say a healthy lead, but they have a, a lead there. So I, I, we're, we're certainly not seeing a blowout in the early numbers of like some NDP surge, like uh, Keto Maggie of Main Street was sort of suggesting, even in spite of what Main Street's own polls and, and models were saying. Uh, how? Let, let's geek out a little bit here. The history of polling in Alberta elections. <laughs> I'll start with you, William. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, look, the, the problem with polling is well known in that we've seen so many examples of where pollsters have confidently declared that an election was going one way or the other and then turned out to be nowhere even remotely close to it. The one I painfully remember, of course, is 2012. The poll said we would be thundering to a Wild Rose victory, and of course, uh, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, so, now you're schlepping it up here with us. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the question is, well, then why is polling becoming less accurate? And I think it's because getting to actual voters is increasingly difficult. Uh, you know, people, a lot of people no longer have home phones. They only have cell phones. If they have cell phones, they don't answer phone calls from numbers they don't recognize. So you're having to phone vast numbers in order to try and get even a tiny sample size. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my other gut feeling is that, uh, this is, by the way, not an Alberta problem. You can look at the United States. Uh, Donald Trump couldn't possibly become president, except he did, uh, based on polling. So uh, I, I think it's the fact that people are now just not telling pollsters. I, don't, I won't say they're lying, but they're either actively not providing information or they're not providing information that is statistically useful enough in order to give an yeah. accurate read. No, I mean, when I ran uh, in, in Ontario many years ago and I was going door knocking, I was finding, you know, one third said they were voting for me, one third said they were voting for the NDP, and one third said they were undecided. And I thought, oh, great, I didn't realize the undecideds were just lying to me uh, because they didn't <laughs> want to tell me they weren't voting for me. So there is a little bit of that in, in polling. It, and It is true. So it is sadly something we have to tell candidates <laughs> that uh, if a voter tells the candidate yes, it's a maybe. But yeah. if, the, if a voter does tell a candidate no, you could take that to the yeah. bank. So. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that is good advice. But but even that clip that we played earlier, the montage of Rachel Emanuel doing her own sort of impromptu exit polling, 
out there. A, a lot of people are very cagey at first, and, and I think some people, there, there's still a little bit of vote stigma, and I, I think that's probably more a thing with conservative votes, that people are very nervous to admit in some context, even in Alberta, that they're conservative. Well, I think that there's just been a lot, uh, there's been voter exhaustion has been a big part of the problem, and then there's, and which ties in with voter apathy, unfortunately, yeah. and I think we're seeing that in Griffiths. Definitely the last Calgary mayoral race, we definitely saw that. There was, I mean, there was also COVID, of course, but there was a snap uh, federal election that was just three weeks before, so it was kind of a perfect st storm for a uh, low turnout, certainly. I just want to, by the way, interrupt our uh, programming here, more than that was interrupting our programming here. To uh, just let you know, uh, we're here because we believe that it's important to have an independent media counterbalance to the legacy media's coverage on this. And, and if you look at this uh, row that we have down here, Global has this giant uh, studio, and CBC has a giant studio, and then we've got this little section on the end here, but we're here. We have uh, members of our team from all over Canada, and certainly our, all our Alberta crew here. Uh, th this is not cheap, so if you can support the work that uh, True North is doing, and uh, take a stand in general for independent media, please Please do head on to donate.tnc.news, donate.tnc.news. And also, if you are watching on YouTube, you can leave a super chat in the comments. And if you have any questions uh, that you want us to answer live on air, uh, do super chat us and ask your question in there, and we'll certainly read those out. They have to actually be a question. Sometimes people will super chat something that is not a question, and sometimes we're less inclined to read those out. But we may as the night goes on. But truly, I, I just want to say thank you to all the uh, donors out there who do support uh, True North on the regular, and this is a particularly special occasion, uh, so I'll, I'll ask you again, that website is donate.tnc.news. And since we are talking with independent media, I think that was a bit of a theme of this campaign that was one that we have to actually talk about, because Rachel Notley had a very definitive position on, I am only going to talk to the Alberta Legislative press gallery reporters, so much so of having security remove Key and Bexty, who we saw earlier, and, and Rebel News. Uh, Rachel Emanuel got questions into Rachel Notley because she's very loud, uh, and at that point she didn't need the microphone for Rachel to have heard her question. Um, I, I don't think it cost them votes, but I do think it is a very telling example of, of what a Rachel Notley government would look like. Well, I think it's terrifying, actually, because uh, uh, when you have um, somebody who's vying to be the next Premier of Alberta, not answering, you know, Western Standard, right? The Western Standard uh, the press conference and their um, one of their editors, Nigel Hannaford, and she was just directly saying, oh, we're not going to answer any of your questions. Well, Western Standard is an accredited news media outlet. They're alternative media, certainly, but they're accredited and they're in these press galleries and they're, uh, they have, you know, people in the parliament building as well. So this isn't just some fly-by-night blogger. And so it was quite, I think that, that didn't resonate well with people at all and i think when you combine that with uh you know bill c11 and c18 coming down the pipeline people are afraid that we're going to start losing access to the truth to information and i can't i mean at alberta proud i advocate all the time for all our partners in independent media i think it's so critical and i think that was a really good glimpse that press conference was a really good glimpse at what a rachel notley government would look like and you know in talking to alternative media i know that a lot of reporters are completely cut off from uh, ndp uh, email lists and press releases and we're going to look at that so I, I would definitely say one of the weird things about uh the, the ndp's decision is one of their big end of campaign messages was uh lend us your vote conservatives Maybe you've never voted NDP in your life, but lend me a vote conservative. Well, then wouldn't you think talking to media outlets whose primary audience were conservatives uh, or, or people who are at least on the more conservative side of the spectrum, you would think you would want to preference those media outlets to try and get your message yeah. of lend us through. Whereas, you know, you go on CBC to try and talk to conservatives. Okay, you could talk to the four conservatives still watching CBC. Or you can talk to True North and talk to a huge chunk of the conservatives in this problem. To me, that told me I really, really couldn't trust Rachel Motley on that, you can lend me your vote, I won't let you down. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, okay. 
Yeah, the, and, and I think there is actually an interesting angle there, and I, I think Rachel was talking about it a little bit earlier too, and, and we'll discuss it later. This idea that the NDP thinks it's entirely natural uh, for them to be the new home for conservative voters. And it was odd to see that pitch with a straight face. I'm just still trying to figure out what's conservative about them. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, you got to do more than put on a blue blazer in a debate to convince yeah. me that you're conservative. I'm sorry. No, I agree. And I, but I think it, it goes to the, there's, I mean, there's some hubris there, certainly. But it's the NDP's position was that Danielle Smith is so outside the mainstream of acceptable political discourse. And it was actually among the most cynical approaches to politics that this woman is like, how can even a conservative vote for this woman was basically their approach. Uh, absolutely. And I, I really think that made it hard for conservatives, even ones who maybe weren't thrilled with uh, a Danielle Smith like UCP, it, 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 they didn't like seeing uh, the anger that's welled up from the NDP campaign. I, I mean, I think Rachel Notley, one of her biggest assets when she won the first time was the fact that she was seen as sunny and optimistic, positive, uh, and a change between the bickering between the Wild Rose and the PC parties. She she was uh, uh, offered some more hopeful uh, uh, policy. And I think she really did herself in by, by going so negative, so relentlessly against conservative party. But I think she even galvanized wavering conservatives back behind the United Conservative Party. Yeah, I, I think you may be right about that. Just to give you the latest updates here, we have 52 ridings leaning UCP and 35 ridings leading NDP. Now, uh, 50, what was your prediction earlier? I was 50-37. Okay, and you were 51, right? I was 51. Okay, and I was and right now I'm the loser if the current numbers <laughs> hold, but again, I have to be the, the damp blanket and say, you know, early days, early days, but, but every time I say that, it's less so, uh, because right now 244,851 votes are in, uh, and as we see this, uh, we're also actually seeing 25% uh, polling stations have reported right now. So uh, overall, we actually have a, a bit more clarity, certainly in, in some ridings here. Uh, to go back into the ones we're watching in Calgary, no change yet in Calgary, Acadia. That is still the NDP leading. Uh, Calgary, Glenmore, a uh, little bit of a lead increase for the UCP. Uh, we have uh, going around, what was the other one in Calgary we uh, Well, wanted? actually this one here. I think. Calgary yeah, Bow, was... yeah, Calgary Bow is uh, UCP leading. Uh, and to pop up to Edmonton, I, I'm not too, too optimistic yet. Yeah, that Edmonton, is a big orange box there, Yeah, and it? Edmonton is right now looking like a, an NDP sweep, if current trends hold. Um, and if you look at Strathcona, Sherwood Park, that is uh, very decisively uh, UCP right now. Sherwood Park, though, leaning NDP. So that's that suburban, exurban cutoff you were talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I uh, The fact is, is that Edmonton has always felt kind of left out from most conservative governments. It's a fact that most conservative leaders tend to come from the south half yeah. of the province. They tend to come from Calgary or are better connected to Calgary. The one exception I could think of, of course, was when Ed Selmak won, but then he immediately adopted some very controversial policies on the energy sector and a few other things. Most then, though, uh, it's hard for Edmonton, Edmontonians to look and see themselves fully embodied by a party that is so kind of based in Calgary. Uh, we got a super chat here from Retired Rigger 38, perhaps not his legal name, uh, who says, keep up the great work. I said I wouldn't read the non-questions, but it was so nice, Retired Rigger, I had to read it. Uh, Joe Uber uh, says, down with the NDP and the Liberal Coalition, uh, which is uh, a very generous contribution. Thank you for that, uh, Joe Uber. Uh, obviously, I mean, the Liberals are not a political force here, but, but Danielle Smith did make as a pretty early uh, commitment, this idea that a vote for the NDP was a vote for Justin Trudeau, which I thought was was interesting and not altogether uncompelling because the argument is who's going to stand up against federal intrusion, not the NDP, right? Absolutely. I think that Rachel Notley just continues to show that time and again. And, and I go back to this at Alberta Proud. We've really focused on a lot of that messaging around you know, putting Notley in charge is like taking your goalie out of the net because we do have left-leaning mayors running Calgary and Edmonton. We do have a left-leaning federal government. So in order to get those checks and balances, to get that balance of representation, can we afford to do this also at the provincial level? It truly is the NDP Liberal Coalition. And you look at a lot of, I mean, you look at something like Just Transition, right? Yeah. Getting rid of our uh, good paying oil and gas jobs in favor for quote, green energy jobs, whatever that means. I think that means installing solar panels or something like that. But that was a page right out of the Alberta NDP playbook circa 2015. 
they actually use the term just transition. So it's not a coincidence when you start kind of peeling back the layers and looking that how much that Rachel Nelson really, really is in step with um, with yeah. the federal liberals, unfortunately. Yeah, we have a, a question from David here. He says, if the UCP wins, is this indicative of a message for Canadians across the country to not give in to bad policies of left-leaning government? Can Alberta politics be extrapolated here, I guess is the question. Thank you, David, by the way. No, I think that's actually really interesting. You you have different schools of thought on how a federal conservative party could win an election. I think we saw one of them put into action last election, the Aaron O'Toole School, which was to go to the center, hug the center, be slightly center more... Center is a little generous there, but... <laughs> <laughs> to be slightly, ever so slightly more conservative on some yeah. issues, but otherwise become nearly indistinguishable in many ways. And I think that failed overwhelmingly, because my view has always been, why would people vote for liberal light when they could vote for real liberal and get, you know, it's like, new coke was never as good as classic coke. <laughs> Uh, now, you, you know, uh, I, I think one interesting thing that happened in this campaign that I think reflects the fact that the tide has turned somewhat against the woke, progressive nature of the activist politics of Justin Trudeau was when Calgary bureaucrats tried to cancel Canada Day fireworks. They, one afternoon, said fireworks are culturally insensitive to the Chinese somehow, because they invented them. I'm still not 100% clear how that is culturally And to First Nations people. It is insulting to First Nations people who don't feel they're part of Canada, uh, and, and therefore they were just going to get rid of them. Well, I, I you know, the outcry from that was tremendous. You know, uh, uh, even though uh, a handful of lefty city councillors tried to justify it, a vote was coming of 10 city councillors yeah. out of 15 to get rid of it. Eventually the administration said, we go, we back down. And, and I think um, that to me is reflective of the fact that uh, you have to be, some people have really taken this vote this thing way too far. Absolutely. And, and they're trying to say things like, you can't enjoy Canada Day and have fireworks yeah. because that makes you racist and bigoted. <laughs> and typical people, average people said, no, it doesn't. We just like fireworks and we aren't ashamed of a great country like Canada, which even with its problems is still a remarkable place. For and when you even have indigenous leaders, community leaders, and people like Melissa Mbarki coming out and saying, uh, uh, First Nations people don't want to cancel Canada Day. What are you talking about? So that that uh, that didn't really do bode well for Calgary City Hall. That yeah. they're making a lot of kind of silly decisions right now. So um, and I, I gotta throw my hats off to my friends at Common Sense <laughs> Calgary. They put out a petition immediately. They were all over that, saying, "Help us talk sense, common sense into Calgary Council to reverse this crazy rope woke decision to cancel Canada Day fireworks and call it a." visually spectacular display of lights <laughs> and sounds. Visually stunning display. <laughs> the, stunning, yeah, the euphemism stunning. Yeah. Uh, you could never think of a better government term for something. There you go. Exactly. U Yukon Strong, who I've had on the Andrew Lawton Show, is a great advocate for firearms owners and for the North, uh, has uh, given a super chat. He said, if we chase the woke out of Alberta, we'll chase them out of Ottawa too. Cheers from the North. Aww, and uh, Jen nice. uh, sent a super chat and said nothing at all with it. So a woman, a few words, <laughs> but we thank you for your uh, generosity, Jen. Uh, let me just say, on that question earlier from David that you were discussing about, you know, is this something we can export if, if the UCP wins? I, I think the inverse is a very important question here, which is if conservatism can't take hold and win in Alberta, where can it? And I mean, yes, we've got Saskatchewan and we've got, you know, nominally Ontario. <laughs> that's another uh, uh, discussion here. So I, I think that's hugely important is that if conservatives cannot hold the line in Alberta, it becomes very difficult to make the case anywhere else. And I think it would make it very difficult for this when I call it the Pierre Pauly of revolution that's kind of taking over the yeah. nation and he's filling. I mean, we've all been there. We've seen the rallies, we've seen the response. I don't know the last time we've ever seen a federal Canadian conservative politician resonate with people well, that his way. His rallies in, Cal in Edmonton were like something like 5,000, 6,000 people. His rallies and his rallies in the East, he's yeah. filling rooms. That's well, the London, big no, thing. City, London, Ontario, he, I, I was chatting with Bert, his campaign manager who used to work with, with Stephen Harper and uh, she was looking around and saying even when Stephen Harper was here we weren't getting these numbers at the same venue uh, you know Stephen Harper they were like you know put the wall across you know so everyone thought the room was uh, more full whereas with Pierre they're like people in the hallway because there's no room like this is a level of energy uh, that isn't quite comparable to what Danielle Smith commands but uh, Danielle Smith is very much tapping into I think some of that momentum certainly and I think having Pierre uh, pitch in well I, I don't think it was all that surprising I, I do think it was very important to see. 
Oh, well, yeah, his endorsement, you know, com coming that into that with the last week of the campaign, was it surprising? No, of course not. But it was really important because if there's a lot, if there are those people out there who maybe are still on the fence about Daniel Smith because of all the MSM blow up about things, things that she said, some missteps earlier in the campaign, all the everything that's happened, the infighting with the UCP over the last two years, all the COVID stuff. But there's a lot of that. Pe those people, they are all Polyev all the time. And to see that endorsement, maybe that's what she said. You know what? I'm going to mark that ballot. I, I mean, I think it was tremendously important as a counter narrative to the oh, conservatives for the first time are lending their vote to the Democrats. Uh, what a way to put a put a bullet in that concept by saying totally. actually the man who routinely gets thousands of people out <laughs> is firmly in the Daniel Smith camp and urging his supporters yeah. to vote conservative in this election. Well, and, and I think it's also important to note as well. Like you may look at this map and see, oh wow, you know the NDP are doing really well in, in key pockets. The riding boundaries are very different provincially from federally. You know, provincially 87 ridings in Alberta. Uh, the federal Alberta ridings are are what like 50 in the 50s. Early. No, I, I think it's in the 30s. The 30s is that low. So yeah, there we go. Um, and Ontario took all of our seats. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Even and more maddening. <laughs> A uh, uh, question from Andrew R. Not me. Uh, I'm Andrew L. But uh, he has a super chat. Thanks for the great work. Very much needed perspective. It's not a question, but thank you nonetheless. And uh, Herbert Hildebrandt has a question. Andrew, do you think that a Smith win could embolden conservatives across Canada to be more DeSantis uh, slash Trumpian for the long term and shift the map? It's not often you get Trumpian as a compliment uh, from uh, internet commenters. So uh, thank you for that, Herbert. I, I will say Danielle did very good at not quite the Polyev level of aggression, but flipping the script on the journalists. And even that one event she had a couple of weeks ago where uh, NDP protesters came, uh, she didn't apologize for anything. She came and said, see, this is what we're dealing with here. So I, I do think she has done that, kind of that had that little bite that conservatives need. Well, I think conservatives, they need that bite for sure, but conservatives have to get off the defense. We have to stop apologizing for having conservative values. And we have to bite back when when the, the woke left and want to say terrible things that were, you know, racist or homophobic or all these things. Well, I certainly know you guys would feel the same way as I do that I know tons of people who identify as, you know, uh, gay or uh, part of the LGBTQ community uh, and who are, you know, of all creed and ethnicities and everything that are on the conservative spectrum, especially you see that a lot at the federal level and, you know, when you go out to Ottawa and places like that. And, yeah. and um, it's just such a, so ludicrous. And we've, we've got to actually take, we've got to be more aggressive and say, no, you're not going to ever call me those things. I'm none of those things. I mean, this stops now. And I think Danielle has, has taken the reins with that. And I have appreciate that she's doing that. I think it's smart. Yeah, and we're uh, we're going to cut away in just a moment to uh, head back over to the floor with Rachel Emanuel. But just to give a, a little uh, results update here, if you're just tuning in, True North Live, you're just as excited as the audience is. You're like I leaning am. over to the computer every time. <laughs> uh, we have uh, 380,000 votes in, uh, quite a, a significant uh, increase over last update. Uh, and of those, 49 UCP leading and 38 NDP leading. Now, these are just leading. Uh, these are, are not necessarily elected. So uh, when we get further in the night where we have more, more polls reporting, we're going to be able to call races more definitively. Um, and that's when the cheering behind us will get really, really loud, which will prompt us to uh, report what it is that exactly was causing all the cheering. Uh, but 49 right now uh, for the UCP to 39 NDP. So we're still in that territory that a lot of people thought. So uh, we're going to head back to the floor now. Rachel Emanuel is there with... Uh, Rebecca Schultz, a UCP cabinet minister who it looks like has won or is on the track to win a re-election in Calgary Shaw. But take it away, Rachel and Rebecca. I am here with UCP candidate Rebecca Schultz. She is the candidate for Calgary Shaw. Rebecca, I just dare to check Twitter and I'm seeing a lot of complaints from people about how long it is taking for Elections Alberta to tally the results. What do you make of this? Do you think that it's taking longer than usual or you think people just need to be patient and they'll get here soon enough? Yeah, it's tough to say. I've been hearing that from a lot of people here tonight and some of our volunteers and supporters checking in to see um, when they're going to get the results. I don't know when that's going to be, but I think everybody's uh, very excited to see what's happening tonight. Certainly very excited, and I think everyone's also hoping they're not going to be here till 2, 3 a.m., but sometimes uh, we'll see. So Calgary Shaw, we know, is a conservative safe seat. Everyone's expecting you to win your seat again tonight. Some of your colleagues in Calgary, I think, are feeling a little bit more nervous. What are some ridings that you have your eye on tonight that you're saying, if we lose these, you know, it could be bad for the party? 
You know, that's a tough one for me to answer. I don't trust the polls. And certainly, I mean, we were out there door knocking until after 7 o'clock tonight, so we're not taking anything for granted. We're just working hard to the very end. And I know my colleagues right across Calgary and across the province have been doing the same. So when you talk about not trusting the polls, we know that they've had a couple pretty big misses in recent elections. 2019, they way underestimated the Conservative vote. 2012, you know, they completely got it wrong on what was expected for government. So I think a lot of Conservatives are saying, you know, I've seen a lot of elections, I've seen a lot of provincial elections, and the polls don't really go the way that they say they're going to go. And so here again, they're showing a very close race between the NDP and the UCP. With the polls that have been reported so far, are you you agreeing with that are you saying yes it is going to be a very close race tonight or do you think the polls potentially got it wrong again you know again it's tough to say and the polls obviously in the last couple of weeks have kind of been all over the place uh, and so all I all I can say is you know we know what we were seeing in Calgary Shaw I know what I was hearing on the doorsteps it was people saying look we cannot afford to go back to the NDP we want to continue to see jobs and opportunity and economic growth and a government that can balance a budget and wants to get tough on crime and so you you know that's what we were hearing um, and I sure hope that we see that in the results tonight. Sure when we talk about what you were hearing at the doors one of the things that I heard from UCP insiders is they were saying we're really hoping that jobs and the economy is going to be the ballot box question. Do you think that it wasn't fact box question or that voters were looking towards something else maybe looking towards which leader they trusted more? Mm. You know I heard a lot about jobs economy and affordability and so whether that was cost of living or we can't afford to go back to the NDP those were things that I often heard I mean you know some also say that this was a divisive campaign I definitely heard that on the doors I heard people say look I heard the NDP ads I heard them over and over and over but I don't know what they're gonna offer Albertans we tried to run a campaign where we not only highlighted our record what we've done over the last four years what we rolled out in this spring's budget and that we had a plan to continue to move Alberta forward whether it was Um, and affordability and lowering taxes. These are things that resonated with everyday Albertans um, who these issues were top of mind for. So you represent a Calgary riding. When we talk about top of mind issues, something that I have been covering a lot is the public safety crisis that we are seeing certainly all across of Canada right now. And Calgary is absolutely no exception to that. Would you say that you have noticed a difference with people saying, I used to take public transit into work. I, I don't feel safe doing that anymore. Is that something that actually came up frequently in your conversations at the door. It is, and especially my riding of Calgary Shaw, my riding is, it straddles McLeod Trail. So we do have a number of C train stations, especially at the end of the line down in South Calgary. And so this is something that did come up, especially in communities like Shaughnessy and Somerset, where people said, look, I do take the train. Um, I'm afraid for my kids to take the train to school. I take it every day to work. Here's what I'm seeing. And so very much uh, people cared that we had made those additional investments, the pilot with the sheriff, helping out to make sure that the LRT is safe, um, the additional police officers uh, that we invested in as well just a couple of months ago, um, but then also saying, look, we're going to make sure that people feel safe in their communities, but we're also going to make sure that we're investing in treatment for those who are really struggling with addictions. And so people saw that that was reasonable versus a party whose candidates wanted to defund the police. At a time when this is a top of mind issue, I think that the NDP spent more time negative actually part of the issues that matter for people. Yeah, and just because Rebecca mentioned that, I'm going to let my viewers who aren't aware just give them a little bit of information. There was a lot of Alberta NDP candidates who had a, a history of defund the police rhetoric, and Rachel Notley, of course, did not want to talk about that in the election campaign. She actually said that her government would hire more police officers, similar to what the UCP have already done and what they're promising to do. Now, when we talk about that two part of focusing on public safety, but also focusing on addictions and mental health, one of the interesting policies that you guys put forward was the Compassionate Intervention Act. I've asked a lot of guests about it tonight, but something that we're wondering over at True North, our readers are really interested in this, is is this something that average voters are asking about at the doors, or is this a type of policy that really only resonates with people who have been touched by addiction? You know, I think generally speaking, what people care about is that they feel safe in their communities, they feel like they can walk around their communities, that their kids can walk around the communities, they can take the train downtown to work, um, go see a concert or a show, uh, and feel safe. 
right? And and so what that means is tackling um, the crime piece. They, they want to see an additional police presence, and that does help with community safety. Um, but they also do see people struggling with mental health and addictions, and they want to know that the government cares and has a plan to address that. And I think um, in a compassionate way, that really is at the heart of it about getting people the help that they need. So I have to ask you again a little bit about the Alberta NDP's plan. Rachel Notley was asked about safe injection sites and she said, no, no, that's not really something that our party is interested in doing. We're taking more of a hardcore public safety approach similar to the UCP. What do you make of that? Do you believe her? I mean, here's the thing, they have a record. And so in this election, we do have two parties running that each have a record. Our record is those investments in crime and policing, uh, keeping communities all and detox spaces and mental health supports. Um, what we saw under the NDP was kind of a, a, a sole focus on injection sites. And that was their record. That's what they focused on for four years. And so I don't think Albertans believe them. We're just going to wrap up here shortly, but I have at least one or two other things I want to ask you super quickly. So for those of you who don't remember, Rebecca Schultz actually ran in the UCP leadership race. And I've gotten a couple compliments on your ability to handle the media in the time since then. People said, you know, she's really worked her way up in her public speaking and made a lot of gains in her abilities to talk to media and talk to your crowd since the UCP leadership race. And I'm wondering if you felt that that has given you more confidence as a campaigner and if you felt that has been, you know, an advantage at the doors having that experience as running for the leader of the party. Well, thank you. I, I've never really thought about it that way. When I'm out there on the doors, and, and this was when I first ran in 2018, and you're running in a nomination against other Conservative supporters. So you have to think about what makes you different. And my approach is just to be genuine, to, I, I don't have the answers all the time, and to be able to say that and to make people know uh, and feel that I am really there to serve them, that I want to hear their frustrations or their aspirations and their hopes for what Alberta is to be, and then take that and try to do something about it. It. and just to remember who I'm there to serve and to work for and I think that makes a difference as well yeah absolutely and I think you know the party has recognized that because you have been front and center in many of the announcements that have been made over the last few weeks just the last thing that I want to ask you here is we have a couple polls reporting now you know it is taking a little bit of time but are you feeling confident in what we're seeing so far tonight are the numbers trending in the direction that you want to see I haven't seen any of the results because largely I've been uh, sitting here chatting uh, with you and some of the other folks in the media. Um, but I think, you know, it's a little longer than people would like, but I'm still optimistic and I think people here are feeling the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate that. Again, that was Rebecca Schultz, the UCP candidate for Calgary Shaw. She is expected to hold her seat tonight. And we're, of course, really looking forward to getting some of those solid results and sharing with them, them with you a little bit later. And we're going to head back to Andrew now. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Momentarily, if you are just tuning in, this is uh, shaping up to be a bit of a nail biter as a lot of ridings, uh, despite being relatively small or very slow to report their numbers. I'm here with William McBeth from True North, Lindsay Wilson from Alberta Proud. And let's just uh, talk about some of the latest numbers here. We are currently at 51 UCP leading, 36 NDP leading. Uh, this is with 514,000 votes cast. Uh, we zoom in on the numbers here. We haven't been given a lot of love to Lethbridge. Uh, both of the Lethbridge seats are leading NDP. I think one of them, there was some thinking that maybe uh, the UCP might be able to pull it off. They still could, uh, but right now that's not where things are headed. In Calgary, uh, the NDP have uh, kept the lead in Acadia, which is uh, Tyler Shandro's riding. Uh, narrow lead, 93 votes with only uh, 7 of 18 polls reporting. Uh, so just under halfway through there. Uh, in uh, Calgary, Glenmore, UCP are holding. And uh, Bambiscus, your girl Miranda Rosen, has extended her lead to 978 votes. That is huge, With uh, 8 of 26 polls reporting. So again, if the Banff and Canmore ones are the ones they haven't put in yet, that could uh, change yet. Uh, we look in the uh, other ridings here. We've got uh, Calgary Elbow, uh, which is an NDP lead. Uh, Calgary Curry, a pretty decisive NDP lead. Uh, we have, uh, what were the other good ones in Calgary you were watching, uh, William? I'm interested in uh, Calgary Edgemont. That's another riding that the UCP are hoping to hold on to. 
All right, in Calgary, Edgemont, uh, right now, uh, the NDP leading uh, with 12 of 18 polls reporting by about 300 votes. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, some of these ridings, I think, are just tough. They were always going to be a little bit closer this election than they that were. That was pegged to be a difficult one from the one. go. That was going to be, and, uh, but, uh, you know, overall, I think that number sitting around 50, 51 seats for the United Conservative Party is where I think most of us were expecting it to land. So, uh, I mean, it's not over till it's over. We, we, we don't have to count every single vote to know the outcome, but you do have to count a, a decent chunk. Well, uh, Calgary Klein was one you mentioned earlier that was looking like an NDP gain. Uh, right now, that is actually not looking to be the case in the numbers. Uh, we have uh, seven of 18 polls reporting, so again, still a bit of room, but right now, Jeremy uh, Nixon holding a uh, 130 or so vote lead. So uh, at what point is a lead too big to really escape with polls coming in? That's such an interesting question because my candidates always ask me, when do I know if I've <laughs> won or lost? Yeah. One of the challenges is um, writing you know, groups of people, different communities. One part of your writing might be very, very pro United Conservative Party, and another part of it might be more NDP. Unless you know where the polls are in that riding, it's hard to be able to say, "Oh, we, you know, we're safe in this one, or, or we're not." And you know, uh, I'll give you a, a personal and sad example. When we were doing Joan Crockett's campaign back in the 2015 federal election, we were still waiting on something like 10 polls. Joan was leading by a small amount, but when I plotted on a map where all the outstanding polls were and realized it was all from downtown and from the Beltline for the East Village, I say, Joan, even though it shows us we're ahead, I don't think we're going to hold on to it. And sadly, of course, we didn't. Yeah, and I, I think that's the, the tough chance. I mean, there's a whole bunch of political wisdom uh, that is circulated that is very difficult when you're the candidate on the ground and you would just want to make sure you can clinch a victory here. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the, the old line is, you know, you need how many votes to win, one more than the other candidate. Uh, when you're in a functionally a two-party uh, race, it's a little bit more uh, direct than that to see it. But even then, a lot of these Calgary ridings are very, very close. We're seeing, you know, back and forth when one poll goes in by, you know, 50 vote, 100 vote margin. So, uh, again, this idea of some NDP uh, insurgency is not happening, at least it's safe to say. I don't think so. It, it, you know, going back to what you're saying, it really depends where these polls are located. And and my horse there, Miss Miranda Rosen out in uh, Banff, Kananaskis, that might be indicative of that. She's got a very strong lead right now. An hour ago, we were we were seeing a much more smaller lead, a little bit playing around in there. Well, or but, the NDP, but, but or the, up, exactly. Yeah. But then again, if those polls are coming in from Pritis and they're coming in from Elbow and they're coming in from Bragg Creek versus then we might see a complete swing. But, I mean, there's really no shockers here. Certainly, uh, you know, we were talking before, uh, well, what does the new UCP need to lose, right? And they need to lose 14 out of 15 of their swing ridings. I don't see that happening at this point. I think we're going to land at the very minimum on uh, 47, at the minimum. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add another one of the Calgary ridings that uh, Rachel Emanuel was talking about earlier, Calgary Cross. This is uh, Mickey Amory's riding. Uh, he is leading right now, uh, but only by 62 votes and only three polls in. Uh, so that one, I think, is still a, a bit of a toss-up and, and could yes. go um, in a different direction there. Uh, so one thing I'll, I'll point up here is that we are going to go back to the floor. Rachel Emanuel is talking to a guy who's a very fascinating figure in Alberta politics. I've had him on my show, and I was even riding his horse which in retrospect is very cruel to the horse, but the horse seemed to do all right with it. Uh, and that is uh, Tarek El Nega. Uh, and uh, Tarek El Nega formerly ran for leader of the Maverick Party. That's right. Uh, but now he's been uh, pretty enthusiastic with uh, Danielle Smith. Uh, so in uh, just a moment, actually right now, we will uh, go to Rachel Emanuel with Tarek El Nega. I'm here with Tariq Angala. He is a conservative commentator. So first thing I want to ask you about is results are taking a really long time tonight. People are getting frustrated. Twitter is going crazy. What's your take? Why do you think it's taking so long tonight? 
Uh, I think the usual technical delays or, you know, additional scrutineering or so on. I'm not going to say that anything bad is happening. So it's just, you know what, I say the longer it takes, the, the more fun the after party will be. So Yeah, that's fair enough. I think that's a good perspective. So we do have some polls reporting. Are you happy with what you're seeing so far? Do you think that things are trending, you know, in the direction of the conservatives? Or do you think it could go either way at this point? No, I think it's bang on. My personal prediction, Rachel, is it's going to be in the early 50s uh, in terms of seats, 51, 52, 53, in that range for the UCP. That's my guess, and I think that's where it's going to go. So pretty much on trend there. Yeah. And when we talk about, you know, seat projection, what are ridings that you're keeping a close eye on tonight? So the closer you get to downtown Calgary, the cl physically, the closer you're going to have to look at riding. So whether that's Acadia, Varsity, um, I look at, for example, Elbow and Bow, um, those are all ridings that are really close. Now, what's dangerous about those is even if the UCP win, the NDP candidates running on those ridings are relatively activist candidates. They're anti-oil. They're very pro-big government, pro-big AHS. Um, it would be disappointing to see them in the legislature. So those are the ones to watch because, again, even if the NDP lose in those candidates are in the ledge, um, they're going to have a voice that I, I think goes against Alberta's values. And when we talk about some of those candidates having more, you know, radical views, anti-oil views, something that we observed during the election was that the NDP actually ran as a fairly moderate, I mean, they ran a fairly moderate campaign. Is that something that you noticed as well? And do you think that voters sort of fell for it? Or do you think that they remembered what it was like under an NDP government? Uh, I think the thing is, within the urban ridings, you're seeing a very different demographic to 2019. So there's a lot of folks that moved either out of country or out of province into Alberta over the last four years. And there's also a new generation of voters in the urban area. The thing is, in terms of whether memories are long or short, I think if you go to rural Alberta, they know very, very firsthand what, what the disaster the NDP was from 2015 to 2019. Within the urban area, I think a lot more of a mixed vote, and that's why, you know, up until last night, it's close, and that's why I think it's it's going to be tight. That being said, those candidates haven't been called out. They've been kind of doing it on their on their own, but if you look into their backgrounds, and this is no conspiracy, they didn't hide this, a lot of them are anti-oil uh, or pro-big government. Okay, great. And, Tarek, just my last question for you here. What do you think really was the ballot box question of the 2023 Alberta provincial election campaign? I think it's always common sense policy, economics, jobs, affordability, um, and a prosperous Alberta. If, if there's really one ballot box question, it's definitely do we have a prosperous Alberta or not? Great. Thank you so much. Once again, that was Tarek Ngala. We're going to head back over to you now, Andrew. Um, what are you looking for? Uh all right, we are back. Sorry, I got very excited looking up uh, Robbie Picard's magazine, Oil and Gas World uh, magazine. We uh, swapped in uh, a good friend of independent media who does independent media himself uh, promoting the oil and gas sector. You've come down from Fort McMurray yeah. to uh, be with us here. And just while we're talking about results, uh, you got to explain to me what's going on in Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo where there's this giant orange splotch on the map right now. What's happening, Robbie? What did you do? So this, this is a very interesting situation. So what happened was is you've got uh, Tani Yao, and I'm, it's really hard for me because I'm literally friends with all of them. I know all of them. Okay. So this is a very unique situation. I know them all personally. But here's basically what happened is that uh, Zol Keefe beat Tani in the nomination. Then he was disqualified, which put, which put uh, Tani back in. Because Tani wasn't running, Funky Benjoko decided she was going to run our city councillor. And then you got the, um, the Alberta party. So he's, for the first time, you have a little bit of vote splitting happening in our riding. So I'll be interesting to see. I'm not, I'm, I have to admit that I was a little surprised the NDP are doing considering how easy they were. <laughs> they didn't even show up to the debates. There's barely any signs. But it also goes to show you that even if you're an incumbent, you can't be cocky or arrogant or assume that your seat is yeah. safe. So I think, if anything, this is an eye-opener that uh, all the UCP members need to do some humanization and not just assume that it's yeah. in the bag. Yeah, and I, I mean, let me talk about, let's talk about the Fort McMurray voter here, because I, I know oftentimes we see in the U.S., you have all these Democrats that move to red states and they bring all of their uh, Democrat voting habits with them. Fort McMurray draws people from all around the country, notably Atlantic Canada. Do they bring their political persuasions with them or are the ones that go to Fort Mac 
uh, to work in the oil patch? Are they pretty reliable conservative voters? I would say at the end of the day, as a rule, yeah, for McMurray, very rarely. If it goes conservative, it goes like Wild Rose conservative, yeah. or it doesn't. So all the Newfoundlanders in Fort Mac, when they start voting in Alberta, they're voting UCP. They want jobs. Yeah. They want their jobs to be protected. And the union doesn't necessarily, I think that even though the union supports NDP, there's some uncertainty of what can happen. But we are probably the most multicultural city in Canada. I would even argue that we're more multicultural than even Montreal. But when they're there and they understand the importance of the oil sands, they understand the importance of what Fort McMurray brings the rest of this country, um, I, I think they kind of, they, they will go with the party that will protect that the most. But, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the NDP beat the PCs when Brian Jean was the Wall Rose. So, I mean, it, it, I, it doesn't surprise me that there is a little bit of... Uh, push back against yeah. the UCP a little bit. Well, let, let's talk about Brian Jean. We haven't really spoken about him tonight. He's a guy that vied for the UCP leadership himself, formerly was the, the UCP leader. I know uh, there has been some hostility between uh, him and Danielle Smith, but they've been very good teammates since uh, Danielle Smith won by all accounts. Do you think that's been... Oh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Brian's had such a complex history with one or more of our conservative parties at the provincial level. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a federal MP, too, though. He was so. a federal MP. He, uh, he was uh, representing a very important riding uh, in, the, in the parliament. But, of course, uh, he was the one running against Jason Kenney, ostensibly to lead the new United Conservative Party. Uh, when that didn't go his way, he decided to move on and do something else with his time. But then he, I think he never really left. I think he decided he was still the right choice to lead the party, and you saw him come back in yeah. that leadership race. Where I think his plan kind of went a little off the rails was when Danielle Smith campaigned on essentially the same policy platform, but took it one step further than he did. <laughs> and I, you know, we had a conversation with his a longtime political associate, Vitor Marciano, earlier. Yeah. And Vitor once did say, you know, we wouldn't have expected that that was her strategy, and it really did kind of leave us in the lurch. <laughs> yeah, that was the, the leadership in which there was this, like, weird semantical haggling over sovereignty versus autonomy. Uh, no, I didn't want sovereignty, I wanted autonomy. It's like, well, to, you know, to the average voter, that was a very uh, difficult thing to, to distinguish here. Uh, we were talking earlier on, on the panel, before you joined Robbie, about uh, the NDP's relationship with the oil and gas sector. Now, you actually, uh, to your credit, have tried a very hard to make inroads with the NDP, and I think in some cases you've succeeded. Where do you rank that party generally on, on the issues that you care about? So, I, I, I back when uh, when Rachel Notley became Premier, I met with her, and I got her actually to wear the I Love Oil Sands yeah. hoodie, which was kind of a legendary... It and it didn't disintegrate when she put it on. No, she okay. it didn't. <laughs> and, and for her credit, yeah. I think she fought hard on the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she was likable. The problem, though, is it's not so much her; it's the federal NDP. It's what are they? What is the end game for Fort McMurray? What is the end game for our oil and gas industry? And unfortunately, too, I don't trust that they will protect our industry in, a, in an offensive way. Like not so much like she accepted the carbon tax. There's all these decisions that hurt us. Uh, the only thing that really scares me is I. Um, on a, not to go kind of sideways from oil and gas, but I, I was talking to some people from a, a region where they got rid of the coal industry and they were devastated. Like, like when you shut down these industries so for so-called woke values without an understanding of the direct economic effects, I think that's scary and that happened a lot in the Parkland District and it took them a long time to get over that. So I don't think that there are strong enough defenders of the oil and gas industry I think that what we will ha what we will see more and more of is that Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, and Russia will take a lot of our market share if we don't get aggressive. There is yeah. no such thing as green energy. Um, the oil industry isn't going anywhere. But what happens to our oil industry? I think we need to wake up and be more aware of how easily it could be cut if we don't protect it. Yeah, and I, it's interesting when you mention you know, the coal industry because the, you know, the old sort of model NDP voter was this, you know, union blue collar worker. Many of them in Alberta would have worked in coal, would have worked in mining, would have worked in oil and gas. And, and it is a strange little dilemma that the NDP has where it's like, 
we're going to stand up for you know the old blue collar unionized worker but no 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 not you guys uh, not not the ones in this sector because you are right they've just decided this you know woke virtue signaling uh, takes precedence over that well you know and what's really funny is such a facade like if you look at Jack Zine, I mean you want to talk about he drives a BMW <laughs> he's super rich you know what I mean he has a ten thousand dollar Rolex and he's going to be the beacon of social values and speak out yeah. for people I mean it's ridiculous <laughs> you know and that's the thing that I I, I grew up NDP in Saskatchewan like I, it was a I had like the worker versus the business and I was that comfortable with that yeah. but now you've got kind of the NDP like especially with the, the guy that the, the head of the the, uh, the union the 955 union that uh, not the 955 uniform oh yeah Jerry Diaz yeah. right yeah. he gets basically kicked out for some crazy uh, allegations of fraud and all that type of stuff and those are the guys that are pulling millions of dollars in support away from the conservatives, even though in the weird world, I would argue that the conservatives are more pro-union than the NDP because the conservatives yeah. are protecting the jobs that pays the union dues so they can be so political. Yeah, you, you kind of have to laugh at the political history. If you had told a British conservative that uh, the, the left had lost the support of the coal miners and the people who work in coal, they would think you were a lunatic because <laughs> that is literally yeah. the heart and soul of the left in Britain was, was the coal mining and the coal mining union. Here, I do think, uh, though, talking of coal, which is a very interesting thing, I, th I think it was a misstep from how Premier Kenny uh, uh, tried to talk about reintroducing or, or reinvigorating coal production in Alberta. I don't think it was particularly well explained, and it provided an opening, I think, to the New Democrats to say, oh, we're the guardians of our precious natural landscapes yeah. and our pristine, I mean, the joke, of course, being that, that none of them ever go into the nature, they, they all live in cities. But uh, uh, I think that was something where, if you look at a writing like Banff Canada Ascus, where the threat of, say, large-scale coal mining would have been a problem for Miranda Rosen to have explained. So I think that's why you've seen some movement now trying to walk back and, and modify positioning and messaging on it. If you are uh, just tuning in, welcome. This is the North Alberta results show. Uh, and just to give a, another plug here, we only get to do this uh, because of the support of our uh, supporters, so please do head on over to donate.tnc.news. And if you're watching on YouTube and you want to make a super chat uh, contribution, you can ask a question and we will put it to our panel, which include yours truly, Andrew Lawton, Robbie Picard of the uh, Fantastic Oil Sands campaign. Show off the uh, shirt. I've got one of those hoodies. So I, I didn't wear it today because I I knew it would be a little warm in here. Uh, and William McBeth from True North. Uh, just to give you the lay of the numbers here, 500 and, uh, 753,821 votes cast. 52% of polls reporting now, which I think is very important. So we're starting to see a little bit more uh, formation in the numbers that we're coming to you with. We've had a couple of races declared, most not all that surprising. Uh, we're still monitoring some of the Calgary ridings as they come in. Uh, just to, to check in with Edmonton here. Well, no, we'll do a little old Lethbridge. Uh, Lethbridge still both are going NDP, and that's looking fairly certain. Uh, we have in NDP uh, territory in Edmonton still a, a big box uh, around Edmonton that is orange. Uh, we've still got uh, Strathcona Sherwood Park, Park, and then you go to the neighboring uh, riding of uh, Sherwood Park, and it is uh, leading NDP pretty decisively right now, that one, 1,700 votes. Um, and Edmonton Southwest, Casey Maju, we were watching that one. Uh, still only three polls reporting there, which is a little odd. Uh, do we? Is this common in elections in your experience, this delay? I mean, everyone here seems to be getting pretty restless now. No, I, I would say this is unusual. I, I, I really can't understand why after an hour and a half of counting, they've been unable to get beyond three polling stations reporting. That's, that's unusual. Yeah. yeah, they've now had two hours and uh, 38 minutes, so... Uh, and we're long past that one that a polling station uh, somewhere that was open until like 9.46. Right. So uh, now we can genuinely say all are closed. Of uh, course, Andrew, we all know that sometimes math is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the explanation. Yeah. Uh, and then to uh, jump back into Calgary. So uh, this is a bit of an interesting one. Calgary Klein, now 10, bulls, uh, 10 polls reporting. Uh, Jeremy Nixon of the UCP Live. So this could end up being a bit more of a horse race than even, I think, some of the more pessimistic people thought. 
Uh, no, absolutely. Calvary Klein, I think, was willing to be a target for the New Democrats. They believe that that's close enough to the center, the center of the city, the core of the city, that it would be vulnerable. Uh, Jeremy Nixon, uh, of course, uh, one of two Nixons we have in the <laughs> Alberta legislature, uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I think that uh, he was always going to be in a tough fight, along with people like Nick Milliken and Calvary Curry, and uh, and some of the and, and uh, varsity uh, Jason Popping. Those are some challenging ridings for the U.C. Just like right before my eyes, it flipped from an NDP lead back to uh, Tyler Shandro, UCP lead. Again, nine of 18 polls reporting, so we're halfway there. Uh, he's got a, a an 11 point lead right now. Uh, so this one, I think we're probably going to see flip back and forth before the, the night is up, right? No, absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, Calgary Katie was my bellwether riding the guy effect. I, I thought it was riding that for various reasons the New Democrats were going to try and target. And it's the kind of riding that isn't natural New Democrat territory that they have to win if they were to win this election. I think that, uh, I think after this, if they, when they analyze, the UCP analyzes, they're going to have to really dig into Calgary and understand that Calgary's demographic is changing and how they target people in Calgary. They're going to have to target a little different. Yeah. You know, and I also think that, like, I think we need to, like, as a gay guy, one of my things is, is that I think that they need to find a, a way to stay out of people's bedrooms, including in Calgary, and just say, look, I want fiscal responsibility. I want a strong oil and gas industry. And then I want the freedom, which I think we all agree on, to live my life as I choose. And I think that that, I think the fear, not the, uh, most of the UCP candidates I know and all the people in the party, they're pretty cool. Tell them they're gay anyway. Like, I mean, it's, there's more gays in the UCP than they ever admit. But I think the perception to a lot of people in Calgary is that they're not as open. Like, I, I, even in Edmonton, I was surprised. Like, I had some meetings with some top business people in Calgary, and they were all pro Danielle Smith. And the top people in Edmonton, these are people worth hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. in Edmonton. Well, they thought she was completely different than the person I know she is. So I, I think that that is something, if I was as I'm going, but like humanize your candidates yeah. and show a more personal side because most people want to own a home, save money, have low taxes and cheap and affordable energy. Yeah, very well said. Uh, just reading a couple of the super chats here. Braden Maz uh, didn't offer a question or comment with his, just gave a nice contribution. I actually know Braden, so thank you, Braden. Uh, I mean, I thank everyone that I don't know also, but I just happen to know Braden. Uh, and to your point from earlier, this one's interesting. This is from a woman identified as the Dandelion Way. Uh, Danielle acknowledged vaccine mandates were human rights violations. Notley, as the official opposition offered, no resistance and still promotes them. Was this a factor for rebuilding trust for UCP? I think the interesting thing here, uh, this woman says, I was an NDP voter once. So uh, we are seeing NDP UCP shifts. Here. Yeah. And I think, again, I mean, the, the COVID situation, Danielle Smith did have a, a very strong position on that that certainly does set her apart from the NDP. Well, you know, I, I'm i fully vaccinated, but here's what I found very interesting. A guy in Fort McMurray that's a successful manager has over one of the smartest people that I know and I work with, he's not vaccinated. And and he explained to me why he's not vaccinated. And I was shocked at the amount of people that I would have thought would have been the first to get vaccinated, not get vaccinated. So I think that this hardcore attack on people who chose not to get vaccinated yeah. was a mistake. You know, like uh, one of my family members is a teacher yeah. and they, she was told that if she got vac or didn't get vaccinated, she'd lose her job. Then she got vaccinated and now her me menstrual cycle is not the same ever since. And when I bring that up, people don't care. They're like, well, you know, that's just could be. I'm like, to take that kind of non-caring approach to people who made a medical choice for them, I can totally understand how she probably gained a lot of quiet support because yeah. a lot of the NDP supporters did not want to get vaccinated. This was this was beyond parties. This was a very personal issue. And I think it's a huge mistake to attack the unvaccinated. And I, I think the premier was very, uh, uh, very true when she kind of yeah. stood up for them a bit. Well, and I think to the discussion we were having earlier to broaden it out a bit, you know, the NDP trying to say that it should stand as the beneficiary of, of you know, UCP to NDP swings. Well, there can be swings going the other way yeah. as well. And I, I think in this election, for whatever reason, there have to be at least a few voters out there that are saying, you know, I've always been an NDP, but this Danielle Smith woman isn't as scary. 
You know, the interesting thing about vaccination, I agree with Robbie, it, 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 it wasn't a left-right issue. It didn't fall exactly on partisan lines, even if large chunks of it maybe did. Um, but definitely there were cohorts that didn't. And I think if you look at the federal election, you saw a lot of green voters who didn't have a candidate because the Green Party collapsed heading into the election. Yes. And they went party to the People's Party, which would not have been a natural assumption you might have made about other issues. But they 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 identify themselves as non-conforming or, or outside of the consensus on this issue. And they saw the Green Party being that way, and they saw the People's Party being that way. Yeah. Absolutely, voters shifted on this issue. Yeah, and I, I mean, we were obviously talking earlier about some of the fringe uh, right of center parties in this election, which, as we're seeing in the numbers, are you know not even flipping. I, I mean, I'm not even seeing them. And, and federally, there's the backdrop right now of the by-elections, specifically Portage Lisker, where you have a, a conservative stronghold and Maxine Bernier running for the PPC in it. But I, I do think that Danielle Smith is a fairly crossover candidate, certainly on, on different factions of the conservative movement, because, you know, even though the hard uh, line of the party on the right side, uh, obviously like her. She herself is not easy to put into a box like that. I mean, she's very moderate on social issues. Uh, she's very policy oriented. So even if you don't agree with her, she's always been able to kind of explain why she approaches a certain issue. And, and I think your point about humanizing is especially important with Danielle Smith because she will never be the caricature that they make her out to be. My biggest hope is that the, the the conservatives, both federally and provincially, seem to be a bit cannibalistic and they want to eat their own. Yeah. I really hope that when she wins tonight, that they give her time for the public to get to know her. Because when you get to know her, she's great. Like, I mean, I, I did a video where, where I, you know, I, I, I just at, challenged people to give her a chance. And I I mean, I've hung out with Rachel Notley, Jason Kenney, Pierre Polyev, uh, Jean Charest. I've hung out with them all. and. Out of all the politicians, I've never seen anyone listen better in my life than she sits in a room of people and she listens to them. She doesn't even have to agree, but it's not your typical, you know, BS politician that just kind of, oh yeah, 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 yeah. She's well, why do you feel that way? Yeah. She challenges it and she and she's challenging it so she understands. So I really hope that they, the party unites and and and. and kind of loses this sort of self-promoting narcissism which exists in there <laughs> yeah. and actually gets behind her because you know she's what they need right now I, I i think she's the female ralph klein she's not perfect she's gonna make a misstep you know she's gonna say something like shoot shovel and shut up you know she's gonna do all these things but at the end of the day it's for the betterment of alberta and it makes alberta a better place to have a fighter yeah. and just transition you know, that comes from Greenpeace and Naomi Klein and Sephora yeah. Berman. And it's now that is moderate, it's not a moderate energy policy. No. Policy by any stretch. So you can't take their wording. Yeah. You can't do what like Rachel would do and be like, okay, well, we're going to have our own carbon <laughs> tax and we're going to have that. No, you're not going to give us a carbon tax. We're not accepting to shut down our main industry, which also provides a great deal of the GDP for this entire country in yeah. Ottawa. Like, it's a, you need someone to kind of say, whoa, Trudeau, no. Yeah. And that that's not an easy find. So let me go to you on this, William. And the bigger picture building off that is, is the comeback narrative. That certainly when she won the leadership was a big part of it. And, and I made a point in a, a column I wrote that, you know, it was difficult for me to say Danielle Smith was back because in so many ways she never left. I mean, she went pretty heavily into a, a different career other than politics. She went back into media and, and really did spend time putting in the legwork, building up her relationship. And, and the story that I've told, she and I were alternating on uh, hosting on 770 uh, CHQR in, uh, in Calgary. Uh, what was fascinating is I would see the text messages that listeners would send in. And when I would log in after her, uh, if I were like, you know, doing the show after her or whatever, I'd see just the vicious, vicious things that people said about her. And I would not wish that on anyone. And you could hear in her voice when she was on air that, that you know, every now and then she would get rattled by this. But she kept plugging away and she won those people back and ironically some of her closest friends i think when she ran for the leadership were the people that were her most vicious enemies uh, back in 2015. yeah i mean uh i i wrongly uh believe that daniel smith was done in politics after the border crossing i and i think it's because i just couldn't figure out how someone could come back from that much anger or or even who would want to 
Yeah. Who would want to willingly subject themselves to month after month of the outpouring of anger that, that she did? But to her credit, I think she emerged uh, from it uh, and, and impressed a lot of people in the process. They, they were impressed in her grit and her determination to, to uh, weather uh, all of that. And then, um, you know, she enters this round of, of this election far more of experience than when she entered uh, uh, the 2012 election, yeah. for example. People people forget, of course, Daniel Smith wasn't uh, a politician. She was working as an advocacy person in a, in a think tank or in an advocacy group, and then went from being uh, the Wild Rose, the leader of this tiny little new party, to serious contender of an election in you know less than three years. It was a remarkably short period of time. And, uh, that, you know, she. I just don't think she knew she had experience in politics that she knew uh, was seasoned enough to handle the difficulties because this was her first election. Yeah. She had never run for anything before trying to become Premier of Alberta. <laughs> That's a really big step to take. So obviously she doesn't have to do that this time. She can say, I know this job better. I've been doing it for six months. So let me finish the job I've started. Yeah, and also, I mean, this is the first time she's done it as UCP leader. I mean, that's, a, I think, a part of the dynamic that it's easy to miss, is this is a different party entirely than the Wild Rose of 2012 and 2015 was. I think the biggest thing conservatives across this country have to do is the time they spend in fighting hurts. Like, between leaving Maxime Barnier, Barnier and, and the, he didn't win, so he goes his own way, gets his own party. The energy in infighting is destroying the movement yeah across this entire country. So I think that's the first wake up call. Uh, when it comes to uh, Premier Smith, look, I know so many, here, I was broke ass when I came to Fort McMurray, okay? I came from Montreal, I lived in a tent, I had no money, I made some bad decisions before, and I rebuilt myself. I know so many people who come to Fort McMurray yeah. who turn their lives around. She's an Alberta story. Massive high, total low, back on top. And that's that belief in yourself that you're not going to give up. That's why I respect her. I really, really like her. I, I think that that, I mean, my God, to go from that to being the premier, you got to give her credit. Well, that's the essence of the Alberta's calling yeah. campaign, that Alberta is the, the land of opportunity here. Uh, we have one question from uh, Snow Canadian, no, Snown Canadian. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, do you think voters that work or make their living from government money plays into voting for the NDP in Edmonton? Uh, does growing a vote to worry you on the future government where the government money could control uh, the vote. Is, is NDP, uh, is, is Edmonton NDP territory because Edmonton's the capital is basically the question. I mean, look, I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the NDP is doing better in a city that has 60,000 government <laughs> employees, a huge swath of which belong to public sector unions, who have benefited from very good salaries, very good pensions yeah. and benefits, uh, and have absolute job security. So that, sure. Yes, I do think that's the case. I don't think that reflects Edmonton as a whole. I think there are an awful lot of Edmontonians who are just like Calgarians, who believe in hard work, uh, opportunity, pursuing success. Uh, it's just, uh, it's maybe not quite so obvious or on the surface as, as it is here. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it would be a real mistake, though, for the UCP to simply give up on Edmonton as a whole. I think maybe it will take more than one election cycle but there's definitely a chance for the UCP to begin building back support. And I look at uh, Ralph Klein, who when he won, was never really well liked at Edmonton. In fairness, Edmonton, you know, he did say he wasn't a big fan of Edmonton, which probably didn't endear him. But, but through hard work, he did eventually build up support and could win. Uh, you know, a, a substantial number of seats. And I think it's important for Edmonton to have representation in a united conservative government. I really hope that this city doesn't only vote New Democrat and then no, yeah. have no voice at the government table <laughs> when important decisions are being made. Uh, it's a night to be the Acadia Watch because one more poll came in and it flipped once again uh, back to an NDP lead. Uh, so Calgary Acadia has uh, 11 polls reporting, NDP now leading by 140 votes. So uh, we are uh, getting in there. We have to take a uh, quick break in just a moment here, but you are tuned in to the uh, True North Alberta election night results show. 
I'm Andrew Lawton, joined, of course, by Robbie Picard right now and William McBath. And just before we uh, take a little break to do a reset here, I'll uh, let you know we've got uh, in uh, the Banff Canada this is pretty firmly a UCP hold now. 11 pulls in out of 26, but uh, a 2,100 vote lead. That seems like a really difficult one to, uh, to flip at this time. Uh, a lot of the other Calgary ridings that we were keeping an eye on, uh, Calgary Glenmore, uh, 400 vote lead with 13 to 22 polls reporting. Uh, and uh, Banff Kananaskis we talked about. So uh, again, I, I think even some of these ridings that uh, a lot of people thought might have been done are, are, are pretty much holding here. So um, when we come back, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. We're going to get uh, Lindsay Wilson from Alberta Proud back into the mix. But just some, some closing thoughts here, uh, Robbie. What's your big uh, message for the night? I think the mess, my message is real simple to the UCP. Don't turf your leader give her time to build the party. She needs, Albertans need to get to know her. Um, I, how many UCP leaders or conservative leaders have we been through? We've been through quite a few in the past 10 years. And I think it's time to unite behind your leader. Uh, time with COVID and, and recovering, give your leader a chance. All right, well, thank you for that, Robbie. William, I, we're, we're gonna be talking to you in like 30 seconds, but give, a, give us a thought. I mean, I just had to laugh because I think Robbie is, is bang on with that one, which is uh, if you keep getting Conservatives rid of Conservatives turf the leaders in general. It's if, not just an Alberta if problem. If you keep yeah. getting rid of your leader, you're always going to be in a state of flux, and it's going to be hard for you to tell voters what you believe, why you believe, and all that. Uh, but, you know, the joke is, I don't know if any of our viewers have ever watched the great John Cleese performing a British show called Faulty Towers. He, he, you know, gets away with some crazy little pull the wool over his sides. He gets through it with the skin of his teeth, and he goes, right, now for the hard part. And that's what I worry about with this UCP government. We win the election, everybody takes a day off, and now you have to govern and keep the caucus of the party together. Now for the hard part. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for that. We're going to take a, a quick break. We'll be back after a reset in just a moment. Hang tight. You're back on. <laughs> yeah, you have. Congratulations. It's ready.
Yeah, sorry, one sec. UCP uh, having the results they have now. But uh, let's talk about this. Now, right now, we are at uh, just 52 leading. 52 is uh, just one above where you were called. No, two above you where you were predicting and one above where you were. Uh, and then I have, of course, uh, I'm the loser right now because I was at 48. Uh, but uh, better to be modest here. So uh, what are you thinking of this so far? I mean, I, I think it's a tremendous victory for the United Conservative Party. If you look at uh, public opinion polling over the past six months, eight months, a year. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who thought it was simply impossible. <laughs> All right, well, if I may, the legacy media has just reached the conclusion that we reached, uh, and they've now declared a majority for Danielle Smith and the UCP. Things are gonna get a little hectic behind us now. I'll let you just soak in this for a moment. All right, well, that is the uh, call coming from CTV. Uh, about a minute behind True North, we were looking at some of the raw data and uh, we were fairly confident in that. They're finding the same uh, numbers that we are right now, 52 leading and elected for the UCP, so it's still a loss right now of about 11 seats for the UCP uh, and a gain for the NDP. Um, but all, all of, uh, aside, a win is a win. Uh, we're not only in majority territory, uh, but a, a healthy enough majority. You take out the independent, you take out uh, the Speaker of the House, and, and this is a is fairly decisive, certainly as we were gonna get this cycle. I, I mean, as I, I was finishing up saying, I think there was a point in time where a UCP majority win was seen as impossible, that the New Democrats were polling quite far ahead. So for the fact that Danielle Smith was able to bring it back in six months and lead her party to a majority government, I think is a remarkable achievement and one she should be rightly proud of. I also think uh, she just is going to win by enough seats that her majority in the legislature will be functional. She will be able to govern in an effective majority government without being beholden to every single vote and having to scrape them 100% of them together every time she wants to move her agenda forward. What are your uh, preliminary thoughts on this, Lindsay? They just weren't able to turn some of those close Calgary ridings. They thought that they, they, that they would be able to turn those. The NDP thought they would, but they weren't able to. Uh, it was interesting to see that my horse, Miranda Rosa, <laughs> and I thought she would have, you know, I thought it was a bit of a challenge to run from uh, Van Kenanowskis, and she's uh, won so far as Wendy. So it's, it's just interesting. I, 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 I want to know what's going to happen in the in the months and the years to come with this strong hold of orange in and around Greater Edmonton. Like it is really orange up there. And what's that going to mean? Is that going to further the, the rural urban divide? I think it's really interesting. How can the UCP gain some more support? I think we, if we can get you to move your mic up a little bit, you're now being drowned out by uh, the adoring uh, UCP fans there. So we'll make sure that your analysis is not missed by those tuning in online. Welcome, by the way. Uh, if you're just joining us now, this is the True North Alberta election night results show. I'm having to shout everything now. I'm joined by Lindsay Wilson from Alberta Proud and William McBeth from True North. Uh, we just called moments ago 
the election for Danielle Smith and the United Conservative Party. A, a pretty healthy majority here, 52 seats in which the UCP is leading or elected right now. Uh, so not the numbers they had going into the election, but still uh, very healthy. Uh, the uh, legacy media behind us has just reached the conclusion, so that's what uh, they have up on the feed there. Uh, we would have hoped the UCP would have put us on there, but we won't hold that against them. We'll let them have their, uh, their moment on this. Uh, just a, a pitch, if I can, for supporting independent media. Uh, we're only able to do this because uh, we do not get the government bailout money. So uh, if you value what we're doing, head on over to donate.tnc.news. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, pop us a super chat and we'll read your question or comment, assuming it's not naughty. Uh, we haven't had any of those so far uh, live on air. Do let us know about these uh, as they're coming in. So now I think the evening is getting a little bit more predictable in nature. Uh, there are still some, some ridings that we're wondering about, one of which is uh, Tyler Shandros. Uh, I, I know it's a little early, but it's also not at the same time. Do you see any obvious cabinet changes now with the new makeup we're likely to see? I mean, I, I think we are going to see uh, the health minister probably lose uh, his riding. Uh, the minister of advanced education, I think, is in either a close race or a, a difficult race. Uh, minister uh, Nick Milliken and Calgary Curry, I think, sadly, won't be returned either. So there, there are going to be, uh, by necessity, changes to uh, the cabinet. She's also possibly going to lose her only Edmonton MLA and Deputy Deputy Premier Casey Mattis from uh, cabinet as well. S uh, sadly, looks like he might not be elected. So I, I would say there's there's changes coming. She's going to have to try and balance um, representation with fit for job, uh, all of those things. Um, but I think you know th th those are those are good problems to have. Trying to build a cabinet means you won an election, and yeah. of course, if there's a winner, then there's a loser, and unquestionably that will have to be Rachel Notley and the Democrats. What does future now hold for her? Can she hold on to the job of opposition leader? Or will the party say that's two consecutive losses in a row? We're giving you the boot and going with someone else. So I'll be interested to see what uh, Premier Notley, Rachel Notley announces tonight. Yeah, there was a Freudian slip there that never yeah, was. But was uh, just, sure. just in on Southwest, which you mentioned, that's Casey Matthews, uh, former riding now. We can call that one for the NDP safely at this point. Uh, 12 of 18 polls reporting, uh, NDP up by 1,400. Uh, no way you're closing that gap in uh, in, in six polls. So uh, obviously, uh, Casey Matthews, yeah, the lone Edmonton MP uh, or MLA and a pretty senior member of uh, Danielle Smith's government uh, going into this, uh, no longer there. Uh, do, do you think at this point uh, the UCP strategy is just to ignore Edmonton, or do you think that there is something they need to do to regain that ground? I think they got to start with, with the fringe of, of uh, great, you know, they have to start with greater Edmonton and work their way in. And I know this is a little closer in places like Strathcona, Sherwood Park. I'm surprised with Beaumont and Ladue have been throughout there, and I think they need to just start doing some really good work in there. And, um, and try and get some favor back because in the long run that's going to prove to be very problematic for the party is seeing that blanket of orange that's completely dominating around yeah. Edmonton and it's getting bigger every time let's not forget where we're at right now it looks like <laughs> so CBC has just woken up to the fact that there is an election going on and CBC has now called Danielle Smith uh, as having a majority, which uh, they were reluctantly doing. So it took them until practically Tuesday. Uh, I'm not even joking. It's, you know, 53 minutes to midnight uh, to do what everyone else had done before. So uh, when CBC has acknowledged the Danielle Smith win, you know uh, that the win is in. Yeah, I mean, Calgary, Acadia, you were right to pick that one as your one to watch. That's ending up being the most interesting uh, race of the evening, one of the closest in the evening. Uh, no more polls than a few minutes ago when we checked in, which if you're just joining us, uh, 104 for the NDP uh, with 11 of 18 polls reporting. But every time a new poll has been coming in, it's been flipping back and forth. So, I mean, I, who knows? I mean, there are six polls left. That means it'll likely current trajectory holds. But that is not scientific, so don't take my, uh, my word for that there. Uh, you go around the ring of Calgary here. Um, one that, that is kind of interesting... Uh, Rajan Sani uh, has, and I, I just want to pull up the exact number here. Uh, it looks like she is winning uh, with a 500 vote lead, uh, two polls remaining. Uh, let's talk about that because she wasn't originally going to be running. Uh, no, 
uh, she had announced that she would not be seeking uh, re-election, uh, and then um, she decided that she wanted back in. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that it's possibly a reflection of uh, the riding she had represented was going to be a, a difficult challenge. Uh, she was then offered a safer seat for the United Conservative Party. I think that may have motivated her to, <laughs> to rethink her exit from public life. All right, we have uh, Rachel Emanuel standing by with uh, pollster and former federal conservative campaign manager uh, Hamish Marshall. We'll check in with him on what's been happening. Uh, take it away, Rachel. So I am here with Hamish Marshall. He was in charge of the internal polling for the UCP during the campaign. Hamish, UCP insiders that I spoke to during the campaign were very confident, and now we know why. The numbers that we're seeing so far tonight, do they align with what you saw during the campaign? Uh, we certainly had a lot of very good numbers over the course of the campaign, especially after uh, Premier Smith's fantastic performance at the debate. Uh, but these numbers exceed even, uh, even some of our more optimistic projections. So what we're seeing tonight is actually a better turnout than what you predicted during the campaign. Well, we're moving towards the UCP in the last few days, uh, and they've kept doing that over the weekend and into day and into election day, and we've got a, a very strong result. So I heard from some perhaps overly optimistic UCPers that we were going to pick up seats in Edmonton. Not actually the case. Looks like we're, lo we're losing Casey Maddow's seat. He was the only seat that we held in Edmonton. Did you at any point during the campaign think it was a possibility to pick up some seats inside that dome? Edmonton was always going to be very, very, very tricky. The NDP's got an amazing machine there, and the numbers were very, very tough. Uh, the big focus was on those seats around Edmonton, where the NDP put a, a, a lot of effort, uh, but they ran into a blue wall and a, and a group of, of ridings that really reacted very well to Danielle Smith's message. So when we talk about polling, it seems that a lot of the pollsters get things wrong in Alberta so often, certainly in the 2012 election. Again, in the 2019, they really underestimated support for the UCP. You know, even you said yourself tonight, my polls didn't estimate as high as support as we are seeing tonight. Why do you think it is? Why is it so hard to peg down conservative voters in Alberta? I think there's a couple of different things. I think, number one, we saw a trend moving towards the UCP. So polls taken a few days ago were probably not as positive for the UCP as ones, as including the votes that were, people made up their mind today and more people broke to the UCP today than would have even three, two or three days ago. So I think that's the first thing. I think it's also, there's a, uh, the media is so uh, omnipresent pushing a, a pro-NDP message that there's a little bit of a shy conservative factor that people don't want to tell a pollster that they're voting UCP. Uh, they might, but because they made to feel bad about it by the mainstream media, but uh, in the end, they come out and vote. Yeah, I think those are some really good points. You know, when we talk about being a in Alberta, I get kind of panicked. People see the votes, and then you always have those conservatives that say, "Well, I don't trust the polls because they've gone it wrong so many times." At what point, as conservatives, do we say we're just going to ignore polls from? you know, sort of legacy media outlets and these legacy pollsters who've gotten it wrong so many times. Is there a point where we just decide to say it's not worth it for us to really give these credibility because they've gotten it wrong so many times? Well, I think I think what everybody has to do is look closely at which pollsters got it right. Some of the public pollsters did a very good job. Others weren't as close. I'm not going to say you shouldn't listen to polls. I'm a, I'm a pollster myself, and I believe it can be done right if it's done smart in a smart way. And that's what I think, I think we people need to do is be a, a little more... Uh, literate about which ones are good and which ones uh, have a, a more dodgy record. Yeah, so, I mean, Danielle Smith was pretty tight-lipped about the internal polling, as she would be. So I guess the question is, when are you going to start doing public polling that will be available for us conservatives in Alberta? Well, I've done public polling for True North in the past, and maybe I will again. Just my last question for you here. We know that Janet Brown has a really good reputation in the province. She gets it right so often, and she typically counts the conservative vote much higher than her competitors. Would you say that tonight further solidifies her reputation as the best pollster in Alberta? Well, I think she, she's, she obviously did a great job in this election, and that, that counts for a lot. Thank you so much, Marshall. All right, we are back. Andrew Lawton here at the uh, True North Live Alberta Election Results Show. Uh, now, just uh, one little bit of context here. I can't show you, but uh, all through the night, there has been a, a, a lingering area over here where people have been having their drinks, sitting down at tables. Uh, when the majority was there, everyone just rushed from that 
uh, over to the big floor where all the excitement and action are happening behind us here. Uh, obviously, uh, we know for sure Danielle Smith is going to continue to be Premier of Alberta. Uh, right now, UCP leading or elected in 52 seats compared to uh, 35 for the NDP. What we don't know, though, is the outcome of a couple of key seats. And we also don't know the fate of Rachel Notley. And we were just chatting when uh, Rachel Emanuel uh, was speaking with uh, Hamish Marshall about this a little bit. Uh, do you see a path to hold on for Rachel Notley here? The thing is, the problem for the NDP now is who do they have to replace her? We were discussing earlier that they've, they've really done so strongly in this province based on the brand of Rachel Notley, yeah. right? We go back to that team Rachel Notley rather than NDP. And but this is two straight losses in a row. Uh, you know, if we, if, if we look at history and leaders, it now would be her time to step down to move on from the party. But who do they have to replace her? They have some serious extremists in this party. Yeah. And I, I just don't know what that looks like for them. So this might mean a whole shuffle and rebrand for them. It'll be really interesting to see. What we, we have seen uh, losing leaders not really want to go away. And I mean, one example was uh, Andrew Scheer, who, you know, held on for a little bit. Uh, Aaron O'Toole held on for a little bit, uh, a little bit longer in his case. Uh, but the difference between those two and Rachel Notley is that uh, Rachel Notley has had now, uh, this is, well, this is her third, third She won one and two. So uh, this isn't just an example of, you know, kick someone out before they've had a chance to try. Like, I don't see how, unless she just outlasts everyone, how she turns around this party's fortunes. It's a little bit tricky, um, just, you know, the point that I think Lindsay made is very good. There is not a lot of heir appearance to uh, post-Rachel Notley, yeah. New Democrats. I think they would really struggle uh, once. And, of course, the Notley name uh, in Alberta is, is a little bit storied, of course. Her her father was a was a pretty pretty well-liked, pretty and almost beloved politician. Well, isn't there a Notley riding name? Is that named is after, after him? After, yeah, after, after Grant after, Notley. And, you know, who, and he, he died in a plane crash very, very sadly. And so I, I think she gets um, uh, a, a more open hearing than a typical New Democrat would. Uh, so it, it's possible they may say, even after two losses, we still think this is the best we can <laughs> we can do, and they're, they may they may stick it on. She may decide she doesn't want to do it anymore. Though. She may say, look, I've been campaigning for for you know coming on by the next election will have been like ten years. I really don't want to do this anymore. Somebody else should have the chance. I want to spend more time with my my family and pursue other projects. So uh, does she have the fire in her belly to be leader of the opposition for another four year term and contest another provincial election? I don't know. So uh, just to give you an update on the numbers here, not seeing any movement so far, 52 uh, to 35 for the UCP. A couple of super chats I wanted to read. If you're watching on YouTube and want to give us some words of encouragement and some financial support to keep this show going, uh, please do that. For says God bless Smith. Congratulations. Uh, Tyler Durden says, Andrew and team, thank you for the excellent coverage and analysis. You have made provincial politics interesting and informative, oh, wow. which is a, a very difficult thing to do, but we've done it. <laughs> uh, Tyler says, keep up the great work. Uh, congratulations to Alberta and Danielle Smith. Well, uh, thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Sarah, for that. Uh, we're going to have uh, some more updates, and, and one in particular I see is uh, Steve Outhouse, who is the campaign manager for uh, Danielle Smith and the UCP. I see uh, Steve Outhouse uh, is currently being lassoed by Rachel Emanuel uh, into doing an interview. So we'll get Steve up uh, very shortly to talk about this. Uh, obviously, now that the win has happened for the UCP, Steve has uh, emerged uh, from where he was probably quite anxiously watching the results. Bigger um, nails shorter than when the evening began. Yes. Yeah, uh, another another call for the, the UCP in Calgary there. Um, so what's going to happen, uh, we're going to have a speech from Rachel Notley, which uh, will certainly be a concession speech. Now, uh, she will, as is the protocol, uh, phone Danielle Smith, if she hasn't already, to uh, formally, formally concede, and then she'll speak, and then uh, after that we'll have, uh, of course, Danielle Smith uh, deliver a speech and we were talking I think uh, a little while ago on another show William about how you want to have different speeches for this you know if you win but it's not a blowout if you win but you know not necessarily narrowly and I mean wh which speech do you bring out for this occasion I, I mean I would say uh, Danielle gets to be maybe a little more triumphant than uh, than if she had won in the 40s I think uh, it is a bit of a on the 
fact, she was able to bring the United Conservative Party back into a position to win a pretty strong majority government, certainly stronger than what some of the uh, polls would have suggested yeah. even a week ago. So, uh, I mean, I don't think I don't think she should take the opportunity to say uh, she has phenomenal cosmic power <laughs> and should be allowed to do as she pleases. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for her to talk to the province, reassure them that despite having a majority government, uh, she's going to continue to govern in the best interests of all of her. And she's going to talk maybe about uh, some of her priorities going into a new four-year mandate. Rachel Emanuel has successfully lassoed uh, Steve Outhouse, the uh, UCP campaign manager. Uh, Rachel, Steve, take it away. All right, I am joined by Steve Outhouse. He is the campaign manager for the UCP. Well, Steve, to start off, congratulations. How are you feeling right now? Well, a lot of relief. It has been a long campaign. It was a lot of hard work, but we're obviously very thrilled with the results. So I just spoke to Hamish Marshall, who did the internal polling for the UCP, and he said that tonight's results are even better than he had polled. Is that your response as well? Yes, it absolutely was. Uh, Hamish is a tough marker. Uh, so he had us a little bit lower than that. So we were watching the results carefully and looking for signals along the way. But yeah, these results are even better than what I was hoping for tonight. UCP insiders that I spoke to throughout the campaign seemed very confident. They seemed pretty sure that they were going to eke out a win tonight. And certainly they have more than eked out a win from the looks of things. Was there ever a point when you thought we might really be in trouble here? Oh, definitely. I mean, campaigns for those on campaigns a lot of roller coasters of emotion uh, so you have days where you're feeling like you're winning everything and days where you feel like the world is ending and we did have a rough second week I think it's fair to say it was pretty obvious to, to a lot of people we're able to pivot back have a great third week the debate was a turning point obviously the premier's performance I think put a lot of people's minds at ease with sort of the the caricature that's been made of her and she was able to connect with more people and and they saw her that night as the leader she is and I think that was a big part of the turnaround yeah, that's definitely something I heard from pretty much everyone I've spoken to here tonight, as well as voters that were unsure. They saw Danielle Smith perform at that debate, and I think they realized maybe the media's depiction of her wasn't quite accurate or fair. Would you say that was reflected in your polling as well? Yeah, absolutely. There were definitely concerns sort of earlier on in the campaign because of the way she was being portrayed. And as she was able to connect with more people during the campaign, we were able to see that improve. And then definitely the debate was a pivotal moment. People got to watch her on the stage, see her as a leader, uh, see her offer clear policy uh, you know sort of plans and objectives for the province and I think that brought a lot of people over and we did see a turnaround and also we heard from candidates at the doors that things got a lot smoother at that point in time. Something else that was really pivotal in this campaign was of course the Alberta wildfires. That crisis broke out in the very first week of the campaign really drew Danielle Smith's attention from campaigning in Calgary where everyone sort of knew the election was going to be decided to responding to that crisis up north. Did you have to sort of reconfigure what your campaign strategy was going to look like to address the fires? Yeah, so it, having the premier, well our leader transition back into premier mode, obviously the the calendar, I mean the, for gets into the weeds, but there was a lot of uh, events and announcements and things that had to be totally scrapped or postponed and changed. We had to roll with it. Uh, you know, she did a great job being the premier, but obviously for us on the campaign side, there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes to try to change and adapt to that. So that was part of the reason I think our second week was a little bit, she was looking great out there and connecting with, you know, and dealing with the crisis. But uh, internally, yes, there was a lot of shuffling that had to go around. Something else I have to ask you about is some conservatives said to me, you know, it feels like it's been a quiet campaign, we had the wildfire crisis to deal with. Some other UCP insiders said to me, you know, we didn't want to overpromise, we didn't want to overannounce, overspend perhaps. Would you say that this was really an intentional strategy or do you think that some of the distractions caused you to maybe not have as many announcements as the NDP who were doing quite a few events? Yeah. So kind of a, there's multiple answers to that. I mean, we, we are conservative, so we weren't going to be breaking the bank and starting to put the, the province back into a deficit type of situation. So yes, we have a more modest spending package, but I think it's still very effective what we put forward. Um, you know, but there were, the wildfires were again, you know, kind of knocked us off, you know, some of our platform plan. They, they all got announced over time, but it did slow some things down. And then ultimately, because it was boring, I think it's just sort of a, a testament that, you know, when she, when the Premier was on her game and able to kind of present herself, she, she gave solid answers. And, uh, and everyone, again, had set her up to be this caricature of someone who would just go out and say, 
crazy things at any given time, and she didn't. She went out and she delivered her message every day. And so then it was boring because it wasn't, you know, uh, you know, funny for the pundits and so on. They want who wanted to make fun of her the whole the whole campaign. And I think those folks are sort of eating a lot of crow tonight. Yeah, absolutely. One last question for you here. This is a bit of a controversial one. I know you've done what you needed to do tonight. You pulled off a win for the United Conservative Party. But something that I've been hearing, not only from legacy media, but also from other conservatives, is that you know if Danielle doesn't have a strong showing, a strong victory tonight, there could be a challenge to her leadership in the days and months ahead. Is that something that you were cognizant of during the leadership campaign? Well, my primary job is, as you say, to come in and manage the campaign that's there. I mean, so I'm not going to be able to give advice to kind of, a, you know, the UCP overall. You know, results. It's a strong, it is a strong mandate. And she has, we have, as a party, uh, almost the same amount of public, uh, popular vote as we had in the last campaign. Uh, you will obviously see our vote totals once Elections Alberta finishes counting them. We'll be able to get a better better state of that. But I think she has gotten a strong mandate tonight. I'm very proud of the Premier. I think she's going to do a great job. Thank you so much for your insight, Steve. Once again, that was Steve Outhouse, the UCP campaign manager. Really appreciate your insights. All right, welcome back. This is the True North Live Election Night show here. Uh, William McBeth joins me, as does Lindsay Wilson from Alberta Proud, and I am Andrew Lawton uh, on what's been a bit of a longer night than we uh, initially anticipated. Uh, right now, Lethbridge has been called for the UCP, Lethbridge East, uh, which is the one that we were watching that up until this point has been a fairly uh, NDP dominant riding in the polls. Um, what are the Lethbridge dynamics? Because that's often like the B-side city that we don't talk about because we're so focused on Calgary and Edmonton here. Why is Lethbridge one that tends to straddle these two parties? It's challenging because I think they're a little bit rural, they're a little bit urban. And when I was, I was just down in Lethbridge recently and I was talking to some people there because they were getting a lot of really good response on the for, uh, for the UCP. But you drive around that city and there's a lot of orange signs, there's a lot of blue signs. It does have a very large university, which I think does tend to make it skew a bit more New Democrat than you might expect from a small town yeah. in Alberta. But it was also home to, for example, the leader of the Alberta Liberal Party for many years, represented one of the two Lethbridge ridings. So this is a city that has also devoted non-conservative money. Yeah, and uh, we will uh, check in on some of the Calgary writings in a moment, but uh, Rachel Emanuel has been doing uh, tremendous work wrangling everyone. Uh, they're all coming out now that they know they've won. Uh, Rachel Emanuel right now is with uh, Danielle Smith's chief of staff, uh, Marshall Smith. Go ahead, Rachel. So we are back. I am now joined by Marshall Smith, chief of staff, chief of staff to the premier. How are you feeling about tonight's results? Is it what you expected, better than what you expected? It's actually what I expected, Rachel. Uh, I'm predicting one more seat than uh, than we've got right now, uh, but you know the numbers are looking really good. We are really thrilled and uh, couldn't be happier tonight. So I have to ask you this because I've been asking this to. Well, I just asked this to Steve Outhouse. Was there a point in the campaign where you actually felt like you were pretty worried about what might happen? I think early on in the campaign. I think before the numbers tightened up. Uh, you know, it, we're always nervous about going into these contests. Uh, so early on in the campaign is really difficult. But as the campaign moved on, and in particular at key points in the campaign, it started to become clear to me the way that this was going to go. So many of my viewers know, because I cover this quite a bit, but all of you probably aren't aware of this, Marshall Smith has really been heading up the province's addiction and recovery file. And we know that that was such a key topic during this election campaign. Albertans, Calgarians, Edmontonians were not feeling safe on the streets anymore. And the government really wanted to tackle that with a comprehensive plan, both on public safety and on addictions. Can you speak to a little bit about how important the addictions file was in this election? Sure. I think that it was it was very important in the into our electoral success. Uh, I think, in particular, with um, you know a lot of people, in particularly women and young people, don't feel safe on the streets of their own cities, uh, and they want something done about that. But they also want people helped in the way that that makes sense and that's going to be effective. Uh, so I think that the addiction platform. The public safety platform was very effective at moving women back to the party uh, in the final two weeks. So, 
Just my last question for you here. I see that Rachel Nolly is giving her concession speech, and I know that my audience is going to want to hear that, so we're going to get to that right away. But on the topic of the Compassionate Intervention Act, that's something we've talked a lot about tonight. Do you think it actually changed anyone's minds that we're going to vote for the UCP, or do you think that it really impacted a specific subset of voters? I do. I mean, we certainly knew what we were doing when we, when we put that together. Uh, this is an important piece of legislation. Uh, and I do think that it was effective at bringing a certain population over. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. Once Thanks again, so that was Marshall Smith, Chief of Staff to now re-elected Premier. All right, we now go to Rachel Notley conceding in Edmonton. Take it away. opportunity for our future and for the values that we all share. However, tonight I also know that we are all very deeply pointed in the old result. We had all hoped for a different one. Moments ago, I called Premier Danielle Smith to concede the race and I congratulated her party on their victory. To all those of you, to those who offered their unwavering support, their dedication and their belief in our vision for Alberta in this election, you are the reason that we fight for what we believe in. And to our candidates all across this province, congratulations on your campaigns, successful or not. You have all demonstrated tremendous leadership. I have spent the last few months being so inspired by your dedication, by your heartfelt commitment to standing up for Albertans without a voice, your own belief that we can and will come together to be better. I commend your integrity and your perseverance and your unparalleled work ethic. And I will never, ever, ever stop being deeply grateful for your decision to join our team. So thank you to all of you. And to those new MLAs, I say to you, welcome. Congratulations. Get some rest tonight and then get ready to get right back down to work. <laughs> to my amazing, amazing campaign team. Uh, I, I can't say enough. Uh, it, 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 they, they are for achievement that, that they have uh, and that they have uh, done you know, across the country. They are just unparalleled in their skill. I cannot thank that team enough, and I cannot thank, as well, our incredible volunteers enough. Your commitment, your hard work, your countless hours of effort have been the absolute backbone of our campaign. You've all shown incredible dedication and passion, and I am forever grateful for your support. And I need to say this as well, where we fell short, the responsibility rests entirely with me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine, that's, that's the joys of being the leader, you know, it's, it's fine, it's just, it's a thing. Uh, you know, it's part of responsibility and accountability. Those are things we, we care about here. But I do know that at the same time, we ran a strong principle that was based on our beliefs. And it was based on our desire to create a better future for all Albertans. These guys, 
Thank you to the four of you for, for standing by me in this often very crazy journey. Thank you to Ethan and to Sophie for accepting the difference that it has been meaning in their lives for all this time and ultimately turning it into their own pride and their own set of beautiful values that make me very proud. And thank you again. Seem like I'm doing this every four years. Thank you again to Lou, my lifelong sounding board. partner and apparently personal cheerleader but also occasionally for me all wrapped up into one and also Lou thank you very much for mopping the kitchen floor today that was awesome I love you all so much now although we did not achieve the outcome that we wanted we did take a major step towards it the unprecedented growth of our party through this campaign is a warm light, one that gives me a lot of optimism for the work to come. My friends, let me be clear, now is not the time to let up. Now is the time to step up. To time for us to do the work that has been asked of us. It is my honor to serve as your leader and it is my privilege to continue to serve as leader of the official opposition. Our values will be represented in the legislature. We will have a say in the future of this great We will continue to speak up on behalf of Albertans who struggle to have their voice heard. We will fight for better health care, better education, better jobs. And my friends, we will be unequivocal in our demand for respect for the rule of law and an unqualified belief in the an unqualified belief in the human rights and basic dignity of all Albertans. The challenges we face, the challenges facing Alberta, economic, environmental, social, they all require dedication and determination. And we will bring that to Alberta's legislature tirelessly. Work We will never stop working to rebuild our public health care, to support the well-being of our communities, to protect our mountains, our pensions, and our kids' education, all while ensuring we have an economy that works for absolutely all Albertans. So to all Albertans, we will be your voice when this government refuses to listen. And one small message to Danielle Smith and to the members of her new caucus, I say this. If we had won, because you know, it's inside piece of information here, I actually had two speeches opted for tonight. <laughs> if we had won, our commitment was to have been to do everything that we could to move past division and to govern for the vast majority of Albertans, to be practical and pragmatic and to listen to all voices. So I am asking you to remember the majority of Albertans tonight and to commit to a government that prioritizes the need and aspirations of all Albertans. Yeah. 
So in conclusion tonight, my friends, I just want to say I am so proud of the work that every single solitary member of our movement, of this NDP, has done over the last four weeks. Together, we fought passionately for a better future, and I am so very, very proud to be the leader of this party. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Richard you. Richard Notley, Alberta's official opposition leader. Staking her claim, making her intentions clear, she intends to stay on as the official opposition leader. She was very... silver linings and a bit of a gray cloud and I guess that that's one of them so I guess we're down at UCP headquarters and uh, that's what you're seeing on the screen and soon we'll see um, Daniel Smith now elected premier not just inheriting it as the leader of the UCP well David if you had to give the NDP you know campaign a grade what would you say I mean they, they did as the numbers sit right now gain 11 seats obviously it wasn't enough to, to form government but you know how would you grade the performance uh, I don't know I guess probably I mean a B at least um, I, I think you've heard our panel talk about this. Um, the negative ads work to a point, and then you need to put something in. The, um, and I think, you know, maybe they have to go back and take a look at campaign strategy. Did we need to raise corporate taxes? Um, as the NDP has said, it was still raising to the lowest rate in the country. I get that. But that was something the UCP really seized on to talk about their strength with just taxes. Maybe if the NDP had put their tax policy in the window or something right away in the campaign, you know, I, I'm just guessing what some of the, uh, the the thinking will be as they go through that particular thing. So, so it'd be, it was a better campaign in this sense too. I'll be very interested in looking at the advanced poll numbers. Historically, conservative parties, it doesn't matter the province, do better on advanced poll on ground game. And I know both campaign managers, who both come out of the Harper Layton area on, on, on each side, and they both stress finding votes, databases, 
uh, they both stress very similar methods to success. One, Steve Outhouse is the UCP campaign manager, Newfoundlander, uh, and he came into the province and was hired by Daniel Smith to do just what he did tonight. So congrats to him. Nate Rotman is the uh, campaign manager on the NDP side, and uh, he, he'd probably just probably want another week. Uh, this is a live shot of the Calgary uh, UCP headquarters, uh, and we're just waiting for Danielle Smith to arrive. We know it will be momentarily. Um, I can tell you, Tyler Shander, I'm getting it in my ear. Back in the lead in Acadia. Things are popping in. Casey Maddu, we have projected defeated now in Southwest. Nathan Newdorf ahead in Lethbridge East, so some of these uh, close races. Uh, maybe that's what Danielle Smith is doing. She's checking out to see what's going on in Acadia. <laughs> well, yeah, we should Looking remind viewers. Does she still have a justice minister? <laughs> we should remind viewers. I know, as we, we were just talking about, you know, concession speech, we'll have a victory speech here in a moment. There are still a number of these uh, ridings that are too close to call, mm -hmm. and we may not have called uh, by the time we go off and the air this speech, tonight. This speech is, obviously, I think it's the more interesting one, because, as Rachel Notley said at the end of her speech, in her victory in a liver victory speech, she would have been talking about reaching out to those who did not vote NDP. Daniel Smith, I think, same thing, uh, needs to reach out to people who did not vote for her. It, you know, you can't heal a division unless both parties are ready to sort of uh, do something about that. Um, she did lose. She has a smaller caucus than she did when the night started. I think she has to acknowledge that. Um, but then, yeah, she, I think this is where she's... I'm certain this is where she says, I need to govern for all Albertans. But it, some of those losses that you were talking about were cabinet ministers. Uh -huh. So do you see some people who could have the potential to step into those roles? Um, I'm trying to think. They, they, they have a couple of new MLA. for example. I don't know the background as well as all of them. Typically you want someone, you know, when you're forming a cabinet, uh, Daniel Smith, first of all, is from the south of the province. And typically, the way premiers in this province do it, uh, you'll want the finance minister from the north end of the province. Usually it's like Calgary and Edmonton or vice versa. Um, that's why I mentioned Brian Jean uh, as a potential finance minister. He obviously is from one of the more northern ridings. Um, but that is some bench strength that might be missing. I mean, to run through it, Milliken, uh, copping, Jeremy Nixon is on the bubble, uh, Chandro is about six votes up, uh, Newdorf is up a bit, Madhu is defeated. And that's the other point, nobody in Edmonton, there's n from the provincial capital, there is going to be no cabinet representation. You know, that is something that Daniel Smith's going to have to think about as well. Well, talk about this, David. I mean, agree or disagree w with her policies, no matter how you feel about Danielle Smith, this is remarkable given where she was just a few years ago in her own ago. political career, right? Yeah. We're talking about a woman who built the Wild Rose Party uh, essentially from scratch, became leader, uh, was at a very tight election at that point in time, ended up losing to Allison Redford, crosses the floor in an absolutely dramatic, stunning turn of events, <laughs> yes. right? Then loses her own riding nomination for the progressive conservatives who'd have thought that, that she was the leader of alberta now i mean it is it, it's remarkable what she's been able to accomplish we tonight. started this show tonight with your video presentation your retrospective a i remember gosh daniel smith she hasn't aged that much she still looks pretty youthful <laughs> 10 years ago but uh when she said in 2012 we played that little clip in your piece where she said well i guess we have a you'll have to wait a little longer yeah took a decade and a bit uh, there you go. But it, remarkable that that, that sort of uh, circumference, that sort of uh, journey uh, can happen. Uh, so congratulations to Daniel Smith on, on that front. But as I said, uh, she, she did lose some key cabinet ministers. But, yep, I'd be all smiles too. And she's entering could've, the room. Could have been a lot worse. Too, like, <laughs> yeah. sure. Absolutely. All smiles. She is not driving in in a, a big blue truck. We, we <laughs> joke, we reference that, but of course that is how uh, Jason Kenney entered the room. Speaking when... of Jason Kenney, Jason Kenney turns 55 years old tomorrow. Oh. Uh, yes, I don't know where is he that, is, is tonight. Is that a birthday present? I'm not, <laughs> sure, yes, uh, not sure if it's a gift or not. I'm not, but, sure. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But, I'm sure uh, he's still supportive of the party no matter who's I mean, who's she late. did take over what he built. Right. Kenny did unite that Conservative Party. She's inherited it. It hasn't blown up yet. That's saying something. It may yet blow up again, but she's in charge for now. All right, big cheers, certainly, at UCP headquarters. Let's listen in to what Danielle Smith has to say. <laughs> our dear friend Ralph Klein. Welcome to another Miracle on the Prairies. 
My friends, this was the very definition of a hard-fought election. We faced the most expensive, fierce, and coordinated opposition in third-party political campaigns in history. Now, many folks uh, wrote us off, even just as recently as last month. But you know what happened? Despite it all, today, Albertans chose to move our province forward by re-electing a strong, stable, united, conservative majority government. victory would not have been possible without the incredible work of so many and thank you to our amazing campaign team to our party and campaign volunteers and to every single one of you that vote donated your your time and your resources to this campaign you all made the difference and thank you thank you a special thanks to all of our UCP candidates and their spouses families and campaign teams for you your tremendous work and sacrifice, regardless of whether you won or lost individually tonight, you made a difference for Alberta, and we will always be, you will always be part of our UCP team, so thank you. I'd also like to thank the great people of Brooks Medicine Hat once again, yes. <laughs> trusted me with the responsibility of representing and advocating for your interests and I am honored and humbled. I'm indebted to you and to all the volunteers and I will continue fighting for you as your MLA. Thank you Brooks Medicine Hat. And of course, thank you to my dear husband, David. Thank you so much, honey, for supporting me, for sacrificing so much of our time together so I can serve our province in this special way. Thank you so much for all that you do. Well, my friends, the election is now over. It is to put partisan division and personal and political attacks in the rearview mirror. It's time to move forward together as all Albertans, no matter who we voted for. And on that note, Rachel Notley called me earlier to concede the election with honor and with dignity. We all know about our differences of opinion, but I believe that Rachel Notley is a loyal Albertan who loves this province as much as I or anyone else. Yeah. And she is deserving of respect and kindness and gratitude for the thousands of hours she has sacrificed to serve our democracy. And I hope you'll join me in genuinely thanking her for her public service. And just as I would like to thank the hundreds of thousands of Albertans who voted for the UCP today, I want to speak for a moment to every Albertan who did not. I want you to know that my oath is to serve all Albertans, no matter how you voted. And though I didn't do enough in your judgment to win your support in this election, I will work every day to listen, to improve, and to demonstrate to you that I can be trusted to improve on the issues that you care so deeply about. Now, I won't be perfect, of course. We all know that. But when I make a mistake, I will listen, correct course, and learn from it so that I can improve and become a better leader. And so I invite all Albertans, regardless of who you supported in this election, to reach out to me with your ideas and your concerns and your questions. That feedback that you give me, positive and negative, helps make our UCP caucus and I to make better decisions. And that is what a healthy democracy is all about. <laughs> Now, before I go further, I think it's important tonight to recognize the courageous sacrifice of our firefighters and other first responders who are fighting and winning the battle against forest fires across our province. I'd ask all of us to stand here and applaud our heroes of Alberta. Yeah. That is what Alberta is all about. We look after each other. We take care of each other. And we must remember that there is much more much more that unites us than divides us. And we will need to be unified in the days and years ahead because there's so much work to do together. For example, we need to make sure that you and your family keep more of your money for the things that you need, especially during this time of high inflation. We, yeah. <laughs> 
We have to make sure that our communities and streets are safe again for our families and our businesses. And we have, have to keep powering and diversifying our amazing economy. And I want to tell every business owner and investor listening tonight, whether doing business inside or outside of Alberta, we are throwing our doors wide open for businesses, large and small. a home for your business and its employees. Enjoy the benefits of the Alberta tax advantage and bring your jobs and investments here because you are both welcomed and valued. And to demonstrate that, the first bill of our government in the legislative session in the fall will be to guarantee that unless Albertans say otherwise by referendum, the only direction business and personal taxes are headed in this province is down. <laughs> Because we know that when businesses thrive, people thrive. And when we grow our economy, we attract the best and brightest from all over the world, and we want that. We have built the most powerful economy and population in the country on the principles of free enterprise, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. Let's not ever forget that, and let's not ever change that. We also need to ensure that our healthcare and education systems are the best in the world. Not simply adequate, not middle of the pack, the very best in the world. And that means we need to study the best systems and practices around the world and improve upon the strong foundation that we built here. But it also means empowering our doctors and nurses, teachers and other frontline professionals, along with feedback from patients and parents to innovate and improve in these areas every single day. So I'm asking healthcare and education professionals tonight. I'm also asking parents and patients to work with me and the UCP caucus to build a healthcare system and an education system that are models for the entire world. I know we can do this together and I am here to listen and to work alongside of you. And finally, my fellow Albertans, we need to come together no matter how we have voted to stand shoulder to shoulder against soon to be announced Ottawa policies that would significantly harm our provincial economy. Now, we have been made aware that in the coming weeks, Justin Trudeau is planning on bringing forward new restrictions on electricity generation from natural gas that will not only massively increase your power bills, but will also endanger the integrity and reliability of our entire power grid, which we rely on during our cold and dark Alberta winters. In addition, the Prime Minister is already ready to introduce a de facto production cap on our oil and gas sector that, if implemented, if implemented, will in tens of thousands of jobs lost, tens of billions in lost investment, damage our province's fiscal position, and bring economic hardship to Albertans. Now, I've made myself clear on this matter to the Prime Minister in person and in public, but I feel we need to do it again. Well, hopefully the Prime Minister and his caucus are watching tonight. <laughs> Let me be clear, this is not a road we can afford to go down. If he persists, he will be hurting Canadians from coast to coast, and he will strain the patience and goodwill of Albertans in an unprecedented fashion. And as Premier, I cannot, under any circumstances, allow these contemplated federal policies to be inflicted upon Albertans. I simply can't, and I won't.
Minister to instead halt the introduction of these harmful policies and come to the table in good faith to work collaboratively with Alberta on an energy and emission strategy that will both grow the Alberta and Canadian economies while using the export of Alberta LNG and emerging technologies to achieve meaningful reductions in emissions. Because when Canadians work together, there is no challenge that we can't overcome. I believe that, but it takes two parties acting in good faith to build that meaningful partnership. Now, Alberta is willing to be that partner, and we need our federal government to show it in good faith as well, and now is the time to do so. We are waiting. So in closing, my friends, tonight is a time for celebration. We celebrate... celebrate the candidates that won their election races and the efforts of those who did not. We celebrate the commitment to democracy of all volunteers and supporters, regardless of party affiliation. And we celebrate those who have sacrificed to secure and protect our right to vote and be a free and prosperous people. And we celebrate this beautiful province and all who live here. uniquely special place where the best and brightest come from every corner of the world to join us in building one of the greatest to live and work and raise our families and where the only things that are larger than our mountains is the compassion and irrepressible spirit of our people from the bottom of my heart thank you alberta and may our province